אוקיי, אז אנחנו בלייב. אוקיי, welcome everyone to the uh, Israeli uh, Vision Day. Uh, we have a long uh, list of uh, speakers today with lots of interesting uh, talks. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Israeli Vision Day. Our first speaker will be Tali Dekel. Speakers today with lots of interesting uh, talks. We have a long uh, list of uh, speakers. Should I take it away? So Tal, you can start. I have some, I, I will just mute myself. Should I take it away? Yeah, you can uh, start. Okay, there seems to be a, a, a delay. Uh, yeah, the, 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 there is a delay with the YouTube, but, you, but, it, but it's okay. So okay, you start, I... okay uh, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tali Dekel and today I'm going to talk about a new work uh, that I'm very excited about. Uh, before I start just very briefly about myself, um, uh, I've done my PhD in Tel Aviv University with Shai Avidan and Yael Moses. Uh, in fact, I think that my first talk ever uh, was in Vision Day quite a long time ago. Uh, I've then spent six years in the US for a postdoc with uh, Bill Freeman and then working as a research scientist in his group in Google. And I've just returned to Israel uh, and joined the Weizmann Institute as a faculty member. Uh, so this is me and my family after a very long journey uh, yeah. back home. Uh, in fact, and I'm starting now to build a new uh, research lab uh, in Weizmann, working at the intersection of computer vision, graphics, and deep learning. So if there are students here that are passionate about working in this area, area please email me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a line of work that I've recently done in Google in collaboration with this amazing group of people, and especially Erica Liu, who interned with us last summer, and Forrester Cole, who made this project possible. And the motivation for this project is making everyday videos much more fun, artistic, and engaging. So what you can see here is just like sample videos from my own personal collection. Uh, so most of these videos of, are of my kids. And I take many of these videos, but I hardly watch them because even for me, they could get quite boring. Uh, so we wanted to enhance the way we can perceive and interact with such videos and we achieve that by changing the speed of individual people within frames. We basically want to go into the video and change the timing of people's uh, movements in the video. Um, and retiming effects are not new. In films, we can see such retiming effects all the time. So for example, slow-mo, uh, fast motion, or a combination of them are often used to focus the viewer on specific motions or events in the video. Uh, they can be used to emphasize or de-emphasize cer certain moments and action. But of course, to produce such effects in films, we need uh, lots of staging and professional equipment and lots of manual editing. And uh, I'm gonna talk about how can we bring retiming effects into the realm of everyday uh, videos and achieve it in post-process. So let's see an example, um, back to boring kids' videos. Here we told the kids to jump to the pool at the same time, but of course, uh, each uh, child jumps at a different time. And, uh, and uh, now we can use our method uh, to retime the kids computationally. So what you're gonna see here is our retimed result. And as you can see, they all jump together and, and, and it's all done in post-processing. Now notice how not only the children are in time, but also all the scene elements that are related to them. The water splashes, their reflections, their shadow, all these elements are nicely following the kids. Okay, so let's uh, think for a second, what is required to produce a realistic retiming effect? 
Take a look on this video here, and let's assume that we want to retime uh, that person on the right. It is not enough to only retime the person, we must also retime the reflection on the, on the glass, otherwise the result won't look realistic. So this problem of retiming this application of retiming people in video, it poses a new research problem, which I think uh, is beautiful. How can we automatically associate a person in the video uh, with all these time varying scene elements that are related to them? Another challenge is uh, dealing with occlusion and disocclusions. When we often, we, when we will retime a person, we will disocclude some other uh, uh, regions in the scene, like this person on the back here. And we must realistically synthesize these occluded regions. Uh, again, otherwise the result won't look realistic. So the way we tackle these challenges is through a novel layer uh, decomposition of the video. Uh, this decomposition is human specific. I mean, each layer here uh, captures a person along with all the scene, uh, time, uh, time varying scene elements that are related to them, as you can see here. Uh, we also have a layer for the background. Another key property of our decomposition is that even if the person is occluded in the original frame, uh, our decomposition provides a full body estimate of the, of the person. And that basically allows us to support all sorts of video manipulation tasks uh, simply by editing the layers themselves. So for example, uh, we can remove a person from the video simply by not rendering their layers or, as you can see on the right here. And again, you can see that not only the person is removed but also their reflection. So the task of decomposing a video into layers is, is not new. Uh, the pioneering work by Wang and Ed Edison has part a great body of follow-up work. And recent method, of course, use the power of deep learning, like this work from uh, Noah Snavely's group, where they take a stereo image pair and train a model to predict layers uh, that corresponds to physically accurate depth with the goal to synthesize new view of a static scene. As you can see here, uh, in our case, we also use the power of deep learning, but our layers are not meant to be strictly accurate in terms of depth. In our case, each layer corresponds to a person uh, along with the scene elements that are related to them. And our model is trained only on that input video uh, without observing additional examples. The main uh, loss that drives this network is a reconstruction loss. Basically, we want these layers when we put them back together to allow us to reconstruct the original uh, video. So this is done in a self-supervised manner without any uh, labels. Uh, so next, I'm going to tell you more about this model, uh, but uh, it, is, it is a fairly complex method and I won't be able to provide all the technical details. So it will be more kind of like a high level intuitive explanation about how this uh, works. Uh, so what do we have here? We have this model uh, that predicts a set of layers. We have one layer for the background and a layer uh, for each person in the video. And each layer consists of a color image and an opacity map. And the first question is how do we associate a layer with a person? How do we tell this model uh, place the left person in the left layer? So the way we do this is by representing the people and a static background explicitly and providing it to the network as input. So these days there are plenty of method uh, uh, that can be used to compute the geometry and appearance of, uh, of uh, people in videos and images. Uh, so we are able to use off the shelf techniques to compute a representation for the people in the background and provide it to the network as input. Now, it's not so important what this representation is. I'm not going to go into the detail here. Uh, but what is important to note that we only model the people and a static background. But in order to, uh, for this model to do a good job with re accurately reconstructing the entire video, it must also re uh, reconstruct all these time varying scene elements like this reflection. This reflection, however, is not provided as input to that network. Um, so recall now that this network is overfitted uh, to that uh, input video. So basically it has to memorize these, all these time varying scene elements from the input that we provide and infer them automatically. So it is basically forced to place those elements in some layer. And the key question here is why does it place it in the, in the layer of the uh, person causing it or how can we make it 
do what we want? How can we make it place this reflection in the right layer? Um, now, you all agree that networks are pretty powerful. And when they are too powerful, they can do random things. So we want to prevent it and steer this network towards the solution we want. And we do so by limiting what the network can observe about the scene uh, by feeding only a single person each time. So basically, the layers are predicted in a separate forward pass into this network. Now to understand why this is an, uh, important, let's take a look again on this reflection. The network task is to predict it given the inputs that we provide. Uh, so it can predict, predict it given the left person's input or the right person's uh, input. And if we take a look on this task over time, what we can clearly see that uh, there is a high correlation between the left person and its reflection. By knowing, by knowing the left person, we have a lot of information about their reflection. So it's a much easier task for the network to predict the reflection from the left person's input. On the other hand, the right person doesn't tell us much about their reflection. So it's a much di more difficult task for the network to predict the reflection given the right person's in input. So in short, the reflection can be learned much quicker and in fewer iteration from the left person's input. And that's the solution that the network favors. Now, this is only kind of like an intuitive high level uh, explanation about how it works. We have in-depth analysis in the paper. Uh, so please check it out. It's all uh, um, uh, available online. Okay, so um, just to wrap up the method part, uh, we train our uh, model using several losses. The main loss is a reconstruction loss, as I mentioned. Uh, we want the layers when we put them back together to reconstruct uh, the original video. Uh, we also have a regularization term on the opacity map. Uh, we want to prevent trivial solution where we just have one layer, which is all, uh, which is fully visible. So we uh, encourage the uh, opacity map to be sparse. So this is kind of like a combination of an L0 and an L1 loss. And these two losses are not enough to make the network converge from a random initialization. So we also have uh, initialization loss that bootstrap the opacity map encourage them to match this rough uh, uh, object mask, which we obtain using off-the-shelf techniques like mask CNN, and we turn off this loss uh, after uh, several uh, epochs. So let's see some results. Um, here, um, uh, we use our method to freeze in time one of the couples. And this is a super challenging example. We have lo loose clothing, reflections, shadows, and you can see that all of these are nicely preserved in our retimed result. Here you can see the breakdown of our layer decomposition. So on the first row, you can see the initialization that we use, like this rough uh, uh, person masks, and you can see that they are not capturing clothes uh, or any of the effects. And our method is able to recover those on the second row. You can see that we get like fine details of the clothes and all the uh, effects. So here is another uh, uh, fairly complex example. Here we have a bunch of people moving, jumping, causing complex deformation to the trampoline. And our method can produce a layer uh, for each person that include only that the deformation effects that are caused by that person. And now we can use human key points to automatically align uh, uh, each person's jump in time. So here you can see uh, before temporal alignment. and after temporal alignment. And I hope you can see that they are all in the air at the same time, all touching the ground uh, at the same time. And again, shadows, the formations are all realistically rendered. Okay, this is an example where, where we can preserve the original camera motion. I haven't explained exactly how, but we basically treat uh, uh, the image, the background as an extended image, like a panoramic image and uh, each frame kind of like sample the visible part.
And um, I guess just to uh, uh, finish this talk, I would like to say that this work kind of like made it clear for us that you know computer vision is getting better and better at segmenting and modeling objects. So to, for example, uh, this is a segmentation for the person and the dog that you can obtain using mass car CNN. So it's pretty nice that you can get it, but all the existing method are kind of like ignore the effects that these objects generate in, in, in the scene. Uh, so that kind of like led us uh, tackle a new problem, given an input video and a rough object mask for every uh, object of interest, our goal is to estimate an RGBA layer, which we named uh, Omnimat, that um, uh, basically include not only the object, but also all the uh, um, scene uh, effects that they generate, as you can see here. Uh, so this is a, a work in progress, it's, uh, it's submitted, and um, it works nicely for uh, shadows, but not only. Uh, so for example, we can capture this reflection of the flamingo, uh, of the flamingo here, and we also can deal with quite complex uh, videos like uh, in this example. And now that you have, that you have those uh, layers, those omnimats in hand and, and the, they include the object effects, we can do all sorts of uh, you know, cool video effects like we can uh, color pop the flamingo, but also take care, take into account its reflection and preserve its color. Or we can do this stroboscopic video and again, you can see that uh, the shadows of the horse here uh, is a nice addition over just having the horse jump. So I just wanna thank again, all my collaborators on both of these project, uh, projects and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tali, for the very interesting talk. Uh, so we have uh, several uh, questions uh, from the crowd. If anyone has additional question, please uh, post it on the uh, live chat. So Shai is asking, can you use elements of this approach to detect fake videos, assuming fake will not have good reflection or shadow, etc.? Um, potentially, yes. I mean, you could maybe run this method and then have kind of like you need you need in the loop some kind of a discriminate uh, discriminative uh, model that could distinguish uh, unrealistic and realistic uh, uh, layer the composition of a video so it's not enough to only use our method but potentially you can do this you can uh, apply this method and then train kind of like a discriminative model to distinguish between the two thank you uh, another question is, is there any offline training on a data set or is the only training done on the test sample itself? So training is all done uh, um, on the test video itself, except for one component that I didn't mention here. Uh, we have a network that maps human key points into what, uh, a UV map, which represents the geometry of each person. Um, so there is one component that is trained offline and is generic, uh, which convert key points, human key points to dense pose outputs. Uh, but in the second work that I showed in the last two, uh, um, the last two slides, we don't have uh, that network in the loop. So it's all basically uh, on the test video. Okay. Uh, now, this uh, the, the last task that you presented of the Omnimate. So is it something that you can do only for video or you think about an option to do it also for a single image? Yeah, um, a single image will be extremely uh, challenging. Like it depends on the geometry of the scene. It depends on the lighting direction. It depends on so many other things. It could be that, you know, once you, you have this model trained on on videos, maybe you can use it uh, uh, to design, um, you know, a method that could could use less frame or even a single image in some cases. But um, um, right now, I think uh, it will be very challenging to to do so. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now I will introduce uh, the next uh, speaker. Uh, the Ah, uh, Stali, there is an another question. How hard it will be to reverse and analyze reflection on the extract object, uh, extracting layer of object with reflective uh, surface? You, you may, so if I understand correctly, like disentangling the uh, kind of like 
the lighting from the uh, from the appearance. I, understand yeah, I, I think yes. So um, yes, it, it's a good question. I think it will be great to develop such a model that you know could disentangle different properties in the scene and 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 provide control over them. Um, but we haven't thought through how, how exactly to do this. Or, or maybe if I, I will rephrase the, his question, is that once you have done this, if you can reconstruct the lights and all the reflections that you have in the scene. So understanding, so, so, so now you do it in some kind of unsupervised way, and then you will be able to analyze why you got these reflections in the way you got it. Oh, I see. Uh, that will be amazing. I mean, we haven't done this and I don't know how to do this, but I think it will be a very nice result. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next talk is uh, by Irit uh, Shelley, Vlad Winter, Dor Lidzvak, and Orit Freifeld, and David Rosen uh, from Ben Gurion University at uh, MIT. And they will talk about uh, uh, JAPOLS, a uh, novel uh, technique. And uh, now Irit will uh, give uh, the talk. So you can start sharing your slides and start the talk. Sure. Um, hi. Can you see it? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, my name is uh, Yuri Celli. Um, I'm a PhD student in the computer science department um, at Ben Gurion University. I'm working in the vision, inference, and learning group under the supervision of Dr. Oren Freifeld. Today, I'm going to present you the our CVPR paper, which is about moving camera background model. Um, so I'll start with a short introduction to the problem. What is a background model? So um, background model separates an image from a video um, into two images, foreground and background, where the foreground um, includes all elements in the image that usually do not exist in the scene. Most of the algorithms perform two steps. First, they learn the variability of the background, and then every deviation, any deviation from that model is tagged as a foreground. There are two cases when solving this problem two cases uh, that are that is related to the uh, camera. So the first is uh, when the camera is static. So here the camera is, uh, there is a camera that is, is located somewhere and collects information from a very specific view of the scene. Our focus is on the more complicated case where the camera moves. So, and the main challenge here is uh, dealing with the data misalignment that we have <clears throat> due to the motion of the camera. I'll talk shortly about three uh, existing approaches. Um, that propose solutions for the problem. The first is the global approach. Um, here, all the images in the video are aligned to one common coordinate system, and uh, one background model is learned on top of uh, all the aligned images. There are two problems with this approach. First, um, uh, learning a background model on, on this uh, uh, big domain uh, can be non not scalable when the video is long or when the scene that the camera captures is wide. And the second problem <clears throat> is that uh, all these white areas in each data point that we have, in each big image that we have, um, represents missing data in the, in, the, in, the, in the problem. Second approach is the incremental approach. Here, um, the, the background model is learned as a linear subspace. And um, um, there is an alternation between learning the subspace and learning the, the motion uh, parameters. These algorithms um, rely on an assumption that the camera motion is very, very small. So they're applicable for <clears throat> data sets such as a camera jitter, as we see here. The third approach is the moving object approach. So here there is a segmentation between two types of motions, the motions of, of the camera and the motion of the scene. And it helps to detect a foreground, moving foreground, such as moving objects. Each of the um, um, <clears throat> approaches here uh, suffers from at least one of the drawbacks that are mentioned below. So they can be either a non-scalable, uh, dealing with a lot of missing data or not applicable for every type of motion. And also they're hard, it's hard to generalize these approaches for images that are new to the model. Previously unseen frames, uh, after the model uh, was learned, um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about images that are captured after the model uh, was learned. So we propose a method called JAPOS. JAPOS stands for Joint Alignment and Partially Overlapping Local Subspaces. And um, we provide a solution for the moving camera background model. And um, we overcome the challenges that um, I mentioned before. 
So it's scalable for, for long, long videos and wide scenes. It's applicable for relatively free camera motion. And also, it can provide a background and foreground separation for previously unseen image, images. I'll talk uh, in a very high level about the method. Um, it includes three phases. In phase one, we solve a joint alignment problem. So given um, um, all the input uh, images, we try to estimate um, a set of FN transformations that will align all these images to one common coordinate system. And the goal in this alignment is that we want to minimize the RGB variance um, in every pixel in that big domain across all images. And we do it in a robust way. So this idea is formalized in uh, the following loss function. Um, uh, this uh, x theta here represents the, the warped pixel. And we want to minimize the difference between, between the warped pixel and the, the average uh, pixel value that we have uh, in that pixel. Solving this problem directly on the input is hard, as the problem is, is highly nonlinear and non-convex. Non so um, we suggest uh, working with a smart initialization first <clears throat> by solving a slightly easier problem um, by getting this uh, transformation, global transformations in the SE group, in the special Euclidean group. So we first get transform the images according to the uh, tra transformations we get uh, in, the, in the SE group. And then we try to apply this function by finding uh, residual transformations that are affine. And the composition of the affine transformation that we learned, residual affine transformation that we learned, and the SE transformation that we got from the smart initialization um, is the, uh, the global affine transformation that we want to achieve. We use uh, Huber loss for for vastness and also a regularization term here um, uh, that uh, the regularization is on the difference between the transformations we learn and the, the SE, the special Euclidean space to avoid poor global minima. We use SE sync, an algorithm that uh, provides a global optimum for the, S, the problem in the SE group. And we use a spatial transformer network um, as an optimization mechanism to solve this problem. In phase two, we learn two tasks independently. The first is a mapping between an image and a transformation, and uh, we'll need it when using the model for new images. The second task, uh, we learn the background models themselves. So here, um, for each image uh, of the, uh, from the video, we warp the image according to the transformations we got uh, in, uh, in phase one. And um, once all images are aligned, instead of learning one background model in the whole big domain, which is not scalable, we split the domain into local domains. And in each of the local domains, we learn a separate background model. Here we use robust PCA um, um, as, a, as a static background model that, that, that we chose. Um, in each of the local domains, the data set um, uh, consists of a subset of warped images that uh, has a significant overlap with that domain. There are uh, two advantages here uh, in taking this approach. So first, um, it's scalable when the video is long and when the scene is, is wide. Um, each of the background models can be learned separately and, and each of them is small. And also, um, the data that we use for every local domain is, has a minimum amount of missing data, which, which and this improves the, the quality of each of the models that we learn. In the third phase, I'll explain how we use the model to provide a background and foreground separation for previously unseen images. So for a given image, uh, a new image, we use the mapping, a regression net, uh, to get a prediction for transformation. We have a small refinement step, and uh, we get this image warped in the, in the global domain. We then project this warped image on a several um, uh, local subspaces that we learned, local um, um, background models that we learned. So here we have uh, one such projection. The green border here is the warped image. And the red border is one of the subspaces we use. And from each of the sub overlapping uh, subspaces, we get a uh, part of, of the image that is uh, the background estimation for that area that it covers. This is the way we perform the projection and the fact that um, um, be because we have the overlap between the original image and the projection area is not perfect, we use a bi um, binary weights to exclude this missing data from each of the projections. So once we have um, all these local um, estimations, local background estimations, we average all of them 
to get one background estimation for the image. And the foreground is, uh, is simply the difference between the, um, the difference between the, the original image and the background estimation. I'll show some of the results uh, of JAPOS and um, I'll compare our, our results to, the, to other methods that are considered a state of the art. I'll use the following data sets and uh, also additional videos that we filmed ourselves. So here um, we show the tennis uh, data set. The left column here is uh, one, um, uh, one single image from the data set. The above, um, um, this image is, is, uh, is the original image and the bottom image is uh, the ground truth foreground. Each of the other columns is, uh, uh, is, a, is a method. I'll focus on the difference between, I'll zoom in on the difference between JAPOS and uh, PRPCA because they perform the best for, among the others. So here you can see that in, in the PRPCA estimation, there are a lot of uh, artifacts that are even shown cl cl more clearly in the foreground. And, and this is derived from, derived from the fact that um, they perform the alignment in a pairwise way, while uh, we do it in, uh, uh, we solve a joint alignment problem. Another data set called a swing. Here there's a woman that is, use, is using the swing and the, the camera moves with, with, with it. And um, I'll again zoom in between on the difference between uh, JAPOS and PRPCA. Here you can see that the drift is even worse. This is a continuous span data set. Uh, this is a more complicated data set because the video is very long and the scene that it, the camera captures is, is, is quite wide. Um, there are two, sing two, two uh, sample images from, uh, from, this, uh, from this video. We didn't show the PRPCA results here because uh, they use the global approach and uh, it's not scalable for this kind of data set. Here are so some more results on a data set called STUNT. And here we show numerical comparison between, of JAPLs and other, the other methods. Uh, we use F measure. Um, and to show the, the comparison. And this is a measurement of the difference between two binary images. So here we compare the, the ground truth foreground and the, the, the estimated foreground. Um, so here we show a video that we filmed ourselves. The upper, the upper area here is the original video. And here we have the, the estimated background and the estimated for, sorry, and the estimated foreground. Uh, so you can see that uh, this blue chair was part of the background when, when it was learned. Each of the images here in the video are, uh, are new to the model. And you can see that uh, re the removal of the chair um, is actually detected as a foreground. So we consider it as a static foreground. Show it again. So uh, the chair is actually part of the background. And you can see that um, that um, um, we can detect moving foreground and static foreground. Here we show um, a data set um, of, uh, of camera that, that moves very in very small small motion. We call it camera jitter. Um, we, sh we compare JAPOS to Tigrasta. They provide an algorithm that is considered state of the art um, in, the, in, the, in the area of uh, camera jitter data sets. You can see that whenever the motion is a, a little more than a very small motion, um, their algorithm fails. So uh, to conclude, we proposed um, a moving camera background model. Um, we show that it includes a smart, in, a smart initialization step that solves a, that, that helps solving a joint alignment problem. Um, I showed that it's scalable, it's unsupervised, it's 2D based, and it also can provide background and foreground separation for images that are new to the model. Special thanks to uh, Israel's Ministry of Technology and Science and VGU High Tech Scholarship for relatively, for, uh, for sorry, for partially uh, finding this, pro this uh, project. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Irit, for the talk. Uh, we have a question uh, from the crowd. Uh, it's asked if the train, the JAPOLS model is a video specific model. No, um, you mean like um, 
for to learn a background model for um, for very for for every scene, we will we'll need to train the the some video that covers the scene. So um, so the training will be um, for every scene. If we want to to get a um, uh, foreground and background estimation in the future for that scene, we'll have to to get some training data for that before. Okay, so uh, another question is, so there is no uh, geometry uh, that is used, the, the alignment is assumed to be flat? So um, we, we use, uh, well, use FN transformations, but, um, um, and the geometry is, is by, is the fact that we, we do the alignment, um, um, we use FN transformation as the alignment and we know that um, there is uh, there are some assumption on assumptions on the motion because um, um, this is um, um, should not be should not be uh, really good when when the when the camera is very very close to the to the scene. But we show that um, so, so there is an assumption that the camera has some distance from from the scene. So uh, so it will work and and will have good results. But we also have some uh, data sets that uh, we video that we filmed, uh, filmed ourselves that the camera is not very uh, far from the scene and will still provide uh, good results even if we use only FN transformations. Okay, but basically I will continue the question of uh, Ron. He's saying, so basically all the transformation that you're using are affine or SO2, right? There are no ge geometrical uh, transformations that are used. No, they're all affine. Uh, so basically, your method is uh, online med uh, is online, right? So you you train only on the given scene. You don't use the uh, other. You don't train on, for example, on a batch of videos, and then you apply it on a new uh, unseen uh, video. Yeah, yeah. For for every scene, we will have to train uh, uh, the model for a, a few um, a few images from from the scene that covers the whole scene that we want to use to to. to to, use, to provide estimation afterwards. And, um, and um, th this is not really online. The online is only when, after the training, <laughs> if you want to get the separation, so, so we can use the model for that. But, uh, but there is a step for learning the, for every scene we'll have to learn to train the model. Okay, so we have two uh, other related questions, one by Shavida and the other by Henarel, that ask whether it is an on when you say online, do you need all the video at once or you can, or your model can get one image at a time as a sequence, so you can like treat it as a batch? And the other one is what is, if it is online, what is the frame rate and can it be run on real time? Um, so, um... We, we need currently the, the algorithm is written in the way that in a way that we need the whole video uh, as a batch. I mean, we, we take one video from the scene and uh, we learn the model. We get after we have all the background, all, all the local backgrounds that we learned, um, uh, we can just use it anytime after that for, for new images. And uh, the frame rate is, uh, is around uh, between like one or two seconds per frame. Okay. So, so basically you can take one batch from the video and then apply it to all the following uh, frames or, or, or for all the frames that you will be processing, you need to get them to the algorithm at once. For new images, it will take only one or two seconds to, to provide the separation, if that what it was your question. Okay, okay. So uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. And uh, we will move now to our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Ken Barr, uh, that uh, will Hello. talk about rendering near field speckle statistics in scattering media. Uh, but uh, Ken, before you will present your slides, before because your talk is about uh, uh, computational imaging, uh, I will use this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, uh, the ICCP conference that is organized uh, uh, th that this year will be held in Israel. Uh, hopefully that things will not be virtual anywhere. So 
the International Conference on Computational Photography uh, uh, will be held in Haifa, Israel in uh, May 23rd to 25th. Uh, this is the conference uh, website and if anyone or in the crowd is doing work on computational photography, so you are welcome to submit your work. The deadline is uh, this Tuesday, uh, December uh, 15. And uh, we hope that you will submit your papers there and also enjoy the conference when we, it will be in Israel. So this was a small promotion and now... Uh, Thank we'll... you for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, Chen Bar, a PhD student of uh, Anat Levin in the Technion. You, you're and, not uh, sharing your screen. Yes, uh, uh, I will soon uh, share the screen. And I will show uh, our latest uh, work uh, uh, that uh, we presented in uh, Sig of Asia, of rendering a new field spec of uh, fields. In fluorescence microscopy, we try to image fluorescent light sources that are deep inside tissue. Because of light scattering, we don't see sharp images of these sources, but instead images containing speckle patterns. Despite looking like noise, these patterns have strong statistical properties. A well-known one is the memory effect. This means that if you move light source, the speckle pattern shifts. As a result, speckle patterns generated by nearby sources are correlated shifted versions of each other. I will talk about how to correctly render such speckle patterns. In fact, the ones shown here are not measured in the lab, but they are rendered using our algorithms. The reason why we care to do this is that there are a lot of medical imaging techniques that use speckle for better imaging. One example is the work of cuts and colleagues. The goal is to recover a fluorescent object that is hidden from a camera by a scattering layer. Thanks to the memory effect, we can remove the effect of scattering and recover the object by simply computing the autocorrelation of the speckle image. As this imaging through scattering procedure will not always be successful, it is important to understand its limitations. For example, for what types of material or fluorescent objects will it work? Using a physically accurate renderer, we can efficiently investigate these limitations without the need for TDS lab experiments. Another important application of the memory effect is in adaptive optics focusing. Consider the case where we use a lens to focus a beam to a small spot. If we place a tissue layer in front of the layer, the light will focus this layer to a blurry spot. In adaptive optics, we use a spatial light modulator to change the shape of the wavefront we send through the lens and tissue so that light again focuses to a sharp spot. Finding the wavefront shape we need to use to achieve focusing is quite expensive and normally needs to be done separately for each point we want to focus on. However, using the memory effect, we can adjust the same wavefront shape to refocus to different points uh, within some small ranges. Using a physically accurate renderer, we can investigate how large this range is and how sharply we can refocus. The traditional approach for rendering speckle is to use numerical techniques for solving the wave equations. Unfortunately, this approach is prohibitively expensive and only practical for tiny volumes. Last year, we introduced a different approach that uses Monte Carlo techniques to simulate speckle. This approach is orders of magnitude faster, yet produces equivalent speckle statistics. Unfortunately, we still cannot directly use our approach to efficiently simulate the tissue imaging applications we described earlier. And here is why. Our previous approach assumes far-field imaging conditions. What this means is that we consider directional illumination coming from very far away from the source. By contrast, tissue imaging uses near-field imaging conditions. This corresponds to having a point source inside the material. 
To simplify analysis, we can also consider a point source that is imaged inside the material using a lens. Likewise, we distinguish between far field and near field viewpoints. Even though near field conditions are the ones needed for tissue imaging applications, these are exactly the imaging conditions that are the most challenging for our previous algorithm, which designed for the far field. Before we explain the challenge, we will first explain what exactly we are trying to simulate. Our goal is to render not speckle images directly, but rather speckle covariance. As we have the covariance, we can use it to sample physically accurate speckle images. To understand what we mean by uh, speckle covariance, let's consider a source inside the material which produces this speckle image. If we shift the source, we get a correlated shifted speckle image. To measure speckle covariance, we take the two speckle images, align them, and multiply them. We then average this product over speckle images for many different tissue layers. The resulting smooth pattern is the speckle covariance, which is typically stronger in the center, and decays as we move away from it. The covariance image changes as we change the source displacement and becomes smaller for larger displacements. Let's now quickly review our approach for far field rendering and see why it is challenging to use it for near field conditions. To render intensity images of scattering media, we typically start by sampling a path inside the medium. For a directional source, a direction L1, we then make the first segment of the path a ray at direction L1, and similarly we make the last segment a ray at direction V1. We repeat this multiple sampled paths. By contrast, in the near field, we need to connect the path to the point source I1 through the lens. Instead of just one ray, this requires tracing all possible rays through the lens aperture. We also need to do the same for the imaging aperture. Let's now look at rendering covariance instead of intensity. For this, we need to add a second light source and a second sensor. As we showed in our previous paper, rendering covariance requires connecting each sampled path to all sources and sensors. In the far field, this can be done easily by tracing four directional segments. However, in the near field, we need to draw all possible rays to four different apertures. The main challenge here is to find the efficient method for estimating the total throughput to the apertures. As a first attempt toward rendering near field covariance, we can use the fact that it can be related to the far field one through a four dimensional integral. This corresponds to summing far field covariance for all possible combinations of directions to the four illumination and imaging apertures. Therefore, theoretically, we can evaluate this integral by computing a tabulated version of the far field covariance for all direction combinations and forming a weighted average of the table entries. Unfortunately, in practice, this requires running and storing an impractically large number of far field covariance renderings. For example, here we, com we compare two near field covariance renderings produced using tabulation approach and our approach they produce the same result. But whereas our approach runs for 15 seconds, the tabulation approach runs for 1.6 hours. If we reduce the runtime by reducing the number of far field tabulated entries, we end up with aliasing artifacts due to undersampling. We can ultimately write the near field covariance as a four dimensional integral in path space. As we often do in rendering, we can use Monte Carlo integration and approximate this integral by sampling a small number of paths through the aperture. The problem is that the contributions from these paths are complex numbers with very different phases, and therefore this approach will have a very high variance. For example, here is an equal time comparison between the covariance we compute using Monte Carlo aperture integration and our approach. The Monte Carlo result is very, very noisy. Even if we increase the runtime of the Monte Carlo approach by 10 times, we still see significantly large variance compared to our result. 
Our key technical computation is to develop a cross-form approximation to the four-dimensional aperture integral, which allows us to compute the new field contribution of each path very efficiently. To develop such approximation, we use spherical von Mess-Fischer functions. These are an extension of Gaussian functions to the three-dimensional sphere with many of the same elegant mathematical properties. In particular, we approximate the typically binary lens apertures with continuous apodization that we express as a von Mess-Fischer function. Note that as the lens has a complex phase, we need to work with complex von Mess-Fischer functions. We additionally approximate the phase function of the scattering material using a mixture of von Mess-Fischer functions. With these approximations, we show in the paper that path contributions to the four apertures can be expressed as integrations and convolutions of complex von Mess-Fischer functions. We also derived closed form formulas for computing these integrations and convolutions analytically. Our approximations introduce negligible bias while improving the computational efficiency by several orders of magnitude, as I will show in our experiments. We additionally developed an important sampling strategy for selecting the start points of paths inside the scattering volume. To see why this is needed, consider the incident focused illumination. It typically eliminates only a double wedge area inside the volume. If we start a path inside the part of the volume that receives no light, the path will have a zero contribution. In the paper, we show how to use important sampling to start paths only inside the beam, where they contribute to the covariance. Let's now see some more comparisons of rendered near-field covariances. First, we compare renderings for three different values of the displacement between the illuminators. We compare our near-field rendering approach to the tabulation and Monte Carlo aperture integration approaches we discussed earlier. We record for each algorithm the time it takes to reach convergence. Our approach converges in 15 seconds, whereas the tabulation approach requires 1.6 hours and the Monte Carlo one 14 hours. These comparisons also confirmed what I mentioned earlier, namely that our approximations do not introduce significant bias. We also show equal time comparisons. In all cases, our approach significantly outperforms the two alternatives. We also note that the performance difference increases as the size of the simulated scattering volume increases. For this comparison, we only use very small volumes, because for largest one, the alternative approach becomes completely impractical. In previous work, Austin Brugge et al. proposed an analytical model based on Fokker-Planck approximations for near-field covariance. This model takes as input two imaging parameters, which are defined as the tilt and the shift between the two input beams. Here we show the covariance they compute with this model. We also show speckle covariance measurements they captured in the lab. The results from the model resemble to the lab measurements, but do not match them completely. Here is the covariance we compute with our Monte Carlo simulator, which better captures the shape of the measured covariance. I mentioned earlier adaptive optics focusing as one of the tissue imaging applications motivating our work. In particular, prior work has shown that the speckle memory effect can be used to refocus at different points inside tissue without having to separately calibrate the adaptive optics correlation pattern for each point. We have been using a renderer to investigate the extent to which this refocusing is possible and compare with predictions from previously approximate analytical models. Our simulations suggest that the refocusing range can be a lot larger than previously predicted, and these findings suggest new potential uses for adaptive optics focusing in tissue imaging. To summarize, our work is motivated from the fact that understanding and simulating speckle statistics is essential for developing and improving tissue imaging techniques. However, whereas tissue imaging requires near-field simulations, only far-field simulations are practical using previous simulation techniques, 
including our own Monte Carlo algorithm. We develop computationally efficient techniques for the near field case based on approximating relevant spherical functions using von Mess Fischer functions and developing analytic rules for their integration and convolution. Our techniques provide orders of magnitude improvement compared to previous approaches. We use these new techniques to evaluate focusing true scattering applications. Many thanks to our sponsors and please make sure to check out our publicly available implementation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, yes, Ken. Yes, so there are uh, several questions from the crowd. Yes, uh, yes. One is, uh, how do you obtain the ground truth result to determine the accuracy of your result? Yes, that, that's a really good question. So uh, our ground truth is based on a physical accurate wave solver. It calls, it's called the MUDIF. Now, MUDIF is only working on a two-dimensional region, and it's uh, very hard to uh, compute. Uh, to gain this result. So I'm using uh, uh, the, this MUDIF simulation to get a ground truth for uh, uh, small uh, uh, samples in the two-dimensional uh, re regime, and then uh, get some speckle fields. And, uh, and from those uh, several fields, I'm computing the speckle correlation. This is a, a ground truth uh, to physically, uh, physically accurate model. Now, in this specific uh, uh, paper, uh, I'm computing near field uh, speckle correlations. And other way to, to gain this is using a, a far field uh, simulator and just uh, compute a Fourier transform over all uh, viewing uh, lighting directions. So this is other way to get a grand truth. But uh, yet again, uh, as the sample becomes uh, larger, you need more and more and more directions, and it becomes uh, practical again. Okay, I have a question with respect to this, but I will first uh, read the question of Niv Cohen. Uh, how uh, does the integral, uh, so there are the integrals that you say that are presented in the paper. So how does this integral allow us to find the objects within the speckle? Yes, so as I mentioned, uh, to compute, uh, to, you, we can use the far field uh, approach uh, over uh, many, many directions. Now, one way is really obtain all those uh, 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 the computations for each direction, but it is very, very expensive. So other way is to just compute this uh, integral an analytically. Now it's impossible to, to compute this integral and remain in the von Fischer uh, model. So we have a little approximations, but uh, we showed that the bias is really negligible. Okay, thank you. I think uh, maybe you can say something. Maybe this was not the question. Uh, the question: How how you can find an object? So the answer is that there, there is no real object here. It's just like a, a homogeneous medium with scattering particles. It's not like that. Uh, there is an object inside the medium. Like there is a volume where we're scattering particles inside it, and we are just trying to get a correct speckle image, but like we're not uh, trying to see an image inside it. Uh, what Han showed uh, earlier uh, that you can see through the scattering medium and, uh, and recover uh, an illumination source behind it, that's a different uh, paper. It's not part of our work. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, you have to read the details. I mean, I, I cannot describe it here. Uh, but it's just uh, another work which is using speckle statistics and uh, to understand how to do that other work correctly, uh, you need an accurate, a physically accurate speckle simulator. But it's not uh, something that we really show in our paper how to do. Okay, uh, okay thank you. you. I, I, I will ask now the forbidden question. Uh, so, so you have the accurate uh, simulator. So instead of doing all your nice math and uh, very accurate, uh, nice uh, integrals, why not just uh, train a network to take the previous results from the Monte Carlo or from the other technique and just learn to refine it? So would, wouldn't the network just solve things for us? Why, why we need all yeah. this uh, nice math? And, I, I, and as you know me, I really like uh, 
close from solutions and I really think they all what you did is really cool but can't we just learn everything if we have a infinite number of ground to say uh, labels with the simulator so the question is are you obtain this uh, database so uh, we're showing a physically accurate uh, method that can generate many many samples so you I think you can go the other way around. If you have a problem and you want example, to... For example, you want to see, a, to find an object inside a scattering sample, or you want to solve all, all, of, uh, all of these other problems. So now our approach provides a way to get training data for a network. Yeah, yeah I understand. But, I mean, but, but I mean, if I would think about it in terms of a network, so you can think about it like training, like a denoising network or sharpening network or something like that. And so is, is there a fundamental uh, barrier for training a network for this task or? Uh, I mean, you can try. Sometimes you can try. We didn't try it. But uh, personally, I, I don't believe that uh, usually to, to train a network, you need a lot of data. And I don't believe that it's a replacement for doing uh, the, the accurate thing if you have a closed form solution. Yeah, uh, I, I think I usually really learning you need for something that you cannot really describe in closed form. So I think that the more important uh, application of this thing is that uh, you can generate physically accurate training data for many other hard problems in microscopy yet you want to detect object inside the scattering media or something like that for which you don't have an exact model it is a learning problem but uh, you at least need the physically accurate training data and that you can do with our simulator okay so I think it's a basic for applying machine learning techniques for other problems in, my, in microscopy okay thank you very much you Thank you. Uh, we will no, move now to our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Or uh, Patashnik, that uh, will uh, present her joint work with uh, Dov Danone, Hao Zhang, and uh, Daniel Koenor. Uh, and she will do a bit of balagan. So, uh, Or, you, you can present your... Uh, Uh, thank you. So, my, hi, my name is Or. I'm a master's student in Tel Aviv University uh, under the supervision of Professor Danny Corno. And in this talk, I'm going to present you our work Baragan, a method that performs unsupervised image-to-image -image translation between imbalanced domains. Okay. Um, so, let me start with the motivation. State of the unsupervised method for image-to-image -image translation such as Cytergun, MUNIT, CAT, and so on, struggle to achieve high quality results when trained on imbalanced data sets. So for example, here you can see the results of Cytergun when it was trained on various unsupervised image to image translation problems using 10,000 images from the source domain and a decreasing number of images from the target domain from 500 down to 125. And as you can see, the quality of the generated images drops as we decrease the size of the target domain. So motivated by this imbalance problem, we present a novel approach that is specifically designed to resolve the challenge uh, of the imbalance image, image translation. So for example, in ImageNet, there are a lot of, wolf, of dogs images and much fewer images of wolves. And we aim to translate between dog to a wolf. Uh, so to do that, our method receives a source image of a dog and the reference image of a wolf and generates a new image of, of wolf that has the same face structure and the same pose as the dog, but has the same style as the wolf. So to train our method, we receive two, set of, two, two sets of images, uh, one set that is considered as a source domain and the second set that is considered as a target domain. And by using both a source and a reference image, We can generate a variety of rules for each dog and significantly enrich the data set. Uh, so as you can see here, the structure of the face and the pose of each dog is preserved in each column and the style of each of the wolf is preserved in each row. Okay, so let's see now how does the method work. Um, so the key idea of our method is not to look at the source domain as, as one piece, but to decompose it into multiple modes. So for example, here you can see that uh, each mode is a different breed of dogs. Um, now this decomposition gives us a multitude of image to image translation problems between each pairs of modes. 
Now having these modes, we train the network to perform the translation between all pairs of modes. And this is exactly where the power fire method comes from. Since we train a single network to perform the translation between all pairs of modes, the network can perform the translation task better. And in particular, it can translate better from the source to the target domain. Uh, so this was the main idea of our method. Uh, let's see the details now. So, so the method consists of two steps. First, we need to extract the modes and then we can train the translation network. So first of all, what are these modes? So we have an implicit assumption that real world distributions are complex and we aim to find simple regions of this distribution and then each mode will be such a simple region. To, to do that, we train an encoder and then we cluster the representations. Now, the challenge here is that we have no supervision for training the encoder uh, and therefore we, we train it in a self-supervised fashion. Uh, so to train it, we take each image, we apply two random augmentations on each image, uh, we pass the augmented the image through the encoder and we get the latent representations. Then to train the encoder, we apply contrastive loss, we decrease the distance between representations of the same source image, and we increase the distance between representations of different images. So for example, here you can see that these two representations came from this dog. So we decrease the distance between them and these two representations came from different source dogs. So we increase the distance between them. Now this training procedure encourages the encoder to eat representations which are agnostic to the augmentations. Uh, so for example, here the encoder learns to recognize this dog even if the image is cropped or blurry or the colors in the image are a bit different. Um, and therefore, all the images of that dog breed will be close together and we will be able to cluster them. So here you can see the results of this uh, step. Uh, you can see that each cluster corresponds uh, to a different breed of dog. Um, so now we have uh, the modes that we aimed to achieve. Uh, and we can move on to the training of the translation network. So as I've said uh, earlier, uh, the translation network is trained to translate between all pairs of modes. Uh, and as in most image to image translation methods, uh, we use a GAN. And um, so we have both a generator and a discriminator. The generator receives an image from a source mode and a reference image from a reference mode and generates a new image that seems to belong to the mode of the reference image. And um, this is a quite, uh, quite common uh, generator architecture. Um, but the, the, the interesting part of our architecture is the, the, the discriminator. Since, we, since we're interested in an accurate translation and not only realistic images, uh, the discriminator is not a classic discriminator which discriminates between uh, real and fake images. Here, the discriminator predicts the mode for each image. So the generator aims to confuse the discriminator and making it think that the generated image uh, belongs to the mode of the reference image. And the discriminator aims to predict any mode except for the mode of the reference image uh, for such a generated image. And as you can see, this is a rather weak requirement from the discriminator, which is quite easy for it uh, to achieve. And therefore, we add another head for the discriminator, which performs classification between all the modes, but is trained on real images only. And therefore, along the training, this head needs to predict the right mode all the time. Um, and therefore, the learned features in the common layers are meaningful and they boost the performance of the discriminator. And as always, when training again, as the discriminator becomes stronger, the generator has to put more effort in order to confuse it. And, and finally, the generated images that we get are better. Now remember that during training, we train the translation network to perform the translation between all pairs of modes. But during inference, the source image is always taken from the original source domain and the reference image is always taken from the target domain. Uh, so let's see the results now. So first of all, let's see if we can improve uh, the results of Cycagan, which uh, I've showed you in the, in the beginning. And um, so again, we train uh, each method 
over uh, various image to image translation tasks. We take 10,000 images in the source domain and a decreasing number of images in the target domain. And as you can see here, on the left, there are the results of Cytergan and on the right, our results. Uh, and you can see that our method is able to generate images with high quality, uh, even when the two domains are highly imbalanced, uh, as you can see here. And uh, to further uh, evaluate our method, we measured the FID. Uh, so in this table, you can see the FID score that we, we, we measured um, for various uh, methods on various tasks. Uh, and in each row, you can see the results for a decreasing number of images in the target domain during training. And uh, as you can see in this table, uh, our method outperforms uh, other methods in a, all, almost always. Uh, and in particular, when the two domains are highly imbalanced, uh, our method significantly uh, outperforms other methods. Um, and we further uh, conducted a, a user study uh, in which each user uh, was asked to choose the, the image that looks uh, more realistic between an image uh, that our method generate uh, and then and then an image that was generated by uh, Cytergan. Uh, and as you can see overall, uh, our method performs really good uh, in the imbalance setting compared to other method. Now note for something interesting, um, the, the method that gives us uh, uh, the hardest fight uh, is Cytergan, which may be a bit uh, surprising, but uh, again, uh, when the two domains are highly imbalanced, uh, our method significantly uh, outperforms it. Okay, so now an important hyperparameter of our method is the number of modes um, for which we decompo decomposing the, the source domain. Um, so remember that our initial intuition was that as we have more translation tasks, uh, then the translation network um, is bet should perform better uh, because it has more uh, examples of uh, translation tasks uh, that it should perform. Uh, so let's see what happens when we increase the number of modes. Um, so here you can see the results of our method um, where in each column we took um, a, a bigger and an increasing number of uh, modes. Uh, and as you can see here, the performance of our method um, is getting better as we have more modes. Um, but you can also note that uh, from some point, I think from uh, here maybe, um, the, the change is, uh, is not very significant. Um, but, but the improvement of the quality of the images as the number of modes in, is increased uh, is set as with our initial intuition uh, about, um, about the translation tasks that the network has to solve. Uh, and also here we, we evaluated the FID uh, and we observed the same uh, behavior. Um, okay, so the good results in the imbalance setting uh, motivated us to test our method in the balance setting as well. So to adapt our method to the balance setting, we split the source domain and the target domain, and then we train the translation network to perform the translation between all pairs of modes. Um, so uh, again, here we, we compared our method um, to other uh, state-of-the-art method. Uh, so here you can see our results. Um, so you can see that we, we are, we, our method performs well, even in the general balance setting. Um, and uh, also here we evaluated the uh, FID and we've conducted a, a user study. And as you can see, our method uh, outperforms uh, other methods, in, even in, in this general uh, balance setting. And uh, now note for something interesting, um, for Stargun, uh, we, we compare, uh, we compare, we, we use two variations. Um, so Stargun 1 denotes the vanilla Stargun, and, and in Stargun 30, we decompose the domains into 30 modes, and then we train Stargun to translate between all pairs of modes. And from these results, we conclude that decomposing the, the domains into mode and train a multi-domain translation network between all pairs of modes is a general concept that can boost translation method uh, using archit different architecture. Uh, and the architecture that we use in our method um, is, is not part of the 
in the general idea uh, that can boost uh, also uh, other methods. Um, so uh, to sum up, um, we've seen a unique solution to the image translation problem uh, that is tailored to the imbalanced domain setting. Uh, and we also saw that uh, it can be effective uh, in the balanced setting as well, and uh, that it is a general concept that it, and it's not specific to the architecture that we used. Um, I think that an, an important message from our work is that by analyzing latent most of the data, we can improve the results of, uh, of, of different uh, methods. Uh, specifically, we, we use it for the uh, image to image translation problem, but we think that this general concept of analyzing the latent modes of the da data uh, can boost performance also in uh, other tasks and by using uh, other methods. Uh, and finally, we saw that defining additional relevant tasks uh, to the network uh, can be helpful to boost the performance uh, of the methods. Um, so uh, I invite you to read our paper on archive and, and to check out uh, our code and on GitHub. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Or. Uh, we have uh, several uh, questions uh, from the crowd. Uh, one of them is, how do you obtain the modes of the data? Uh, is it from outside labels or directly from the image data? So again, the, we don't have any labels for the mode. The input for, for our method is only a source in the target domain. And we, we decompose the source domain into modes by training an encoder. And then after we train an encoder, we pass each image through the encoder. And finally, we cluster the representations that the, this encoder uh, yields. OK, thank you. We have another question uh, from Tali. How is your learned features compare with uh, the of, with pre-trained uh, features, like uh, ones of VGG? Um, so um, we, we didn't uh, compare it, but um, the, the idea behind the uh, training such an encoder uh, is to be general to, to any domain. Uh, we don't want to use features of a pre-trained network such as VGG uh, because we want to be able to, uh, to perform our method for every domain. Um, but I think that uh, as, I, as I showed with uh, Stargun, this concept of uh, first decomposing the, the, dom the source domain uh, into modes and then applying a, a multi-domain image to image translation method uh, is a general concept. If, and if, for example, uh, you, you use a specific uh, domain, uh, which you know that uh, a pre-trained uh, network is, a, is available, uh, it can be even better for the method to achieve a good results. Thank you. Uh, what is the effect on the overall runtime of the model compared to other methods? Um, so we didn't uh, evaluate the, the running time. Um, but um, for, when I uh, ran the experiments, it's for, a, for, for, for a data set, it takes about uh, two days to train uh, everything. Uh, actually, the, the training of the encoder is, uh, is, fast, is relatively fast. It takes uh, a couple of hours, I don't know, four hours, five hours. Uh, and the translation network is the more uh, heavy part. Thank you. Uh, another question is, did you compare against a swapping autoencoder paper? Um, no, we didn't compare. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, in this paper, they, uh, they changed um, mostly the, the texture of the images. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they show a um, translation from, for example, from a dog to a cat. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, we will move to the next uh, speaker, uh, Ethan uh, Richardson, uh, that uh, will present his work with the Air Vice uh, from the Hebrew University about the surprising effectiveness of linear and supervised image to image uh, translation. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm uh, Ethan Richardson, and uh, I'll present uh, this work by 
my PhD supervisor, uh, Yair Weiss, uh, and myself. Uh, the work discusses uh, biases employed by unsupervised image to image uh, translation methods and suggests a, a different approach. Uh, in unsupervised domain translation or UDT, uh, as all mentioned, uh, the task is to learn some uh, transformation or translation between two uh, domains, for example, two image domains, uh, without ever seeing uh, matching pairs. Uh, so for example, one domain can be uh, um, faces, images of faces, and the other, the other domain can be cartoons. And if we want to generate, given a face, we want to generate a, a cartoon resembling this face, but we never see matching faces and cartoons uh, in training time. Uh, more formally, the task is to learn a, a conditional probability distribution, but after having access uh, just to a data set sampled, sampled independently from the two marginal distributions. This, this problem is known to be in general ill-posed. Uh, if you consider, for example, two uh, toy data sets of just uh, numbers, scalars, for example, between zero and one. Uh, so given uh, matching pairs as supervision, uh, this is a simply a regression uh, problem, right? Uh, but without matching pairs, you only see two sets of numbers between zero and one. And of course, you can choose any arbitrary uh, pairing and learn some function uh, which is valid, but not the right solution. Okay, so UDT is in general uh, ill-posed. So if this is, is the case, then how come methods like CycleGAM, Unit, and all uh, more recent methods uh, manage to solve the problem? Uh, we claim that this is uh, due to a, a matching bias between the architecture and the set of demonstrated uh, problems, and specifically the locality bias. Uh, if you look, for example, at CycleGAN, uh, this is an uh, encoder-decoder architecture with a very large uh, spatial size of the bottleneck. Uh, uh, and in addition, the uh, convolution kernels are, are small. Uh, this kind of architecture favors uh, making local changes. So the, each pixel of the output depends on a relatively small neighborhood uh, of the input. Um, and the changes are local. Uh, the set of problems these methods are demonstrated on have a matching uh, bias. Uh, for example, uh, zebras to horses, but if you look at all these examples, all the, all the uh, data sets used, then you will see that the uh, uh, general structure of the input is maintained and uh, the network only needs to change the colors and textures. Uh, in order to support this claim, we first tested, we wanted to break the, this matching bias between the architecture and the problem. So we first test a non-local uh, non problem, and then we test non-local architectures. Uh, to test a non-local problem, we simply use vertical flip. So uh, we used uh, Celeb A, a data set of faces, and we vertically flipped uh, the images for domain A. Uh, and now the methods just need to learn uh, vertical flip, but as you can see, both uh, CycleGAN, Munit, and uh, other methods we tested fail in this uh, simple task. And this is due to their uh, inherent uh, architecture bias, which is now uh, non-suitable to the problem. Uh, testing a non-local architecture is more challenging. Uh, we used a StyleGAN-based encoder-decoder uh, architecture based on uh, the very recent work, Adversarial Latent uh, Autoencoder. Uh, we modified this architecture to perform uh, domain translation. Uh, I, I won't get into all the training details, but the main thing to note is, now, is that now the bottleneck between the encoder and the decoder is flat, right? It's just a vector sized 512 without any uh, spatial dimension. And this kind of uh, architecture does not favor uh, making local changes between the input and the output. Uh, we tested, we used this architecture uh, on the uh, image colorization problem. 
And as you can see, uh, the problem, the, sorry, the model converged to a valid solution, uh, but an arbitrary one. So uh, given a face, it, given a black and white uh, face image, it generated uh, a color face image, but of a different unrelated face, right? So this is an arbitrary solution, not the one uh, we wanted. Um, uh, note that still this, uh, uh, um, the model is cycle consistent. So if we take this uh, uh, generated face and in, uh, apply the inverse transformation, uh, you will get the original image. So this shows that cycle consistency does not ensure by itself a non-arbitrary solution. Okay, so now we, we show we show that uh, uh, state-of-the-art methods like CycleGAN rely strongly on the locality bias between the problem and the architecture. Uh, and it, we now turned to look uh, for a more generic or different uh, family of, of uh, transformations. Uh, of course, some sort of bias is still needed because otherwise the problem is ill-posed. So uh, the first thing we looked at is just uh, linear and orthogonal transformations. Uh, and actually this uh, worked surprisingly well. Okay, so uh, we now look again for a transformation between domain A and domain B. Uh, that is simply uh, uh, applying a or multiplying the vectorized uh, version of the image by some uh, uh, transformation matrix. And we also require that this uh, matrix is uh, orthogonal. Uh, okay, this sounds uh, very simple and straightforward, but uh, there are two uh, challenges. One is that this, uh, this matrix is huge. Uh, actually, it squared the image uh, dimension, and this has more uh, parameters than a typical uh, neural network. Uh, and the other question is it's uh, the, the expressiveness of such a model. Uh, we're just applying a linear uh, transformation. So what kind of real tasks can this kind of linear and orthogonal transformation uh, represent? Uh, to solve the computational problem, the size of uh, this uh, transformation matrix, we applied the transformation in PCA space. So we first apply PCA or principal component analysis on each data set uh, independently. And, and, and by the way, on the images themselves without any deep uh, representation. So we apply PCA on the two data sets. Uh, we take the first uh, R uh, PCA components uh, uh, of in each domain. And then the transformation can be decomposed as applying the PCA transformation of domain A and then applying uh, Q, the, the orthogonal matrix which we need to learn. Now its size is just R by R, a much smaller matrix. And then applying the inverse PCA transformation of domain B. Okay, so this is the way we construct uh, our orthogonal transformation. Uh, why is this a good idea? So first, uh, um, uh, natural images can be well approximated with PCA with relatively few coefficients. If you look at the examples here, then uh, with relatively few, maybe 1,000 1, or 2,000 uh, coefficients, we can uh, reconstruct the images quite well. You can also see that the variance, the variance goes down steeply as we add uh, PCA components. Uh, so we can, we can have a low dimensional problem. Uh, maybe more importantly, if we have, uh, let's say in the ideal case where we have uh, infinite data, and if the true relation between the two domain is orthogonal, then the transformation or the true trans transformation is simply applying the PCA transformation of domain A and then applying the inverse transformation of domain B, which means that the matrix Q that was in the middle here is now, now equals identity. Uh, and this is true for the ideal case because the difference between the two domains is actually cap captured in these matrices uh, the PCA uh, components or the eigenvectors. Uh, but this is the ideal case and in real task, we don't have infinite data and the true transformation is not necessarily uh, orthogonal. But what we show is that uh, Q equals identity is still a, a good in initialization even for the real uh, and not really linear and orthogonal cases. 
We also show that many real tasks like image color colorization is close uh, to being linear and orthogonal. So we can use our method and our initialization. Uh, there is one issue with PCA that it is defined up to a sign ambiguity. Uh, we resolve this by looking at the higher order moments. Uh, specifically, we look at the uh, skewness and we align the skewness between the two uh, domains. And after doing that, uh, uh, this matrix Q is, is, is actually close to identity. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the algorithm that we uh, propose. Uh, it's based on ICP, iterative closest point iteration, and a method called Procrustes for finding an orthogonal, it's an orthogonal least square solution. Uh, so first we compute uh, PCA on each of the domains separately, and we synchronize the skewness, uh, uh, synchronize the polarity using skewness. And then, we, and then we run several iterations of ICP, iterative closest point, where first we find the best correspondence given the current transformation. And then we update the transformation using orthogonal procrustes given the correspondence that we found. And we repeat this for several iterations until it uh, converges. Uh, this is actually quite uh, fast, uh, the entire process takes just a few seconds or maybe up to one minute for data sets like uh, Celeb A uh, compared to days uh, for deep methods like uh, CycleGAN and uh, other methods. So it's a very efficient uh, uh, solution. Uh, some results. Uh, we also, we measured uh, the performance using uh, uh, met metrics like mean squared error and structural similarity. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, some examples, uh, this is for rotation. Uh, rotation and actually uh, all, uh, all transformations that are permutation of the pixels are orthogonal. So the result is very good. But even for tasks that are not linear or orthogonal like colorization, super resolution and in painting, the results are uh, not bad. Uh, here are two additional examples. Uh, here, this is an example for uh, other domains, not just uh, face images. Uh, and these are uh, two more challenging tasks uh, where the, uh, the true transformation is uh, very non-linear. Non uh, still, our uh, linear method uh, works quite well and produces a, a uh, let's say, pleasing result. Uh, this is edges to real, and this is in painting where a relatively large part of the image is uh, missing. Uh, another, uh, let's say, uh, option we, that we propose is not using our linear solution as the final uh, transformation between the two domains, but using it as an uh, auxiliary loss or as a way to guide a deep uh, neural net network that might be more uh, expressive. So this is the same architecture I showed earlier based on adversarial latent autoencoder that if you recall, it converges, it converges the, sorry, uh, to an arbitrary uh, solution. Uh, so uh, uh, now we add our uh, linear uh, transformation as an, as an additional loss. So we, we, uh, we use the pre-computed uh, PCA matrices and the pre-computed uh, orthogonal transformation. And we add a loss between the images generated by the two generators. Uh, as you can see, this is sufficient to guide this deep uh, network into a non-arbitrary uh, solution. So now it uh, transforms a face image to a color image of the right uh, uh, person. And it is still uh, cycle consistent. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, unsupervised domain translation is in general an ill-posed problem. We show that state-of-the-art methods uh, rely heavily on a matching bias between the set of demonstrated problems and the architecture, the locality bias. Uh, we search for, more, for a more generic bias and we propose the linear orthogonal transformations, which are very fast to learn and they work well for many true uh, relations. 
Okay, that's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. So um, one, the, the first is, uh, so basically you, so, so I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, when you train things. So you do, do you use the data set or you just apply it on the pairs themselves? We don't, we don't have any matching pairs, right? So we, we, we apply, uh, we learn on the, on the, on the uh, data set. We, they, we, after uh, PCA, uh, the, the, this uh, initialization of the matrix as identity is a good starting point uh, for, apply, for um, uh, applying the iterative clauses point. Okay, and the second thing is that, so you, you call it a, uh, you, so you look at a unsupervised domain transfer so, um, but, but, but basically when you do unsupervised domain transfer, people usually look at some downstream tasks. So for example, they do some supervised domain transfer uh, for classification or for uh, object detection or for image segmentation. And then they show, for example, that uh, in one domain, you were able to do very good segmentation and then you move to the other domain and you do, and you can still do segmentation, but here mainly you focus on moving the style and not on, so, so do, did you try applying this on some downstream tasks? No. So like a seem to real or things like that? Uh, like what, sorry? A simulation to real, so there are, uh, so, so, so in, usually in UDT, there are tasks of classification, so you have, uh, for example, uh, MNIST to SVHN, or mm -hmm. you have uh, the GTA to Cityscape. So you uh, have all these tasks in uh, supervised domain transfer, man. Want to know uh, if the, you applied it on some downstream task like this task? This is not really a classification. I mean, methods like CycleGun work on uh, different uh, uh, pairs of uh, domains that might be uh, cityscape uh, segmentation to real images is, is one example. Edges to faces is, is a very similar example, right, to, to uh, segmentation. Uh, our work is, uh, works well for when, when the uh, relation, the, when the true relation between the two domains is uh, not, let's say, extremely far, for, not extremely nonlinear. Non -linear. So uh, it will not work on, on all the examples used by uh, cycle gun, etc. But on the other hand, it, it does work on non non local examples, where well these methods uh, fail completely. So so I think it will work on, uh, let's say, a different uh, uh, set of uh, uh, problems with some with some uh, 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 similarity between them. Okay, so there is a question of, did you try it for less structured domains like uh, horses to zebra or on ImageNet? No, no, we didn't. Okay, and another question is, does the use of uh, this auxiliary loss that you add accelerate the convergence of the CNN? Uh, we didn't check if it accelerates. We, it, we, it, it does uh, guide it to the right solution. Uh, I think it might accelerate it as well, actually, but we didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, uh, actually measure, measure it. Okay, uh, and another for a question for the PCA, uh, you need to align your samples. Uh, did you consider a relation to functional maps? Aligning in, in what sense? I'm not sure I, I understand. So usually if you want to make transfer between two samples and you use PCA, so if the two examples are aligned to each other, things are expected to work better in uh, PCA. So if example, mm -hmm. if I have a face on the right side of the image and the sketch face oh, okay. in, on the left, so things will not work. You need things to be aligned. Mm -hmm. No, the, the, the data set that we tested are relatively aligned. So we didn't, uh, uh, but it might be a good uh, idea to try. And, uh, okay, so there is suggestion from the crowd to consider uh, functional maps. Um, another question is, will your approach work with general linear transformations as well? And not just orthogonal? Yes, yes, it actually does, yes. 
Okay, so did you try it with the? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a slightly more uh, general case, and and, and uh, uh, it does work. If if the problem is not orthogonal but linear, then it's also uh, it it does work, and we we tested some uh, uh, some problems like this. For example, the edges to uh, I think the edges to real faces. The example I showed is uh, is a linear but not uh, not orthogonal. Uh, in the code that we provide, we have two options for an uh, orthogonal or just linear uh, uh, transformation. Okay, thank you very much. Hi. We will have now a, a thank you. 10 minutes break and then we will continue. Uh, sorry, it's 20 minutes break uh, till uh, 11, and we'll continue then. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers in this session.
Hey, Raja. Are you still? Hey. Raja? Ushai? Hey, Raja. Are you still? Hey. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, we are back and ready to start the second uh, session. Uh, our next talk is from the Hebrew University about uh, style space analysis disentangled control for uh, style gain image generation. Hello. Hello everyone. Welcome to the presentation of style space analysis. This control for style gun image generation. The goal of this work is to discover uh, this control in style gun latent code. Uh, with uh, such that we can manipulate one attribute without affecting other attribute. For example, oh. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, the goal of this work is to discover this integrity control in style gun latent space, such that we can manipulate one attribute without affecting other attributes. For example, we want to manipulate head 
without affecting face identity, hairstyle, or background. Uh, and this method should uh, not only apply to face, but also other data sets, such as car and the bedroom. To do this, we analyzed the current state of art image generation model, StyleGam2. We discovered the style space, the space for uh, channel-wise uh, style parameter is significantly more disentangled than uh, uh, other common use latent space, Z and W. Next, guided by the modern disentangled theory, we discover a large collection of style channel that each one itself control a specific visual attribute in highly localized and disentangled manner. Third, we propose a simple method for identify style, style channel that control a specific target attribute using just a few example image. For example, using given 20 to 30 smiling face, we can identify the channel uh, control smile. Uh, our diverse manipulation could be applied to real image. This is Leonardo. We can make this smile, add the lipstick, change your eyes position, and uh, so on. To begin with, our method rely on a special design uh, of generator. In traditional generator, a noise vector Z is input to a sequence of deconvolution and the normalization layer. Recently, a style-based design has become increasingly popular, where the noise vector Z is forced uh, to, uh, transformed to an intermediate latent space W through a mapping function. Then this intermediate latent uh, space W is further transformed to a uh, style vector. So um, the style vector will control the channel-wise activation statistic of uh, each convolution layer. This style-based design has been shown to improve image generation quality. And the similar design has been used in other work such as big gun and the spade. To manipulate an uh, image in style-based generator, we need to find a manipulation direction that uh, it only change the uh, target attribute without affecting other attribute. Uh, in, in these cases, we want to find a, a manipulation direction for, um, uh, for, for mouse. To achieve this integrate control, we need to answer two questions. First, which latent space to use? And uh, uh, how to find the uh, manipulation direction? Current state of our work use either W space or W plus space, but uh, we use the style space. They either manipulate the entire latent vector or entire latent vector in a certain layer. But uh, we man just manipulate one or a few channel. To discover the uh, manipulation direction, they need a large uh, label data set or tedious human annotation. But uh, we just need semantic segmentation or a few example image. So to answer our first question, uh, which latent space to use? Z, W, or S. Uh, we, uh, in modern disentanglement series, they study the relation between latent dimension and the factors of variance. Each latent dimension uh, uh, is a channel in the generator's latent space. And the factors of variance could be any attribute the generator can control such as gray hair, lipstick, or smile. If one latent dimension it control multiple uh, attributes, then the space is uh, less disentangled. If the latent dimension, uh, uh, one latent dimension control one attribute, then the space is more disentangled. 
Uh, on the other hand, if one attribute is controlled by multiple latent dimension, then the space is less complete. If one attribute is just controlled by one latent dimension, then the space is more complete. Uh, guided by this metric, we show that style's space is more disentangled and more complete than W, play, w plus space, W space, and also Z space. Next, uh, if the latent space is very disentangled, then one late, a latent dimension will be enough to control uh, one attribute. To test this hypothesis, we calculate the gradient uh, of each channel in the style space with respect to the output image. We can see that uh, uh, the gradient map have, have, has a large overlap with a specific uh, uh, semantic area, such as hair, eye, mouth, and eyebrow. And we show that by just manipulate a single channel, we can perform very localized uh, control. Uh, we discover a large collection of uh, localized disentangled control. Here we show 12 different manipulation in phase. Each, each one is controlled by a single channel. The first row show different hairstyle, hair color. The second row show different mouse movement and uh, also lipstick. The third row show eye movement, eye size and the eye bone. Uh, we also found a large collection of localized disentangled control in car and the bedroom. Here are three examples of uh, uh, car manipulation. Each row is the same man manipulation for different image. We can see that the manipulation just changed the target area, uh, while other uh, uh, area remain exactly the same. This changed the, the first row changed the front of the uh, car. The second row changed the headlight. And uh, uh, here are three uh, example manipulation for bedroom. We can see the cover become smaller and bigger. Pillow disappear and then appear and become bigger. Lamp uh, appear and disappear. Uh, for more uh, manipulation, please check our website. Uh, similarly, if uh, the latent space is very complete, then to, to manipulate a specific attribute, we don't need to uh, change the entire latent vector. Just one, one or a few dimension will be enough. To test this hypothesis, we design a simple algorithm. Given a set of image with the same attribute, for example, all face wear hat, and a large set of population image, in this case, face with hat or without hat. Uh, we can turn each image into uh, its corresponding latent code. The x-axis represent different uh, face. The y-axis represent a different channel of the style vector. If the attribute is controlled by a single channel of the style vector, then we can find the most dis distinct uh, channel between the latent space of uh, example image and the populated ima population image, simply using signal to noise ratio. Our experiment shows that this simple method can retrieve a diverse attribute, such as different hair color, different uh, ha hair shape, different type of beer, earring, and uh, shoot. It was to note it, uh, mention that this method is no, uh, can not only retrieve uh, localized uh, control, 
It can also retrieve unlocalized controls such as gender. Uh, here we show three different manipulation. We can see that the gender manipulation is no localized, but uh, uh, our method can still retrieve it. And you can uh, add a beer to woman, change the hair side. Uh, furthermore, we show that with just 20 to 30 example image, we can retrieve the target channel with top five accuracy higher than 90%. To measure which method is more disentangled, we utilize pre-trained classifier to me measure how each attribute change. We first do the same amount of manipulation for the target attribute using different methods. Second, we measure how uh, different uh, how did the other attribute change. We show that for the same amount of manipulation for target attribute our method change other attribute less than interface gun and the gun space, which means our method is more disentangled. We also show qualitative result. Uh, for the same amount of manipulation for lipstick, our method does not change the face identity or the light on the face. Everything else except lipstick are exactly the same as the original image. For the same amount of manipulation for gray hair, our method does not change the uh, color of the skin or make the skin look old. For the same amount of manipulation for gender, our method does not change the hair style. To manipulate real image, we, we need to invert real image into generator state and space. We combine several state of our image uh, inversion method. And uh, importantly, we work on uh, style space rather than uh, common use W plus space. We can see the invert image maintain the main uh, attribute of the original face, such that the poses are exactly the same, the smile is the same, the beard is the same, the skin color is the same. Uh, we show diverse manipulation on the invert image. We can see the smile is realistic, beer is good. And this is uh, the Khaleesi. We can see it's exactly the same as our original image, except that this fancy earring and the background. We saw diverse manipulation. We can add a beer to woman, add a big nose, change eye size. This is young Leonardo. This is another girl. and another girl. Although the method could reconstruct face reasonably well, it, it can now reconstruct complex hair structure. We can see the reconstructed hair is over smooth. And this is uh, our Captain Jack Spiral. It has uh, very fancy hair. You can see that the reconstruction of the hair is no uh, good enough. Thank you very much for your time. Great, thanks so much. Um, yes, do we have any questions on chat? Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so okay. do you have any intuitive explanation why the style uh, space is much more disentangled than the W or the Z space? Uh, yeah, very good question. Uh, okay, so uh, Z space is the in initial noise vector, W is the intermediate one, and the S space is the uh, uh, the parameter that control the layer-wise uh, uh, convolution statistic. It's the actual style parameter. It's the more. It's the the one that actually control the uh, the uh, uh, the the mean and the variance of the convolution. So, so. I believe it's it's reasonable that uh, it's more disentangled because it's more con uh, close to the uh, convolution layer. Okay, and uh, another question: uh, Do you think it 
it's possible to discover uh, more complex um, uh, attributes by combining, uh, you know, information from different channels? Yeah, I believe it's possible. For example, we, we found channel that control wiko, uh, control glasses, and the control uh, uh, gui hair. So if we combine them, I believe we can make the person look old. Look old. This old is like a, 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 a more complex attribute. Okay, uh, another question from the audience. Uh, can your method be applied to other GAN models, e.g. Uh, big GAN? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. Like uh, we, we mentioned here, so our method is, uh, it can uh, be applied to all style-based design, all style-based design, not just style GAN. So uh, I believe our method can work also in big GAN or spade. Um, great. And last question. Uh, it seems like you are missing high frequencies in the reconstruction. Have you considered injecting high frequency to the generator, um, like for year features uh, that are currently used, you know, in implicit uh, uh, representation from uh, NERF, John Barron uh, work? Uh, uh, okay. So you mean the, the reconstruction is over smooth, right? So the mm -hmm. uh, it, it's is uh, missing some high high frequency d d detail. Yeah, we agree that uh, uh, the, the 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 face is over smooth and uh, it, there are some things that is missing. So uh, we plan to uh, train a, a, a de develop a better encoder in our uh, next work. So uh, yeah, the, the the about injecting high frequencies uh, detail, I believe it's a. Uh, it, it's a good direction, and uh, yeah, uh, I will take a look at the, the paper uh, uh, you, you just mentioned. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next talk uh, from the Technion by Elad Hirsch and uh, Ayel et al, uh, presenting visual illusions, uh, statistics-based uh, computational model. Uh, okay, hi. Okay, so um, have a look at the center rectangles. <clears throat> this and the other one. Do they have the same color? You probably think they don't, but surprisingly, they do. Now, what about these rectangles? Do they look the same? Well, they are the same. So in this work, we propose a statistics-based computational model that manages to explain these and other illusions uh, and also to generate ones. And I am a lad and it's a joint work of myself and my PhD advisor, Professor Ayel Etal from the Technion. And it was presented a couple of days ago in uh, New Rips. <clears throat> so as computer vision researchers, uh, we are very interesting in the way that a computer perceives the world and how we can make it perceive the world the same way as we do. And here is another uh, very famous example of a visual illusion called the checker shadow illusion in which two identical uh, rectangles A and B look different to us, <clears throat> but they are identical. Uh, so in this example and the previous examples, a computer that, that would measure these properties, for, for example, the color or the brightness um, can do it in a different way uh, than we do. So when working with visual illusions, there are a couple of things uh, we have to, to have in mind. First it is that human vision is yet to be fully explained. And there are many arguments among psychologists, neuroscientists, and uh, vision researchers about the high level mechanism of, um, of human vision. Uh, moreover, there are many types of seemingly unrelated visual illusions. For example, uh, those I showed you before, and it makes it very diff uh, difficult to choose a single direction to focus on. And last, uh, there is no well-labeled data set containing a large variety of visual illusions, and more importantly, the corresponding uh, psychophysical measurements. That means the way we perceive each and every area uh, in the image. <clears throat> so we found our inspiration in a sequence of works uh, of the empirical paradigm of vision which um, deals this uh, issue uh, with the statistics of the outside world. And it has a couple of um, principles. First is the observation 
that a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional world makes the inverse optical problem ill posed. For instance, the measured luminance of a surface corresponds to infinite possible combinations of illumination, reflectance, and transmittance. Hence, visual perception does not aim to recover uh, real-world properties as it's impossible, but to promote useful perception. Uh, visual illusions are then caused when the ill posed inverse problem is interpreted statistically, and more specifically, it is based on the likelihood of scale invariant patterns, or in our case, may be represented as image patches. Um, and in the spirit, Corny and Lodo showed that artificial neural networks that were trained to predict surface reflectance uh, could also predict the perceived lightness in several visual illusions, those that you see here uh, on the right. And more recently, Gomez Villa et al. showed that CNNs that were trained to perform low level vision tasks, such as uh, imaging noising, could, al could also make the same errors. Uh, regarding a couple of visual illusions, uh, for example, for example, those uh, you can see here. <clears throat> and uh, when talking about talking about generating visual illusions, uh, it becomes uh, less clear and much more complicated. And there are only two attempts that we know of uh, aiming to generate uh, visual visual illusions with guns. <clears throat> the first one tries to do it uh, with a simple gun and a large data set of visual illusions. Um, but very diverse, like they just took um, images of, of the, from the web um, and they're very, uh, very visually diverse and it's not that meaningful to sample from that space and indeed it, um, it leads to um, non-eye pleasant results and it's claimed that this method cannot fool humans. Another direction is generating uh, backgrounds for fixed patterns. Um, by adding another discriminator to the, to the gun, which should give different scores for the left um, target area and, and, uh, and the right one. Uh, so this works well, but as you can see, it focuses mainly on contrast and uh, synthetic environment. So um, <clears throat> um, we um, try to explain and support this theory using deep learning tools and a large data set of natural scene images to learn from. And we have three main contributions. Uh, the first, we introduce a tool for measuring the likelihood of image patches. Second is to support the connection between visual illusions and pet statistics in natural scene images. And third, to perform statistical manipulations to generate illusions. So our tool um, is a flow-based generative model, which enables log likelihood evaluation and reversibility. We train it on image patches sampled from a large data set of natural scene images. During inference, we feed the model with synthetic uh, patches representing uh, illusion patterns and measure their likelihood. Uh, and we generate illusory effects by controlling the likelihood of such patches. Um, so given an image, we generate a surrounding that is slightly more or less likely uh, by performing a gradient step on the latent representation of its patches and back projecting them. So let's uh, begin with uh, talking about how we measure the likelihood of image patches. And we recall that we also aim to generate visual illusions. Uh, so we therefore focus on likelihood-based generative models. And among them, we decided to work with flow-based models uh, and specifically the architecture of GLOW uh, due to three reasons. First, because they optimize the exact log likelihood of the data. Second, because they learn to fit a probabilistic latent variable model. And third, because they are reversible. And in a nutshell, let X be a patch sampled from an unknown distribution and D be a data set of such patches uh, from the same distribution, such Xs. Um, so we seek a model that would minimize the negative log likelihood of the data points. And this is also our loss function for training. The model is a composition of K transformations and each, each transformation uh, is invertible and it makes the entire process invertible and the connection between X and Z interchangeable. Uh, and it also fits a probabilistic latent variable model, which in our case is a normal uh, distribution. <clears throat> and specifically for our work, uh, we train the model on image patches. These patches are sampled from the places data set, which is a large data set um, of natural scene images. 
and each patch is of a fixed size 16 by 16 uh, which is a size that we found good enough to capture structures and textures uh, and also allow stable training um, and after after having this model trained uh, its evaluation is also not trivial because there is no ground truth of uh, patch likelihood so in this work we propose um, two measurements but it's not the core of the, of the work so i'll skip it today uh, you may have a look at the paper and we move on to the second stage of explaining uh, visual illusions with this learned model that we, we have. Um, so the model is, um, or the explanation is based on patch statistics and it's the same general explanation uh, for a variety of visual illusions uh, and we will demonstrate it on three different types of illusions. The first is the simultaneous contrast illusion, the second is White's illusion and the third is Hermann's grid. Um, in the core of the analysis is the percentile rank, which maps input values to output value. And it was shown to correspond to perception in uh, numerous works of the empirical uh, approach. So given um, a likelihood uh, graph for input values, we compute the percentile rank by performing, performing a cumulative sum and normalization um, to get this graph uh, which uh, acts as a mapping from input values to output values. Now let's see how we use it uh, for these illusions. So uh, have a look at the simultaneous contrast illusion. In this illusion, we have two identical center uh, patches surrounded by different backgrounds. In this case, the bottom background has a, a higher uh, saturation than the other one. And it makes the center looks uh, less saturated um, or as you can see, it's more uh, whitish. So uh, our tool estimates the likelihood of different center saturations given a background. And as expected, a uniform patch uh, is the most likely one. And when we have a look at the percentile rank, we indeed see that for the same uh, center saturation, we have a lower rank when surrounded by the more saturated uh, background. That means it would, it would look less saturated. Um, White's illusion is a different uh, visual illusion and it demonstrates the opposite effect. In this illusion, we have black and white stripes interrupted by uh, gray target areas. These gray areas uh, are identical again. And it's the opposite effect because this um, gray area looks darker than the other one but uh, if you see the, uh, the surrounding of uh, this gray area is darker than the other one. So it's exactly the opposite uh, effect that I showed uh, from the one I showed you before. Uh, so once again, we apply the same experiment. We have two uh, contexts or two backgrounds and we ask what is the likelihood of different center intensities uh, in this time. And we have the first likelihood graph and the second likelihood graph uh, for the different backgrounds. And when we have a look at the percentile rank, then again, we see that for the same uh, center intensity, we have a lower rank when surrounded by the darker surround. Uh, that means it would look darker. Hermann's grid is a totally different uh, illusion. And in this illusion, start an intersection. Uh, it looks white when it is in the center of gaze, but gray blobs appear in the periphery. Um, so to explain this illusion, we also have to emulate the receptive field, which is smaller um, in the center of gaze and larger in the uh, periphery. So we do it by observing um, two versions of the illusion uh, and specifically uh, the likelihood map of the illusion in different scales. The first one is high scale, uh, corresponding to the center of gaze, in which we see that the intersections are very likely. And in low scale, the intersections are the least likely. Um, so we take this kind of uh, patch and once again, um, perform the same experiment and ask what is um, the likelihood of different center intensities given this intersection um, surround. Uh, and we, we end up with this graph, uh, which is very similar to the one you, sh uh, you saw before uh, in White's illusion. And we concluded for that, from that graph that the center area uh, would look darker. 
<clears throat> so now let's see how we uh, use the same tool to perform statistical manipulation to generate illusions. Um, so given an image and a target area, we want to generate a surrounding that is slightly more likely or less likely. Um, and we use the model distribution of the latent variable uh, and the reversibility of the model. So given a patch X and a latent representation Z, we perform a simple uh, manipulation, which is a gradient step to make Z more or less likely, and then back project it to the patch space. Uh, and it leads to very interesting results. For example, these identical uh, textures look different when their surroundings are manipulated differently and uh, resulting in a contrast-like illusion. Or these uh, rectangles also look different after the manip manipulation, but this time resulting in a white-like illusion. Uh, and even for the grid, uh, for this illusion, I hope you can see it in your monitors because sometimes when it's small, you can see it. So if you have a problem, please uh, refer to the paper. Uh, but in this illusion, again, have a look at uh, an intersection in the left image and you will see it as uh, white, but uh, you will see uh, gray blobs in the periphery. And this effect is reduced in the right image. Um, and it's very interesting to, to notice that the um, the stripes are the same. The horizontal and vertical stripes are exactly the same in the two uh, sides of the image. And we have uh, many more results uh, in the paper. You may have a look. And to conclude, um, we propose the method to support the empirical paradigm of vision by computing patch likelihood in natural scene images. We use it to explain three different visual illusions and also to generate illusions by reversing the process. Uh, we have a couple of future directions. I'll go, go over it uh, briefly. Uh, the first is to explain this analysis to other types of illusions, for example, geometrical illusions. Uh, we know that there are uh, empirical explanations for such illusions, so we have a basis for, this, uh, for the work. We just need to adapt the framework to support uh, these representations. The second one is to develop an evaluation metric for illusions, which doesn't exist today, uh, and it would definitely promote the research uh, in this field. And last is to use these principles um, in other uh, perception related uh, fields in computer vision, such as visual uh, attention. Well, that's it. Thank you for listening. Great, thanks so much, Elad. Um, do we have questions on, um, mm -hmm. on YouTube? Let's see. Um, so I'm not sure if it's a question or comment, but uh, the color context could be horizontal in the fence example. Um, I'm, I don't really understand it. OK. Uh, uh, I guess I, I, if, if I think that it can, well, I don't really understand the current, so I, will, uh, I don't know. Uh, another question, comment, um, for, for me at least, uh, says Yaki, uh, it seems that the white illusion disappears if I turn my head 90 degrees. Is it only uh, for me? If not, can you model, uh, can you model explain this? No, so white illusion actually exists if you uh, rotate it 90 degrees. Uh, you can just uh, check it online and you will see um, versions of the white illusion when it's rotated and it, it also applies. Okay, from Tamar, uh, great work. It seems like your uh, manipulation mainly changes the DC color of the background. Do you have an explanation why? Did you restrict the model to do, to, uh, to do only such manipulations? So we didn't restrict it. Um, we, we also noticed that it mainly changes the color, but we can't really say how. It's not that it changes the hue or the value or the saturation. Um, so we, there's no uh, specific rule. Uh, but that's a, an, a very interesting point, um, mainly if we want to take it further to use it to geometrical illusions. Uh, so that's a great question and we, we are uh, trying to investigate it. Okay, I have another uh, question. So uh, you train your uh, model on uh, patches from the places data set. Right. Um, but you then feed like a completely uh, different uh, distribution of images. Uh, um, don't you have like a domain gap problem here? Um, so what we liked about the, this uh, GLOW architecture 
that uh, we saw that it can generalize well to these um, synthetic patches. For example, when we tried to use GMMs, then uh, it, works, it worked very differently. We just got uh, delta functions that we, we could not work with. Um, and this could generalize well. Um, so that's why we, we work with it. Okay, another uh, question uh, from Ron. Uh, fantastic work. Can you please justify the use of percentile rank, uh, rank as a, a correlate of human perception? Okay, so um, there are many behavioral explanations for this um, um, measure, and I will not go into it. it it's uh, it's well uh, written in, uh, in other papers of um, the empirical approach. I see it more like... Um, the derivative of one function of another. Uh, it's kind of like uh, optimal quantization, um, but it's my, my thought, so I, I don't wanna talk about it uh, right now. Maybe we can uh, take it offline, but the reasoning of it is behavioral. Um, we can take it uh, to a comput computational level, but that's a discussion of us. Okay, great. I, I guess I have another high level question. Um, do you think like those insights can be used to actually do the reverse, like uh, design a better generative image model? Like if a model managed to understand uh, perception of color is better and optical illusions, will it be able to generate images better? Um, I think it may. It may be. Uh, maybe it can. It can be used as uh, you know to measure the performance, say, of guns or uh, other generative models. Uh, actually, someone asked me about it in, in the conference. Um, yeah, I think we can uh, we can use it, but as there is no um, there is no quantitative met metric for illusions, it's pretty hard to uh, to take it to that level. I should I, I guess it will uh, it will require a lot of progress in our understanding of uh, the perception and how can we we can make a computer perceive these images. Uh, the same way as we do before we can uh, use it. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Elad. Thank uh, you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, we're going to move on to the next talk uh, by uh, Yuval Nirkin. It's a joint uh, work uh, collaboration between Ben Gurion Uni University, Tel Aviv University, and Facebook. Uh, title is uh, Deep Fake Detection Based on Discrepancy Between the Face and Its con Context. So yeah. I'll go ahead. I'll just share my screen. Then. Um, yeah. Can you see the can you see the presentation? Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, so hello everyone, I'll be presenting uh, our paper, Deep Fake Detection Based on the Discrepancy Between the Face and Its Context. It's uh, Barry Lan and uh, Tel Aviv University. And we'll start with uh, a brief history of face mocking. So in face swapping, the source face is swapped with the target face and we attempt to generate realistic, unedited looking results. Um, face swapping methods were around since 2004 and were initially semi-automatic. Subsequent methods were fully automatic and were usually based on a CG pipeline. First, the 3D uh, poles, 3D shape, and expression of the faces are calculated using a 3D morphable model. Next, the visible parts of the faces are segmented. And finally, the source texture is wrapped onto the target face, and the faces are blended together. <clears throat> and the term uh, deep fakes originated from the Reddit user by the same name in late 2017. To generate a single swap, um, a large number of images of both the source and the target faces had to be collected, on which a model mapping the source images 
uh, to the target images is trained usually for about two or three days. So this is, uh, this is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time. So this is uh, how, how this method works. Um, so the images from the first subject are fed to an encoder and the resulting face embedding is passed through a decoder to reconstruct the original face. <clears throat> and the same is done using the images of the second subject using uh, the same encoder, but with a different decoder. At inference time, the target face embedding is swapped with the source face embedding and passed through the target decoder. The FSCAN method can work on any pair of people without specific training. Therefore, we can produce uh, real-time results on unseen subjects. It can work on very challenging scenarios, such as face swapping of different skin colors. Given an input source and target images, we first generate a sequence of guiding face landmarks with small pose changes. We then recurrently align the source face to the target face and segment the visible parts of the faces. To overcome partial occlusions of the source face, we complete the missing parts required for filling the target face. And finally, we transfer the completed face to the target image and seamlessly blend the images together. It is important to note that uh, those face swapping methods were originally proposed with good intentions in mind, such as uh, privacy preserving uh, virtual try-on and data augmentation. Unfortunately, this technology can be misused uh, for spreading misinformation and potentially causing real harm to people. So how do we know that what we're seeing on the web or on the news is genuine and not actually a misuse of this technology? <clears throat> so the vanilla approach for detecting deep fakes is to look for method specific artifacts. Different generators leave behind telltale signs that this is not a genuine photo. Here we collected a, a bunch of examples from a, uh, from a public benchmark for deepfake detections for, uh, where we as humans can actually spot the artifacts, uh, but those are actually failed face swaps. Uh, so you can train methods to detect those visible artifacts and also imperceptible artifacts. Um, so, so this works quite well in general, but this, is pr this approach has its limitation. A particular limitation is around the fact that different generators and different GANs have different output dis uh, distributions. So training a method on a closed set of generators do not generalize well to others. So this fact is, uh, is best demonstrated by the deepfake detection challenge, DFDC in short. Um, the DFDC is the biggest benchmark for deepfake detection. It contains about 3,500 individuals of diverse ethnicities. Uh, that's <clears throat> they all consented that their videos will be manipulated by different manipulation methods. The dataset itself is it's huge. It's composed from around 40 days of footage in a variety of environments. Uh, the total of uh, 2,265 competitors competed for $1 million in total prices. Uh, the videos were manipulated by a variety of uh, generation methods, uh, of which some were held out. So the DFDC results are uh, captured by this scatter plot where each blue dot represents a different detection method positioned by its core on the, on the public test set on the x-axis. And 
its core on the private test set on the y-axis. If we focus on a particular point that represents one of the best performing methods on the public set with a score of about uh, 0 0.2, we can see that the score on the private set is considerably worse, zero, about 0 0.47. So this is a quantitative indication that generalizing beyond, uh, beyond uh, known methods is a very hard problem. So how do we detect uh, deep fakes generated by unseen methods? Making this of course more challenging is the fact that those methods are trained to become more and more realistic. So detecting those fakes is becoming harder and harder. Our first observation is that all known face manipulation methods only manipulate the internal part of the face and not, and not the context, meaning the rest of the head. So here you can see the manipulated regions of uh, six reason manipulation methods um, marked in blue. So uh, deep fakes and uh, a variant of deep fakes in the middle are, uh, they, they only manipulated uh, a fixed rectangular region of the face. Face-to-face uh, -face neural textures and uh, face swap affect uh, the regions of a projected 3D morphable model. And FSGAN rely on the area of a segmentation mask. <clears throat> So this is not a coincidence. All, all those methods focus on the internal part of the face because they're trying to manipulate, because, because trying to manipulate the external part of the head is much harder. So this is likely to be true for future methods as well. <clears throat> Our second observation is reflected in this rock core. It reports results of four different tasks on the labeled faces in the world benchmark. <clears throat> the first result, the blue line, is a standard verification task. Uh, a model is trained on a large face data set is used to extract embeddings, which are then compared to tell if those faces are the same or of the same subject or not. The results are near perfect as expected. <clears throat> so the next result, is almost the same. In this case, we segment uh, the, the internal face regions and remove the, remove the context. So the classification model is only looking at the, at the internal part of the face and not the context. The results, this results in a very minor heat in performance. Again, this is not surprising as the face includes a very strong signal for identity. The next result is a little bit more surprising. Here, instead of removing the context, we remove the, the face itself. What's surprising is that it yields almost perfect results. Even without looking at the face, only the hair, uh, hair, neck, ears, we're still getting a very strong identity signal. Finally, uh, what I think is uh, the most interesting result is represented by the red line here. So this isn't a very high result by today's standard, but, but still quite good. In this experiment, uh, we again segment the faces, but this time we train one network only on the internal faces and one network only on the context. <clears throat> Here we compare not the representation layer, but the output of the two networks, which share the same identity space, which allows us to directly compare them by computing the distances between them. And we're doing the same uh, with, the with the role switch and average the results. So, we know that the, the two previous experiments, from the, from the two previous experiments, we know that both the face and the context contain a strong identity mm -hmm. signal. Um, and in this, experiment, we'll, in this experiment, we also verify that those signals are, are highly correlated. 
<clears throat> our intuition, given a, a single image, we compare the face and the contacts and seek inconsistencies. Those, incon those inconsistencies are a telltale sign that those images are maybe fake. So as example of this are those two images. On the left, you can see that the subject wears glasses, but they do not extend to the rest of the head. Glasses are usually attributed, uh, usually attributed as part of the identity. On the right is a little bit more subtle. The, the face regions re represent a male gender and the context represents a, a female gender. So those observations led us to the following system design. In the pre-processing stage, we take in single images, apply detection, segmentation, and cropping, and produce the full face images I, the face only images IF, and the context only images IC. Here. <clears throat> the full images are passed to the method specific encoder that looks for known artifacts taking advantage of the information available on known on methods. The face and context images are passed to the face and context encoders respectively. The outputs are then normalized, subtracted, and concatenated with the method specific representation, and then fed to the discriminator trying to say if the image is real or fake. So here we compare our face swapping detection results to previous methods on two data sets. FFDF, which is a subset of face forensics plus plus containing the deep fakes method and select DF version two, which is a very difficult benchmark. Uh, as apparent from the results, our method achieved the best accuracy on both data sets. Another experiment we conducted is to, is to test the generalization capability of our method and for that, we extend the uh, face forensics plus plus with two additional face swapping methods, the 3D base swap and the uh, end FSGAN. We compare the binary exception at baseline to a three variants of our methods. And um, the first face identity difference here, we only use the identity encoder without the method, the method specific encoder. A full pipeline trained end to end and our full pipeline where the pre-trained identity encoders are frozen in the, in the training process. The results appearing in the top of the table, uh, for them we use a fixed threshold and for the bottom experiments we use optimized thresholds. And as can be seen from the results, our method generalized far better than the naive exception at classifier. Uh, thank you, any questions? Thank you, Yuval. Um, do we have questions on chat? Feel free to, um, to throw them there. Okay, uh, I guess I have one question. Maybe it's more a high level question and maybe you get it quite a lot, but it seems like now you basically proposed a really good objective function to optimize for the next um, you know, face swapping um, um, algorithm. Um, I mean, how, how do we handle this? Like, for example, now I can design a model that will basically try to optimize exactly this objective, you know, trying to make consistent uh, uh, face swapping with the background, right? Um, how do you see it on a higher level or what's the next step in, 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 this, um, in this area? So, so yeah, you, you're absolutely right. So. Okay. We also, because we also, uh, uh, we're also working on synthesization uh, methods. We know that trying to synthesize um, very fine details like hair or beards uh, or the ears is, is very, very difficult. So no, nobody, nobody has been successful so far. Uh, I believe it, it might be, uh, it, it might be done in the future and then uh, we will have to rely maybe on different uh, different detection methods. Um, so lately, uh, there was a method for um, that tries to detect uh, um, the heartbeat using just uh, images of the face. So 
So there, there are lots of different directions and this field is just, you know, it's, it's just beginning. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question from uh, Raja. Can you detect swapping of other par parts except for faces? Um, you mean other parts uh, of the body? Um, maybe other objects or yes, maybe other parts of the body. Like, can you generalize beyond, you know, uh, face swapping? Oh, uh, well, we haven't, we haven't tried this. Uh, so our method is very specific for faces. Um, but I believe if, if you only manipulate uh, a part of the body, so this method can be also used for, for detecting uh, manipulation on the body itself. But we, we haven't conducted this experiment yet, but um, we maybe we'll do that in the future. Okay, and I, I think the next question is uh, very much related to mine. Uh, what about the possibility of using your method to improve faking method is there a way to prevent this? Well, um, so, so our method just relies on, <clears throat> on extracting identities from, from two different parts of the head, like the external part and the internal parts. Um, today, you, you, can use, you can use GANs, you can use the discriminator to, to improve the quality, but I, I don't think you can, uh, I don't think, uh, the identity network can, can be applied to improve uh, the synthesization uh, methods. Um, so I, I don't think it's, I don't think our method can be used to improve, uh, to improve other, other manipulation methods. Um, I mean, you could use this objective function to basically just say, I want to generate a, fa a phase that will be more consistent with its surrounding. And uh, you could maybe mm -hmm. add like a delta um, um, manipulation to the face, like changing colors a bit or changing other, uh, uh, ha having a delta of uh, change that will match better the environment. Well, well, if, but if uh, your core function, if the, the idea of your, your algorithm is to change the identity of the face, then, then, uh, and, and it is not really possible to change the other side, the, the external part of the head, then there, there will be some kind of identity mismatch. So, so, so this, is, this is like, this is the core, the core idea of face swapping. So this is, uh, this is both the, the purpose and also the, I think the best way to detect it. And so I don't know if you can, if a face swapping method can really rely on, on our method as an objective. Uh, unless it is, unless maybe in the future it will be possible to manipulate the entire head, and that, then maybe yes. Okay, thank you so much, Yuval. We're gonna thank move you. on to the next talk. Um, so next we're gonna have Yael uh, Conforti from uh, Ben Gurion U University talking about inference graphs for CNN interpolation. Please, Yael, take it away. So. Uh... Yeah, and me and Yael will present it together. And um, so I will start. Um, okay, so uh, I am alone and uh, together with Yael, we will present our work, Inference Graph for CNN Interpretation, uh, that, which pr that was presented in the previous CCCV conference and was done with the supervision of Boaz Lerner and Aaron Barilen. So uh, as well known, CNNs are the leading architecture for most computer vision domains. And the major challenge with these networks is understanding the decision-making process due to their complex architecture and end-to-end -end training. Our main challenge is to enable improved human understanding of the network inference process. More specifically, we want to convert the network activity, which is a series of distributed layer presentations into a representation that will be understandable to the user observing it. From that representation, we wish to form a dictionary of visual words, model the interrelationships between visual words of different layers and their relation to the final prediction. The way we want to do this is by explaining the network using probabilistic models. Each layer in the model network is assumed to be generated from a multivariate Gaussian mixture model. Transition probabilities between clusters in consecutive layers 
are estimated to identify paths of inference. So when an example is passed through the network, we can, invest, we can identify and investigate its inference path through the clusters representing it. In our work, we present two models, one for MLPs and another for CNNs. For an MLP network, a full model with efficient inference can be obtained by learning a single hidden Markov model. Layer activity in fully connected layers is associated with one of K clusters models modeled as GMMs. Dependencies among GMM components in consecutive layers are described using conditional probability tables. If one would want to describe post relu activations, the model enables such option. In this case, each neuron is assumed to be generated from a rectified Gaussian density, resetting values lower than zero to zero. The model is trained with online EM in a procedure suitable for large scale networks and shown to provide consistent results. Now Yoel will take it from here to describe our CNN modeling. Thank you, Alan. So for CNN, we turn to simpler model and training techniques that are scalable to the size and complexity of these kinds of networks. So here we model the spatial location vector X at location P uh, layer L as uh, described as a rising of a Gaussian mixture model contained KL components. We define that each example is assigned to cluster K if the conditional probability to belong to this cluster is the highest. We consider each cluster representing a visual word, could be edge or texture or body part. Together, all the clusters in the single layer forming the layer dictionary. So from now on, if I'm saying a visual word, it's the same as saying clusters. In order to obtain the layer dictionaries, we train a CNN GMM model. So first we get a pre-trained CNN network. network. Then for every layer we want to model, we append to it a GMM layer and set its parameters as learning weights. Then we train all the GMM layers and estimate their parameters uh, separately and independently using stochastic gradient descent. And here we prevent from the gradients coming from the GMM loss function to seeping into the lower layers in order not to prevent from the natural behavior of the CNN. We just want to explain it. So uh, in order to estimate the GMM parameters, we use two kinds of loss functions. The first one is the generative loss, which we minimize the minus log likelihood of the Gaussian function. And the second one is based on the discriminative approach in which uh, we want to achieve a discriminative visual words. So we use the cross entropy loss function. So here from the output of the GMM layer, we uh, calculate a histogram of visual words using a global pooling layer. Then we apply a linear classifier that distinct between different classes based on this histogram uh, of visual words information only. Okay, so after we obtain the layers dictionaries in all the uh, layers we modeled, we now would like to form a graph in which visual words will be the nodes in the graphs and the conditional probability between nodes in consecutive layers will quantify the edges of the graph. The problem here is that if you try to, to discretize the internal network uh, representation, it will require thousands of visual words in each layers. And if you try to visualize it, it will be very hard for human interpretable uh, to look at this huge uh, graph. So the solution here, here is to find a subgraph that explains a subset of, uh, uh, of uh, images that it could be class or a single image. Um, and for this subset of images, we can analyze the inference process and we can have a high explanatory value for the decision change chain with this sub, uh, sub, with this sub graph for this subset of uh, images. So our challenge here is, is how can we find the most explanatory visual words uh, with respect to the subset of images we want to analyze? So to answer this question, we develop an iterative algorithm starting from explaining the classification decision node. And when I say explain, it's in the sense of maximum likelihood. Then explaining the layers backwards, uh, 
until outputting a subgraph of the nodes that most explain the network decisions of the chosen subset of images. So for example, uh, if we, we want to explain a single uh, visual words appearances stated as S that appears at location P in layer L, so now we want to explain it. So we look for uh, uh, the subset of, uh, of visual words T in its receptive field, most contributing to its likelihood. So the expression we want to maximize is the conditional probability of the appearance of visual word S given all the visual words appearances in its receptive field toward layers L tag, where L tag is the formal model layer of L. From this, we get the explanatory score of how much visual word T explains visual word S. We can see that the scores is divided by two subterms. The first one is the number of visual words T appears in the receptive field in location P. In the other one is how likely is to see visual word T in the receptive field uh, of the S, or visual word S compared to seeing it in general. So after we find the subset of visual word T, they become the new visual word we want to explain now, S. And the step of finding such of explanatory visual words uh, in layer L tag is repeated to the lower layers. Okay, so now I'll present some results obtained from our model. So this is an example of pineapple class inference graph in VGG16 trained on image in a data set, where we modeled five convolutional layers using a, our generative model plus an output layer. The top node is a visual word um, from the output layer containing the images predicted by the network to belong to the pineapple uh, class. Lower level in the graph show the three most explanatory visual words um, in preceding layers. So now I will zoom into the top level in the graph to get some clearer vision. So here we see three most influential words in top convolutional layer that are char that characterize the pineapple class that we can see that they can be categorized as the grassy head where we can see that the receptive fields points on the head of the pineapple. Second one is the pineapple body. And the third one is some a uh, rough texture with bottom round edge. The arrows uh, are entitled by the two components of the uh, node selection algorithm score function. On the left, we have the frequency of the lower visual words in the receptive field of the higher. It's the first term in the explanatory score. And the right one is the log Rashi term. And here we can see that it is approximately three. So it means that if we'll take two in the power of, let's say three, we'll get eight. So it means that it, more likely, it's eight times more likely to see the grassy head visual words in the receptive field of the class pineapple if we compare it to see the grassy head in general. Okay, so the errors shown when the log term is positive and colored green for significant connection in which the term is higher than one. Next, I'm going to analyze the creation of grassy head and pineapple body visual words. So when we're going to the lower levels in the graph, we can observe the formation of higher layer visual words from lower layer visual words. So here, for example, we can see that the pineapple body word is composed from words capturing most striped texture and some dotted texture. And these two visual words in turn generated from some smoothie diagonal stripes visual word and some rugged texture. So we can see clearly that the visual words in this graph are representing some uh, strong pineapple features. So another example uh, where we can use our uh, generative model, uh, in the inference graph, graph to diagnose uh, the network error. So here present an example of image inference graph from the same network where the analyzed image belonged to the pineapple class now was wrongly classified by the uh, network to belong to the swing class. The top node here contains images predicted by the network to belong to swing class, including the image we are analyzing. The analyzed image is shown on the right side of each cluster node with red dots marking spatial location assigned to the visual world. We can see that this pineapple image was wrongly classified to the swing class due to three dominant visual words this image contain, focusing on rope-shaped visual words, which we can see that pointing on the rope 
of some pole uh, structure in the image and the leaf. We can see also that it's uh, formed by some sand visual words that pointing on the ground of the image and some grassy, grassy visual words. So the graph clearly shows the weakness of the network whose inference is primarily based on the image background and fails when the object proportion of, in the image is really small. Okay, so going to the low layers of the graph, we can see that the rope visual word um, uh, for, uh, originate from similar vertical straps visual words. And this was formed by some isolated vertical line. So again, if you look at the graph, we can see no evidence of pineapple features at all, uh, which led the network to this classification error of the swing class. With our model, we can do also a feature comparison between different networks. So here is an example of the same pineapple image that was wrongly classified to a class swing in VDG 16, but now correctly classified to pineapple class in ResNet 50. The subgraph presents a visual word from top model layer connected to visual word from a bottom model layer. And as can be seen, ResNet 50 detects successfully the pineapple location in the image, where both visual words present contain strong pineapple features. Uh, we show another technique for comparing the general behavior of the layers in different kinds of networks using similarity matrix. So for example, here we present a comparison between the cluster similarities across layers for MLP and ResNet 20 networks, both trained on C410 datasets. Each matrix show the Euclidean distance between the cluster center centers from the same layer. Blue indicates a small distance and green indicates large distance. We defined each cluster as representative of a single class whose examples are the most frequent in the cluster and the average dominant class frequency is stated above each matrix. Next, we ordered the clusters by their dominant class where clusters representing the same class are located next to each other. And we can see here that for MLP, we can see increasing similarities uh, between, the clusters, between the clusters uh, when we are progressing with the layers. But in contrast, we see that the CNN clusters stay local and diverse even in the uppermost layer where the receptive fields already covers the entire input space. This evidence indicates that the final classification decision of the CNN is based on several visual words which are not similar, but they appear simultaneously in different image regions. And the aggregation of all these visual words led the network to the classification decision. So to summarize, we introduced a novel approach for hidden layers activity interpretation, both for MLPs and CNNs. We develop a node selection algorithm for finding the most explanatory subgraph with respect to subset of images that we want to analyze. Next, we presented an inference graph, both for class specific in order to understand the general network reasoning for this class or for a specific image to do some analysis and error debugging. Thus, the, our model can be utilized to understand the network hidden inference mechanism or alternatively to reveal the network weaknesses. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much for listening. And we'll go to some question now. Thank you, Yael uh, and Alon. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions. Um, so from Shai uh, Bagon, how long uh, does it take to train your GMM model? Um, our GMM model, it depends uh, on how, okay, it depends on a couple of parameters. It depends first how many layers you want to model. And first we have the KL component, which means how many visual words you want to form in each layer. So the larger dictionary you want to have, it's the longest. Uh, but our model doesn't require many epochs. Like it, it, you can have like five to 10 epochs and you have your, G, your GMM layers because you train only, only the parameters belong to the GMM layer only. And how many labeled images are required for training the GMM model? 
label we, we we take the classif the image net with the original labels we don't we don't need to generate um, uh, new labels for the for images it's just the originals the origins labels classification one the R model is a generative model it doesn't it's like unlabeled uh, unsupervised learning Okay, so related to that, I think uh, um, how how labels words like grass were generated or marked. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is good. Uh, the the words uh, was our interpretation. After we obtained the visual words, uh, we looked at them and then we give it our own interpretation for what we're seeing. We didn't enforce the network to learn specific visual words. We want to have uh, um, to model its uh, general behavior, and we didn't want to interfere. Uh, so the visual words label that you see in the, in the presentation, it's our interpretation only. It's not, uh, it's not something we enforce. Okay. Um, can you integrate the pre-trained language model to improve your results? Again? Can you integrate the pre-trained language model to improve mm -hmm. your results? Mm -hmm. um, we didn't try it. Um, I guess that when you, when you force the model to, to learn uh, specific uh, uh, words that, that correspond to human being words, I think it will damage the, 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 the way you, you, the generative way that you want to model it. It will be very specific to what you force to model. Uh, we didn't try it. Uh, we we can do this also, but in my opinion, if you want to understand the the layers behavior, uh, you need the less to interfere with your human interpretation into the layers. You need to do post hoc and not uh, before. Okay. And uh, last question: uh, Can the most explan ex explanatory subgraph used uh, for model uh, pruning? Mm, yeah, um, we can use also this one for model pruning uh, because we can see the, um, the, the frequency or how much dominant visual words. If we take like for a certain class or for a certain image, we can analyze uh, or, or gather some statistics of the visual words that are most uh, act activated uh, with re and to uh, compare it with the visual words that were less uh, activated. And thus we can do definitely some, uh, some pruning to the network and uh, to see which, uh, which visual words were not relevant to the model at all. Yeah. That's okay, nice great. Uh, I guess I have last question. Uh, can the same method be applied uh, for other networks like generative adversarial networks to understand them better, or it has to be a classification network? Um, uh, I, okay, if you, it's, it's a way to cluster uh, the activity of the layers. Uh, we, we suggest a, a way to cluster and to model connection between clusters in, in consecutive model layers. Uh, if think... indeed for, I think that the simple answer to that is we have two losses. So one is discriminative and one is generative. So if you use the generative loss, you can use it for every, for every network that comes up to your mind. If you use the discriminative one, that in, it relies on the label of the class. Yeah, I, I think it's a pretty good answer. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Thank you both. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Bye-bye. So the last talk uh, in this session is uh, by Amir Barr uh, from Tel Aviv University on uh, compositional video synthesis with action graphs. Hey, actually it's uh, Roy. I'm, I'm the, I will present our walk, um, not Amir. Um, can everybody hear me? Can you see my screen, my mouse pointer? Are we good to go? Good to go. Okay, cool. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Roy. I'm a second year PhD student at Tel Aviv University. I'm working with 
Professor Amir Globazon and Professor Trevor Darrell from UC Berkeley. And I'm also a member of the Berkeley AI Research Lab. And today I will present our work, Compositional Video Synthesis with Action Graphs. This is a collaboration between Tel Aviv University, UC Berkeley, and Video Research and others. Okay, so let me start by describing several structured problems in computer vision. Um, as you probably know, um, structure in computer vision has been recently an active field in many tasks and applications. And let's see some examples. Um, okay, so one of the popular applications is SYNGRAPH, a special structure uh, representing objects and their relations. So you can see here, we, we have a dog on motorcycle, the motorcycle has seat and you can see the corresponding image. And scene graphs are a high level semantic structure useful for multiple downstream tasks as such as image, image retrieval, object detection, visual language and more. Um, other popular tasks, tasks in computer vision are um, image and action recognition, for example, in image recognition, non-local networks use self-attention model with non-local features to improve image classification. Um, while in action recognition, people try to use space and time interactions over graphs. Um, another active field is visual language in which several works used various um, graph operators for relational reasoning, VQA, referring expression, uh, and more. And the same holds for image generation and scene graph to image task proposed by Justin Johnson in CVPR 18. Here you need to generate an image given a scene graph. Um, for example, you can see a sheep by sheep standing on grass and, and you need to generate the corresponding image. Um, in our work, we focus on the task of video synthesis, which is an expansion of image generation for the temporal domain. Um, so the goal in our setup is to synthesize a video condition on content. Um, there are two main approaches in video synthesis. The first one is V2V. -vid. It follows the same paradigm as image to image translation, um, meaning given a segmentation maps, you need to generate uh, the video. However, it requires mask supervision, uh, which is both crazy and expensive. And in addition, it is how to generate goal-oriented videos by starting to segment each frame uh, individually. So, okay. And the second approach is video prediction. Here you need to predict the future frames given the first, the first frame. Um, so this task is based on the data distribution since given the first frame, we can predict multiple correct videos. Um, and let me just know that this is a hard problem. It's still open, of course. Um, and we focus on a limitation of current approaches. They cannot generate goal-oriented videos. Um, and to mitigate this, we propose to synthesize goal-oriented videos by conditioning on a structured description of what should happen. Um, so the task setting is given a graph and first frame and layout. Layout is the bounding boxes. Uh, you need to generate the video. And next, we, we, I'm going to describe um, action graphs, a general structure for this task. Um, so action graphs um, is a natural and convenient structure uh, representing the dynamics of actions between objects over time. The nodes are objects. The edges are actions with defined time execution. Um, here you can see an example um, for a video and a corresponding action graph. You can see a green small metal con contain another green small metal con between frame three and five or time step three and two five. And generally a video contains multiple actions simultaneously at different times. Um, and here you can see uh, the, the area, the relevant area in the video. So action graphs are motivated by classic work in cognitive science and psychology, which argues that actions are hierarchical and compositional, um, and thus they can capture the hierarchical and compositional nature uh, of actions in videos. Um, moreover, actions are time dependent, and since a video contains uh, multiple actions between objects, this could represent the structure of a video faithfully. 
So as I said before, we proposed the task of action graph to video, and here we have a more concrete example of the action graph and the layout in the first time and the predicted video. Now, the main question is how to generate a video from action graph, right? This is the main, uh, this is the main, this is the main, this is the kind of our, our main key task. And a key challenge in our model is how to keep track of the execution of different actions. Um, in action graphs, monitoring the progress of an action is done by a scheduler, uh, which keeps track of the action progress as the video proceeds. Um, so at each time step, we know the progress of the action. Let's take an example. For example, at time step three, um, 100% of the peak flicks action occurred, right? But, uh, okay, so while the rotate has, the rotate action has not even started yet. So, so, um, so basically we decompose the video into discrete frames and times in order to understand the progress of the action. And one last exciting contribution, contribution is that we compose nuance in actions from atomic actions, uh, for example, we compose new huddle action by learning to generate contain action and instruct all other objects to contain the same objects. So we have here the red cone, the purple cone, and the gray cone, and we kind of uh, instruct all the objects contain the snitch, and you can see actually a new action. Uh, the same holds for uh, uh, composing moving down and move left. Uh, to generate a new action of left down. Um, swap action, uh, it's a, it, it, the, uh, the swap action is composed by sliding and pink, pink place. Uh, the, the purple sphere yep. is slide, while the gray uh, sphere is, um, sorry, the gray, the gray cone is uh, pink place to, to the, other, the other direction. So they kind of a slide. And, um, yeah, so um, let me describe the model a little bit and then we'll discuss about the results and show you some cool videos from both synthetic and uh, non-synthetic data set, real life data set. Um, so, okay, let's start by describing the model. So we have a Markov assumption in our model and to better explain it, I will split it to two main parts, uh, the layout generation and the frame generation. Uh, although it's an end-to-end -end model. Um, um, so um, the, the, the layout generation function, it needs to generate the, the current layout given the previous layout and the current graph uh, time t, while the uh, frame generation function need to generate the current frame given the previous frame, previous layout and current layout. And I also know that the frames are generated uh, sequentially. So here, here, here we have a high level architecture description with the two main parts. Uh, first, the layout generator generates the current layout. Uh, as I said, at time step t, given the action graph at time t and the previous layout. Uh, as you can see, we process the layout in every frame to describe uh, the course level motion trajectories of the objects. Um, so for instance, uh, in the previous frame, you have a red cone at the top of the image, in the previous frame, and it's also corresponding to the top of the layout. And while the current layout should describe how the red cone moved from the left top corner to the middle, uh, to the top middle of the image, uh, here you can see an example. Um, and basically it shows you that uh, it showed you an example of the learn motion trajectory of this specific object. Um, okay, sorry. Um, right, so not sure what's happened here, but uh, the frame generator generates the current frame by adding um, um, a generated image from a, gender, a generator network S with prediction of a flow network F. Basically, um, we have um, two, two uh, different networks in one end-to-end -end model. 
uh, we have a generator and a flows network that kind of uh, help us to smooth the transition between two consecutive frames. Okay, so let's see some results on the something something data set. Uh, something something, by the way, um, so it contains uh, real world videos of human performing basic actions. Here you can see eight atomic actions and two unseen. Uh, we have the push right, push left, move up, move down, take, put, cover, and uncover. Um, so those are the eight atomic actions. And we have another two unseen actions. We have the right up and down left. The, we, set, we, we generate them by composing two different other actions. Um, and here you have some results on the KTR data set. So KTR is a synthetic video data set originally created for action recognition and reasoning. Uh, each video contains multiple objects performing actions in parallel. Um, and you can see the four atomic actions, slide, contain, um, pick place and rotate, and two unseen actions, swap and huddle. Okay, uh, so before I proceed to the results, let me describe a little bit the baselines. So we compared the generation results between our model and three different baselines. Um, we have Hoigan, it generates a video given a single action object pair and initial frame and layout can be viewed as operating on a two node action graph without timing information. Uh, by the way, it's not applicable to cater data since the, da the data contains multiple action object pairs. Um, and then the next one is V2V or V2V. This, ba this baseline uses a state of the art uh, V2V model to generate videos from a ground truth layout. Let me know that. Um, so since, since it uses a ground truth layout, it provides an upper bound, right, on a V2V performance for this task. And the last one is compositional video prediction, a work from CMU that uses an input. Um, so it uses as an input the first frame and layout for future frame prediction without access to the action information at all. Um, and last, uh, we also experiment with an RNN architecture uh, as an al alternative to the GCN implementation. The motivation behind the RNN is to, the RNN experiment is to compare the decision choice of a graph neural network to a model that processes edges sequentially like RNN. So the first evaluation is human evaluation of the action generation with, with respect to the semantic accuracy and the visual quality. So we tested both of them, both the semantic understanding and both the visual, how the video looks like, the generated video looks like. Um, um, yeah, so for each metric, uh, later selected the better of the two generation methods. Uh, we generated images, by the way, on uh, uh, 256 on 256. It can be seen that our model performs better than the baselines. And the second evaluation presents generation metrics with no humans involved. We have the learned perceptual image pets similarity, which is widely used to compare similarities between videos, while inception score and FID are widely used as it correlates well with the visual quality of generated samples. Um, and let me know that higher is better for the inception score, while lower is better for the FID and LPIPs. Um, and again, um, our results are quite good. And last, we compared the layout generation. This RNN has access to the same input and supervision to the GCN, namely the previous layout and the graph at times the T. The results confirm the advantages of the GCN processing. Okay, so last but not least, in the remaining time, I would like to explore some of our recent workforce structure in computer vision at a high level. My current research focuses on developing um, structural models for video and image understanding, since they enjoy the properties of generalization and inductive bias, which I think are uh, uh, critical, especially in the intersection of vision and language and robotics. In the first two papers, we propose better semantic models that exploit spatial and temporal interactions for video understanding. 
And the last walk focused on complex scene generation, where we show how to use canonical representation for the scene graph the image task. Um, and that's it. Okay, I think I'm finished. And uh, and I'm here. And I'm here if you have any questions. Uh, thank you for listening, and big thank you to the organizer for hosting. Uh, so thanks. Thank you so much. Are there any questions on chat? People can throw them uh, there now. Um, so in the meantime, I will ask, uh, what's the gap between applying you know, such method on, on natural videos? Uh, did you attempt at that? Or what's the bottleneck currently in applying these types of uh, 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 methodology on, on natural videos? Right. So natural videos contains, uh, contain contain um, much more um, um, let's say uh, um, uh, they have a structure inherent structure that uh, today it's a little bit hard to generate vi uh, natural videos without uh, like a supervision or a specific supervision per pixel or whatever. But um, I guess that. Um, we kind of, in our work, we focus on the semantics of the video. And you can replace any generation method that hopefully in the future will be able to generate more the structure. I can show you um, of what I mean. So you can see here that the hand, the hand structure is a little bit becoming blur, right? Um, as the video contains. Over here, you can see um, this. Uh, not sure what is it actually. It's a kind of a you know a tool for pouring water, I think. So uh, uh, you see that the structure is a little bit uh, becoming blur as the time proceeds. So I think that, uh, and this is one of the biggest challenge in generating natural videos is how to make them look still coherent. And actually, we are working on that right now uh, about a line of video synthesis of. Uh, kind of a video editing, uh, how to change the video and uh, in order to, you know, given a one video generate another video by just changing few types of few rules that you define. But uh, yeah. Okay, uh, and, and I guess uh, I'll ask another question. So how, how uh, do long range uh, dependencies um, you know, uh, over time are modeled in this uh, action graphs. Right. So, so while we have a kind of a big problem in generation in the visual quality of generation, um, actually the, the, you can see that when you are working on a little bit more higher level of semantics structure representation, you can see that the temporal currency is much better. And this is quite interesting. Um, and maybe not that, I mean, it's not intuitive, but uh, I think it maybe contains some uh, explanation because in order to generate good semantic videos, you need to have a better understanding of what you need to generate. And it's also applicable for uh, the time, right? Because you need to generate something that has some long-term dependencies. Um, I guess that the best of the two world will be combined both semantic and models that can generate very good visually content. But uh, I think that today um, it's very hard to generate visually quality videos without have a very, spe very uh, specific supervision, which is quite expensive. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Can you generate more complex actions such as non-rigid human body deformation? Right, so uh, we didn't try that. We kind of uh, tried more uh, like higher level uh, actions, but uh, so we we, tr we did try to generate uh, like something that merged between uh, taking a remote control and open the TV. Um, but at some point uh, we just saw that again, um, we have a little problem of generating a different background. That's our main difficulty. We can generate really good uh, and nice uh, unseen actions, but uh, we need them to be um, um, with something of a background. We need the background to to implement it, to to look at, to look to make sure it looks uh, visually really good. 
And can you modify a video using your graph method by first yeah. identifying the yeah. object in it? Yeah, that's what we're right now working on. That's what I'm trying to, when, I'm, when I refer to video editing, that's what we want to do. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, so I think we're gonna go on a break now uh, for 20 minutes and um, return afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Should we start? We start. Okay. Okay. So uh, welcome back to the third session of the Vision Day. Our first talk in this session is going to be uh, given by Amit Bracha. This is joint work with uh, Oshri Halimi and uh, Ron Kimmel from uh, the Technion. This talk is about shape correspondence by aligning <clears throat> scale invariant LBO eigenfunctions. So uh, hello everybody. As uh, as been said, my name is Amit, and I'm going to talk about our work. It is a joint work with Fushri Halimi and uh, Professor Ron Kimmel. It was published in 3DR uh, 2020. So our motivation in this work or in this process was to create a robust and intrinsic descriptor, but in the same time, we want to make it, uh, we, want, we want to align uh, the Laplace Beltrami operator eigenfunctions. All these process uh, need to be in an unsupervised optimization way. And we want it to be explicable by that, that we can justify every step we take in the optimization process. So before I dive into our method, I want to talk a bit on the Laplace Beltrami operator, uh, LBO in short. Well, it's defined here and uh, where G is the metric tensor. Um, so it's basically the a generalization of the Laplacian from the Euclidean domain to a manifold. Um, well, for example, if you set G to be the conical delta, you will get the Euclidean Laplacian. Since it only depends on the uh, metric and not on the embedding of the shape, it is an intrinsic operator and thus its eigenfunctions are also um, intrinsic and uh, they can potentially use as intrinsic descriptors. Another version of the uh, Laplace Beltrami operator that we use in our work is the scale invariant uh, Laplace Beltrami, which is defined the same, but with a different metric that you can see here, where K is the uh, Gaussian curvature. This metric causes the operator to become uh, invariant for scaling. And uh, to emphasize this point, uh, you can see here uh, in this image two shape. <coughs> to shape one in each row, uh, in the upper row, uh, the regular shape, in the, uh, in the lower row, uh, we have scaled down and up a uh, part of its body. And the uh, two figures are colored by their scale invariant uh, eigenfunction. And as you can see, the scaling did not affect the values of these eigenfunctions. <clears throat> so uh, the scale invariant uh, eigenfunction can use as a candidate to uh, to be descriptors or intrinsic descriptor. They are intrinsic, as I said, and obviously they are scale invariant. However, they are, uh, they are two, they are two main, they are, they, they are, <laughs> so there are two main issues that prevent us to use them as descriptors. And not, uh, not only them, but in any version of the Laplacian, uh, the eigenfunction of the operator face the same issues. Okay, not only the scale invariant, but any other. The first one is sign ambiguous, and what do I mean by that is, well, if a function is, a, let's say, an eigenfunction for some operator, then the negative of the same function is also an eigenfunction for the same operator, meaning that uh, 
which leads us to a problem like uh, that one, where uh, you can see the same human in two different poses, meaning that uh, those two figures are almost isometric. However, um, in order to show the sign ambiguous problem, we colored each shape with its second eigenfunction values. And blue here represent a negative number and a red represent a positive number. As you can see, one is the negative for, of the other. And uh, this issue is especially undesired in the case of um, descriptors because, well, uh, in bad descriptor is simply inaccurate, but in this case, uh, those descriptor points the other, uh, the opposite direction, legs to ends and vice versa. <clears throat> the second problem uh, is a rotation in the spectral domain, which can happen where two shapes are only nearly isometric and not uh, simply isometric. And uh, in the case of symmetries in the figures. So here we got an example for it where we have uh, two, uh, where we have two uh, uh, poses of the same human, meaning that again, almost uh, isometric shapes. And we can see that the second and the third eigenfunction of one pose are the linear combination of the second and the third eigenfunction of the other pose. So in a broader look, uh, if, we, if we try to, uh, uh, to find the rotation to take the first pose eigenfunction to the second pose eigenfunction, we get uh, this matrix that you see in the right. And it's a bend unitary uh, matrix because, well, most of the support is near the diagonal and it's getting uh, wider and wider with each and uh, with each index we added. So this is the matrix that we aim to find because then we can align those eigenfunction one with, with the other and we can create a, with it a, well a robust intrinsic descriptor as we wanted. So to find it first of all uh, we use our knowledge uh, of its band structure so we uh, use the Adamar product by a mask and the weight matrix a learnable weight matrix uh, W, which results in this matrix R. And this is the matrix that we aim to optimize. <clears throat> so this is our framework. In it, we use both the LBO eigenfunction and the scale invariant LBO eigenfunctions. Uh, the LBO eigenfunctions are used as a basis for the functional map framework. And uh, we'll show it in a minute. And the scale invariant LBO eigenfunction used as descriptor for the same uh, uh, framework. We multiply the first pose scale invariant eigenfunction by R and the other by R transpose. And so basically we don't look anymore as the rotation, as I said before, and we look for the half of the rotation instead. So we input the output from the product to the functional map framework and we output the functional map uh, C. And with this C, we create the soft corresponding matrix. And with the soft, this soft corresponding matrix, uh, we input, we get, we use this uh, soft corresponding matrix to input as an input to our uh, losses. And from those losses, we back propagate a gradient to uh, the matrix R. Uh, on a side note, uh, I want to talk about this multiplication of the LBO eigenfunction with the scale invariant LBO eigenfunctions. Um, this multiplication uh, or this map uh, introduced by Halim and Kimmel as a functional, self functional map. And this mapping reflecting the relation between um, the same, uh, reflecting between the uh, eigenfunction of the same shape, just with, uh, that were calculated with a different metric. And the optimization showed that with a proper alignment of those uh, eigenfunction, we can use this self functional map to find the correspondence between two figures. <clears throat> and so the first loss that we use in our uh, framework uh, is a novel uh, that we will discuss here is the novel loss that we use is uh, the alignment loss. Basically what it means is that uh, we boost up the optimization process in the following manner. The, um, given, a, a, given a good alignment, we, we will produce a good correspondence. And then with this good correspondence, we can then uh, check if our alignment was really that good or not. So to do it, we first multiply the scale invariant eigenfunction by the, from right by the uh, rotation matrix and from left by the induced correspondence uh, defined here, which basically is the argmax of the soft correspondence matrix. If the alignment is perfect and the rotation is perfect or alignment, uh, so the alignment is perfect and the correspondence is perfect, then this product is no other than the uh, other pole scale invariant uh, eigenfunction multiplied by our transpose. 
And the second loss that we used is the unsupervised loss by Khalim et al. Uh, this loss was, uh, this loss rely on the fact that uh, the geodesic distance between two uh, uh, surfaces or shapes are preserved, uh, two uh, isometric shapes are preserved. So uh, this was penalized on the changes between vertices uh, given the correspondence, and it is a good match for our framework because, uh, well, we try to correspond between two nearly isometric shapes. However, since we have only nearly isometric shapes, this uh, loss does not zero on the ground truth, which unfortunately for us, we reach sometimes in the cases where we get a lower error than the ground truth, reaching to a, an error in the correspondence. <clears throat> so uh, to deal with this issue, we added the psychic loss by Ginsburg and Raviv. This loss used two soft corresponding matrices, as you can see here, one from the one shape to the second and the other from the second shape to the first one. And basically what it does is penalize on the dis difference between the distance map that transformed to the other shape and back uh, from the original shape. And the attribute that we see here is that we get a zero uh, uh, error in the case of the ground truth. And when we add both losses, the unsupervised loss and the psychic loss, we uh, did successfully improve our corresponding error. So now I'll present some of our results. Um, this uh, section is divided into two, the alignment and the correspondence. We we'll start first of all with the alignment, uh, the alignment of the eigenfunction, of course. And we can see here the, uh, the result is uh, presented as the uh, relative error between the eigenfunction versus, versus the eigenfunction index. And uh, by logic, uh, the more the index is higher, the, uh, the difference between the eigenfunction should be uh, greater. And as you can see here, the uh, unprocessed uh, eigenfunction without optimization process uh, reached to a steady uh, error uh, very soon. And uh, in the orange line, you can see uh, our optimization process without the psychic loss, only the alignment loss and the unsupervised loss. The yellow is after we added the psychic loss uh, to the optimization process. And the blue line is an ablation that we, de we did to uh, examine the optimization process in it we simply use the same distance matrix from both shapes. Okay, we have the ground truth. We can use the same distance map matrix for both shapes. And we uh, want to check whether our optimization process can improve without a ground to fail. And it did. And this experiment led us to add the psychic loss to the optimization process. So we have a quantitative, uh, is it a qualitative result uh, for alignment? The upper image uh, showed the uh, eigenfunction before the optimization and the lower image represent the eigenfunction after the optimization. Each four column represent different uh, indices of the eigenfunction. This four uh, represent indices two to five. This one, uh, 12 to 15, and the last one is 22 to 25. As you can see, the, uh, the process or the optimization process did successfully align uh, those eigenfunctions. So the last uh, result that I want to show is the correspondence result. Here is a quantitative uh, result for the co correspondence is on the false data set. <coughs> and as you can see, our uh, our, uh, um, our methods with both losses, the psychic loss and the unsupervised and the alignment loss, reach a better uh, uh, result than the, um, than the unsupervised FNMET by Khalim et al., which was the state of the art method in the self supervised challenge. Another thing I want to point out is that the correspondence in the, the, correspondence in the case of the uh, of our ablation, uh, which showed that without the ground truth error, our optimization can reach a uh, much higher uh, correspondence. Well, this is it. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, so if there are any questions, please write them in the chat. Um, in the meanwhile, I have a question. In the last graph you showed, uh, what was the horizontal axis here? What? What is the horizontal axis? <clears throat> the geodesic error. 
geodesic error versus the, co the correspondence percentage versus the geodesic error. Okay. <clears throat> In the first uh, set of experiments you showed uh, with... Uh... Here? Yeah, here. Uh, this is the index of the eigenfunctions. Uh, starting the low eigenfunction does almost does not uh, um, rotate in the spectral domain, so it's only the reflection that causes problems. And after a while, it's the, the they they do rotation they do rotate in the spectral domain, and and you see that the error is almost steady in the in, in the higher indices. Okay. Okay. However, in our case, uh, we reached, uh, we did successfully align, partly aligned the eigenfunctions, so we lower this uh, error. So, <clears throat> just to see if I understand, the, the error is between the eigenfunction and the, the eigenfunction of the second shape uh, projected into the first shape? Yes, exactly. It's like the, taking the, uh, the, let's say, the optimal correspondence and with the um, let's say it's some eigenfunction multiplied by R. Uh, this is wrong, like that one. And the, the, high, the high index of that minus the, of the other shape, uh, R transpose, uh, also I. Okay, this, this is the... And this is with the ground truth correspondence? Yes, this is with the ground truth correspondence. Okay, uh, we have a question. Um, what about symmetry left to right and non geodesic deformations? Does it find good correspondence? Well, uh, most of our error was, uh, was in the case where we. Um, we had a problem with the symmetries from left to right. Well, the human figure is almost uh, symmetric left to right. And we had uh, a, a lot of time that the left is mapped to the right side of the other figure and the right is mapped to the left side of the other figure. So yes, this is, this is mostly a mistake. Without, uh, without those uh, mistakes, our correspondence would be much, much higher. We didn't low, we didn't, uh, try the graph without the, the symmetry issues. Okay, and uh, can the functional map layer can support partial data? Well, uh, there is a trick uh, to support partial uh, partiality in the functional map. Uh, we didn't try to do it, um, but possible, possibly, yes, we can, it's possible to use it, we can possibly use it possible. Okay, I see there are no more questions. So uh, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. We we'll move on to the next speaker. Hi. Okay. Um, Back. Yeah, just a second. Yeah. We're slightly a bit uh, ahead of time, but I think. Uh, okay, I think let me know when you want me to start. Yeah, I think I think uh, we can start. So uh, the next uh, talk uh, is uh, by uh, Mital Rapoport Lavi and Dan Ravi from Tel Aviv University, and the talk is about it's all around you range guided cylindrical network for three D object detection. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Tomer. Um, so as Tomer mentioned, my name is Mital rapoport Lavi, and I'm a master's student in the Geometric Deep Learning Lab under the supervision of Dr. Dan Aviv. And uh, today I'm presenting It's All Around You, a range-guided cylindrical network for 3D object detection. So first of all, what is our task? Um, we are working on a nuisance data set, and the input is a point cloud from 360 degrees LIDAR sensor. In the image, we see the scenario from the bird eye view with our ego vehicle in the center of the image and the input point colored by distance around it. The output required is bounding boxes around objects from 10 different classes of variant sizes. 
from the small trafficons to the massive trailer. For each boundary box, we need to output its center, size, orientation, velocity, and attributes. The Nissan dataset provides not only a single point cloud from a static moment, but a sequence of clouds. In this video, you see the lighter points around our Ego vehicle and the ground truth bounding boxes. On the above right image, you can see the according image just for the aid of visualization, as our network only uses the lighter points. Most 3D detection methods can be classified into three main categories in terms of point cloud representation. The most common, especially among state-of-the-art methods, is the voxel-based method, in which we divide the point cloud into 2D or 3D grids and usually average on all points inside the same voxel. The second one is a point-based method. Based on the pioneer work, PointNet and its variant, the point-based method directly extracts feature from the raw point cloud. As a result, they have higher computation costs and are usually much slower. Recently, we have witnessed the third category, who is attempting to blend the two together. But whether we are talking about the first category or the third one, they are all using the Cartesian coordinate system to do the voxelization. In this work, we propose using the cylindrical coordinate system instead, which has many benefits over the classic Cartesian one. First of all, it is aligned with the scanning pattern of the rotating LiDAR sensor that, as you can see, produced the ring shape pattern. Second, we acquired the sensor point of view, as we will see in a bit. And third, it allows us to preserve higher resolution with the raw point cloud. Due to the characteristic of the LiDAR sensor, we get much more points near the Eagle vehicle than distant from it. The bottom left figure shows the average number of points in a Cartesian grid voxelization as a function of range from the sensor. Now, since every voxel must output a single value per feature, no matter how many input points it gets, we aim to achieve a more balanced line. Here is an illustration of the Cartesian grid. The gray, voxel, the gray voxel symbol zero voxels, meaning voxels without any points inside. If we will just decrease the voxel size, the whole line will go down and we will end up with much more zero voxels at the far range. And if we just increase the voxel size, the whole line will go up, meaning we will decrease the number of zero voxels, we will also get much worse resolution at the near range, since now every voxel has much more points. But the cylindrical coordinate system possess naturally more voxels at the near range and less at the far, allowing our network to maintain higher resolution of the input point. So to enjoy all the benefits of the cylindrical coordinate system, we first need to overcome the challenges it poses. First and foremost, unlike the Cartesian system, it is a self-oriented system. So here we can see an illustration of our map divided to voxels by R and tip. And here is how it is mapped into our in network input array. The purple and yellow shapes represent two cars and the small lines indicate their front side. As we can see on the left side, the purple and the yellow cars are of the same size with the same orientation and are placed in the same range from our Ego vehicle. But as we can see, easily see on the right side, it is not mapped in the same way to our input array. This is because they are placed in different theta coordinates. While both cars are directed to zero, the theta center of the yellow car is half pi, and the theta center of the purple car is zero. You can imagine our network point of view as if you were sitting inside our ego vehicle and turning your head towards the object to see them. This is in fact the sensor point of view. Here, the two cars are mapped in the same way to our input array. So if, if instead of learning the plane direction of the object, meaning theta d, we'll subtract from it the theta coordinate of the object center, meaning theta center, we will get an advantage over the Cartesian coordinate system. And I'll explain. 
Here we see the point cloud around our ego vehicle. The green and the blue cars have the same orientation, but they do not share the same distribution of the point clouds that hits them. The blue car is hit from the front, so you can fully see its front bumper drawn by the point, while the green one is hit from the left side. So we can observe, for example, the structure of its left doors. But in the Cartesian system, we demand from our network to output the same output for both. But in our modified cylindrical system, an object with the same orientation as we defined before will always get hit by the sensor from the same side. As you can see in the example, an object with the new theta directions of minus half pi will always be hit from the sensor on its left side. An object with new theta deal of zero will always get hit from the back, and so on and so on. This focus our network on a more precise statistic. The self-oriented system is also affecting the velocity estimation. Let's say this is our ego vehicle and it's Cartesian grid. And this is a red bus driving on its left side and its red grid. You can see that both grids are aligned with each other. Even if there is a translation between the two, the axes of both are parallel. So when the red bus is driving along its y-axis, it is also along the y-axis in the coordinate system of the ego vehicle. But when using a self-oriented system, the axis of one object does not align anymore with those of a different one. Therefore, to transfer the object to our cylindrical coordinate system refers to subtract the center angle of the objects as before, and then split the new angle into two perpendicular values, velocity in theta axis and velocity on r axis, both, again, on our cylindrical self-system. And of course, due to the circular characteristic of the theta axis, it is easy to see that an object can be spread on both sides of our input array, as shown here for the magenta car. Therefore, in all of our 2D and 3D convolution layers on our, our cylindrical network, we use a circular pattern instead of the classic zero pattern. In addition to the change of coordinate system and the modification to overcome the rising challenges, we also suggest the novel approach of a range-guided convolutions, which we apply in the backbone of our network. So why do we need range, range guidance? This is another illustration, where we see cars with the same theta dirbal, but in different ranges. It is easy to see that a closed car is spread over more voxel in the theta axis than a far one. So first of all, we need a mechanism that will control our receptive field of our network according to the range. And second, and this is also true for any kind of coordinate system, the statistic of a closed car and a far car are very different from each other. For example, we see the two cars are circled in orange, again with the same size, etc. But it is clearly that both that the bottom one has many points cloud that hits it, while the upper one is only two. Therefore, we also aspire to guide our convolutions to learn different features for different ranges. This led us to invent a new network for our backbone, namely the range-guided backbone. So first, we took a simple backbone, colored in black, and added a parallel branch with only the range feature, colored in green. Second, we replaced the four 3D convolution blocks with our guiding units colored in blue. Inside each guiding unit, we apply four 1D convolutions directly on the range input and are multiplied by the parallel output of the 3D convolutions applied on the full input, followed by, a one, followed by a concatenation of all four in a 1D convolution to reduce the number of features to the original one. The 1D convolution that we apply directly on the range features allows us to control the receptive field, while the 3D convolutions allows us to gain special information of the surrounding. Ablation studies and results. So um, before diving into numbers, we need to understand the various metrics of this benchmark. So the first one, of course, is the average mean precision, which is calculated as the average of four mean average precision with different distances threshold. Then we have five different true positive metrics that are calculated 
between each prediction and its match, matched ground truth under the two meters threshold. The first one is the translation L, which is the Euclidean distance in meters between the center of the ground truth and the center of the prediction. Size error, which is calculated as one minus intersection over union over aligning, after aligning the centers and orientation of both. Orientation error, which is the smallest yaw angle difference between the two orientations. Velocity error, which is calculated for Vx and Vy separately, measured in meters per second. And the last one is attribute, which is the attribute classification accuracy. Where for vehicles, we need to output whether they are moving, parked, or stopped. For pedestrian, whether they are standing, walking, or sitting. And for motorcycles and bicycles, whether they are with or without riders. And all of this is, of course, if you got the class right. The final NDS score, nuisance detection score, is calculated as follows, where TPI stands for each of the true positive metrics above, mentioned above. OK, now we're ready for some numbers. Um, so first, we demonstrate the significance of our cylindrical coordinate modification, meaning the change of what the network is learning in terms of orientation and velocity. As expected, we did much better in terms of orientation and velocity errors, but we also observed the important metric of average precision, which indicates how many true objects we managed to detect. Moreover, we showed the effectiveness of our range-guided backbone to reduce the receptive field for larger distance and smaller objects. For the range of 30 to 50 meters over all classes, we achieve an improvement of 0.72 in NDS when the guidance mechanism is applied versus when omitted while using the heavily optimized backbone of the previous state of the art. Additionally, we observe an increase in the mean average precision in four out of the five smallest classes for the entire range, resulting in an increase in the overall mean average precision. And final results. Here are shown top results for a single model on the LIDAR track. All results are submitted to an evaluation server with hidden annotation. The NDS on the right is the formal nuisance detection score, and as you can see, we suppress all methods but a single one. You can see our official results in the official nuisance website under the name Silinet RG. Our paper is also available on archive. Thank you very much for listening. Um, any questions? Thanks for the talk. <clears throat> if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. Um, I have one question. Uh, maybe I missed it. Okay. How do you predict velocity? I mean, what are the, the, the raw sensor uh, measurements? Do they include velocity measurements or just? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, they, um, currently they have only uh, Vx and Vy, which I think that uh, later on they will understand that we want the absolute velocity and the orientation of the car. Um, but currently, yes, they uh, they give you a, a velocity in x and velocity in y. And because um, we're using a cylindrical network, we um, we take the velocity and as I as I shown, we we take it to our cylindrical suffering uh, system and then split it to velocity in R and velocity in theta, which uh, in this way we learn better the velocity. I see. And and how important is it uh, that the network outputs a velocity? I mean, why not just take the the raw velocity measured by the sensor once you once you detected the object? I mean. Uh, can't you just take uh, the, the raw velocity from the measurements uh, as your prediction for the velocity? Um, I'm not sure I'm following. Um, the velocity is um, of other objects, meaning uh, the, the velocity of different objects you detect, not, not our velocity. So um, it's not something you can take from the raw points. It's something that you need to detect along a certain um, sequence, and then you can have the velocity. So uh, uh, the nuisance data set, as I uh, previously uh, said, is giving us a sequence of point cloud. It's given us uh, 10 sequence that uh, 
uh, of a total of a point, point and a half uh, second. And in this way, you can also predict the velocity, which is really important if you want to have an autom autonomous car. You want to know how fast objects are moving around you. I see. So, so just to see if I understand, the input to the network is not just one snapshot, it's several snapshots? Yes, it's a sequence of 10 sweeps. Um, each, I every... Okay, I, I, I hear you in a, in a loop, okay? So again, yes, uh, the instance, the data set is giving us 10 sweeps, each, every uh, um, part is zero, five seconds, and then you can, uh, you can predict the velocity. And if you want the absolute velocity and the orientation, I hear myself in a... <laughs> okay, does anyone have any other question? Okay. 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 Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we move on to the next uh, talk. Um, Lanan, are you going to be presenting? Yes. Can you see me, hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. So, so the next talk um, <laughs> will be given by Lanan Fatal. This is joint work with uh, Adam Kaufman um, uh, from uh, the Hebrew University. And this talk is about deep learning using analysis, synthesis, networks there. Correct. So Adam just finished an excellent uh, master uh, degree uh, with me. And this is his uh, thesis work. Um, so let me properly define the settings uh, that we're considering. So it's blind uniform image deep learning. <clears throat> meaning that it's, it accounts for um, uh, out-of-plane rot camera rotations or um, motion in scenes uh, which are static and the objects are distant from the camera. Um, that is uh, cases where the um, parallax effect is uh, minimal. Um, this is modeled by, the conv by convolution with a two-dimensional blur kernel, K of X, Y. And in the setting of a um, blind uh, image deblurring, we assume that we don't know the latent sharp image as well as the blur kernel K. So let me quickly review some um, um, uh, previous works on the topics, uh, some algorithms, some uh, DNN-based works. So uh, one common approach is to use a map estimation uh, to um, model this problem uh, where the data term uh, uh, expresses the convolution and the other uh, two uh, prior terms, one over the images, uh, typically some habitat distribution over their derivatives and some uh, non-negativity and sparsity uh, prior over the kernel K in order to avoid the indeterminacy that uh, this uh, problem uh, has. Um, state of the state of the art results, uh, well, at least uh, up to last year, uh, was due to an algorithm by um, Sunatal. Um, this algorithm basically is an EM procedure which considers patches that that belong to um, uh, that contain strong edges, uh, and these patches are uh, assigned to some ideal uh, patch uh, that is a non-blurry patch. And um, the uh, blur between the two is extracted, and then the process repeats by new uh, assignments of clean patches to the uh, deblurred image. Finally, uh, one work that we take our inspiration from is a previous work of mine and Amit Goldstein. Um, this work extracts the, the uh, power spectrum of the blur kernel uh, based on the autocorrelation of images. So. Um, the autocorrelation of the derivative of an image um, equals to the autocorrelation of the derivative filter with itself and the uh, natural image with itself, uh, which we know uh, one behaves like omega and the other behaves like one over omega, where omega is the frequency and the two cancel out. So this equals a constant, meaning that the derivative of an image appears like a uh, white uh, noise. And in case of a blur kernel, um, in this relation, we get a third uh, multiplier, which is the power spectrum of the blur kernel, and meaning that uh, the autocorrelation of the derivative of a blur kernel uh, would be the power spectrum of the blur kernel itself. Uh, and in the paper, we propose to use phase retrieval in order to uh, extract the entire kernel. 
I will use some of the ideas here. Um, so there are quite a few uh, DNN-based works that either try to uh, estimate the blur kernel or try to deblur an image given a blur kernel. Um, I'm focusing on the uh, latest three that um, are end-to-end, -end, given a blurry image, produce a um, sharp image. Uh, the first is um, the deep deblur. Uh, as you can see, it uh, consists of a multi-scale uh, architecture where the blurry input is uh, inserted in a um, uh, Gaussian pyramid of it and uh, a convolutional type of ResNet network acts, operates at each uh, level and inter is interpolated to the finer and finer levels. Um, so this is an end-to-end -end approach. Uh, they use a both an L2 or L1 reconstruction loss as well as an adversarial loss to train the network. And uh, they train the network on the non-uniform GoPro data set. Um, let me quickly describe how that data set was produced. So it's a sequences, it's basically sequences of videos and um, five successive frames are averaged together in order to produce blur. And the middle frame out of those five is the ground truth non-blur image. So that, that's the data set. Uh, another uh, work which is quite uh, similar uh, is the SRN. And um, so the differences are that, I mean, this method also relies on a multi-scale architecture, but uh, this time um, the weights are shared across the different um, scales. So it's a more compact network um, and they, uh, trained the network only with respect to the reconstruction loss, they said the adversarial loss is not contributing, uh, which makes sense because um, these methods are still being uh, evaluated using PSNR and uh, analytical uh, metrics. Um, and this also uh, a network was uh, trained on the GoPro dataset. The Dibler GAN uh, uses an unconditional um, GAN training. Um, it uses a kind of a more classic uh, autoencoder-based uh, architecture. Uh, it has pooling, it has unpooling, so it also contains a multi-scale um, components into it. Uh, and this one was trained both on the GoPro dataset as well as a synthetic on, on a synthetic uh, dataset produced by uh, the Coco image images and the uh, uniform blurs. So uh, what, what's going on with the performance of the um, deep neural networks based uh, for, uh, approaches versus the algorithms ones. So these end-to-end -end, uh, DNNs omit the fact that there is a kernel involved in the process. They don't even model it. It's uh, transparent to the uh, entire model. Um, the good thing is that they are not limited to any kind of specific blur. So they can support three-dimensional blur, six-dimensional blur, uh, motion blur, whatever. Um, however, um, the methods that we've uh, just uh, reviewed, uh, they don't actually achieve the state-of-the-art performance, but rather it's the um, um, algorithms that uh, achieve that uh, in, the special, in the case of uh, uniform deblurring. So um, there's still work to be done in this domain in the context of uh, DNN-based approaches, uh, which is what we do. So the main idea of our approach is to kind of follow the classic um, pipeline of uh, deblurring, meaning that we estimate, we first estimate the blur kernel using one network, which we call the analysis network. And then we use this estimated kernel in order to um, a synthesize or deblur an image. So we call this the synthesis uh, network. The fact that there is a blur kernel modeled in this process allows us and only to us uh, to use the ground truth blur kernel uh, as an ad additional loss during the training, which we actually use uh, only as pre-training. Um, the main contributions, technical contributions of this work, uh, allowing this approach to happen, is the use of uh, novel cross-correlation layers, which generalize the pre previous um, methods that estimate the uh, blur uh, from um, uh, correlations within the image, as well as a kernel-guided convolution, which allows the estimated kernel to control the action of the synthesis network and de-blur an image with respect to a specific uh, blur kernel. So one interesting um, um, 
example or a test is the following. So given an input blurry image, um, uh, not what we see here is this very same architecture which we will be using for our synthesis network. But this one, the synthesis network was trained in a blind fashion. So it was trained over every possible blur, blur kernel and uh, without getting, without knowing the blur kernel. So we're just training one network to cope with every possible network without inputting the blur kernel. And as you can see, the performance is uh, quite com compromised. Um, this is the same architecture trained to de-blur images with a single kernel, a specific kernel. So it's like uh, specifically tailored to a particular blur kernel. And as you can see, it does much better on that particular kernel than the one that was trained blindly on many kernels. And here you can see um, our results uh, over the uh, kernels that we extract from our analysis uh, step and then use the same architecture of synthesis. Um, and you can further see on the right what happens when we uh, train our synthesis network to uh, operate on the ground truth uh, blur kernel. And you can see the difference is not substantial meaning that uh, the ST kernel estimation is rather accurate, but it's the synthesis network that we use is kind of limited. Um, and certainly the results that we see here in the blind uh, synthesis is much worse than other methods. So we're kind of using um, less of a sophisticated deblurring network because um, our novelty lies elsewhere. Um, and the point is that the um, kernel estimation is fairly accurate in our approach. Um, so let, let's dive into it. So uh, the first network is the analysis network. Uh, its job is to estimate the blur kernel from the blurry uh, input. And when designing such a network, there are two uh, main things that one needs to consider. What layers should suit such a task of estimating blur from images? Uh, is it the traditional convolutional uh, layers or isn't it? And what architecture would allow us to map an arbitrary size input image into a fixed, much smaller blur kernel image? So there's some dimensional changes that should take place. Um, so the observation that we make or the inspiration that we take from the uh, blur kernel estimation from spectral regularities method that I uh, mentioned earlier is the fact that blur affects the correlations between features in the images. And specifically in these works, um, it's the, the derivatives of the images were considered. So what we uh, propose to do is to uh, generalize this notion, uh, not only to derivative filters, but allow the network to learn the appropriate filters, which it would uh, um, learn before uh, considering the uh, correlations. And uh, then we um, suggest to compute the cross correlation, not only the autocorrelation, in order to also allow the system to extract the phase. The autocorrelation can only uh, deal with amplitudes in Fourier, not phases, but cross correlation has a potential of resolving the uh, phases. So um, the uh, analysis network is rather uh, straightforward. Uh, we have feature extraction um, channel that is going on here, which is the standard convolution and nonlinearities, pooling, and so on. And then at each of the responses of the convolutions computed, we compute the cross correlation between every pair of filters within some uh, spatial range, which we assume um, is larger than the maximal blur kernel that we wish to cope with. Um, the cross correlation layers are just what they, just their uh, trivial meaning. They, these are the cross correlation functions um, that we compute between the uh, response maps of the different kernels. Uh, over the different filters. Uh, this process is applied at a multi-scale fashion uh, where, where we are computing a smaller and smaller blur kernel and on our way back up, I hope you see my cursor, we're interpolating the size of the kernel until we reach the uh, size of the desired size of the kernel in image space so that our analysis at the core scale correspond to the same size of blur kernels in image space. Um, Okay, so these are some examples of the estimated kernels that our method um, manages to achieve. And as we've seen a few slides ago, um, the bottleneck in performance doesn't come from the um, kernel estimation. It's actually working quite good, uh, rather by the deep learning network. So um, the synthesis network, um, 
uh, its job is to uh, de-blur an image. So de-blurring an image is actually a linear operator, but obviously we'll be using a nonlinear network because there's some kind of regularity that we're expecting um, to apply in this uh, highly explosive or non-stable um, uh, linear operator. So we're basically trying to invert the blur kernel and we know that compact filters, their inverse doesn't necessarily correspond to a compact um, filter so we need a network that has global um, uh, support global op uh, operation and um, also we know that we're dealing with uniform blur so it needs to be translation variant which uh, makes sense and um, coincides with the use of uh, convolutional layers so um, the, now we want the estimated kernel to affect the operation of that convolutional uh, synthesis network and the way we do it is um, that we map the estimated kernel um, into some feature vectors, which are finally translated, uh, um, to transformed into a multipliers and an additive bias to each uh, convolutional layer in the synthesis network. And this is done by two fully connected um, layers. So we're basically translating the blur kernels into multipliers and biases. Um, Similarly to the other in uh, models in the um, in, in the um, <clears throat> um, style gun uh, architecture, so uh, the synthesis network itself is a standard uh, unit unit architecture. So it has uh, connections within each layer, and it also has a multi-scale uh, structure into it. And uh, all the red hour, uh, arrows here indicate the fact that. We use um, a kernel and guided um, convolution steps um, to, to allow our estimated <coughs> blur kernel to uh, control the um, operation of that synthesis deblurring uh, network. Finally, uh, the way we train the network um, is done as follows. So we input the blurry image into the uh, analysis network and that one outputs the blur kernel. And this one is fed into the synthesis network along with the input image itself. And this is supposed to produce the output image. As pre-training, we break this link um, into two, two halves and we define a loss uh, versus the ground truth blur, blur kernel, which is something that we can do and an end-to-end -end, uh, architecture can do because it doesn't have any notion of blur kernel built in into it. Um, and then we feed the ground truth uh, kernel into the synthesis network, we train the two apart, and then we join them and continue training it in an end-to-end -end fashion. And this buys us one uh, dB uh, gain in accuracy. Um, okay, so let's move to some results. <clears throat> um, so here's the comparison between our method and uh, the uh, SR SRN and the Dibbler gun, some more. I hope that you can see uh, we're producing sharper uh, images on these tests. Um, this is a synthetic image from the uh, lay data set, uh, some more. These are real images uh, captured by, um, I think it was some uh, gyroscope that was connected to the um, to a camera and the um, a, a, a six dimensional blur kernel was extracted to train the other approaches. Um, some more images. Okay, let's switch to a quantitative comparison. So as you can see, uh, actually the state of the art performance is, um, uh, as, as I noted, the state of the art performance was uh, produced by uh, algorithms and not by DNN approaches. And our approach um, manages to obtain uh, at least the best PSNR uh, with respect to uh, existing algorithms uh, and a nice margin of 3 dB with respect to um, a deep uh, uh, network-based uh, approaches. Um, so specifically the uh, implementation that is marked here and the one that is actually achieving the state of the performance um, is one that we've trained our network specifically um, to cope with um, uh, blur kernels at particular scales. And we have a classifier that tells them which network to operate 
uh, based on the blur that is seen in the input image. So there's some kind of a small enhancement to the idea itself. Uh, let me conclude with uh, the fact that uh, we've presented um, um, two dedicated networks, one for estimating the blur kernel based on cross-correlation layers, and uh, use, use that estimate in, uh, in a synthesis network, in a deep learning network to control it using the kernel-guided um, convolution layers. And we use the fact that we're incorporating a notion of kernel into the, our formulation uh, for pre-training and um, using the ground truth blur kernel for training. Um, that should be it. Questions? Great, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, there are some questions in the chat. Okay, so one person wrote, wow. I suppose you should get this, uh, <laughs> consider this. That was as about point. me uh, doing it in time, I think. Um. <laughs> um, okay, there's a question. What is the relation between blur kernel and super resolution kernel? Um, can the spectron method be used to estimate super resolution kernel? I'll let you answer. I'll just, uh, I'll just say that you had a paper about estimating super resolution kernels with this method without the deep learning part. But yeah, go ahead. And yeah, answer. it was in the context of image deblurring. So I guess that the blur kernel that, um, I mean, um, so every image before it's downscaled is blurred by some kind of blurring. Otherwise, we'll have these very bad aliased uh, images. Um, so yes, it's a trend that uh, Michal and uh, you started uh, considering the fact that uh, we might be doing the wrong job uh, when computing super resolution. We were not accounting for the blur kernel that was applied um, in the process of the downscaling. Um, so this is a uh, the the talk that I, uh, the uh, work that I presented relates to a general case of deep blurring. Um, I'm not sure that the optimal solution would be to get every image that we want to upscale first to deblur it in order to kind of standardize the blur that it has underwent and then use an upscaling um, procedure. So I kind of still think that these um, problems are kind of orthogonal in terms of the methodologies, but certainly the theory or the ideas can be, you know, um, be used when training and um, super resolution um, method, sure. Estimate the blur, use it to train the super resolution, um, you know, training set and so on. Okay, there's another question. Uh, what if the blur is non-uniform across the image? Right, uh, okay. So um, I think it's fairly clear. It was very clear to us when we wrote it and we actually hope to do it and we end up not having the enough time. But in case of non-uniform, so the different ranks of non-uniformity, right? So in case of three-dimensional blur kernels, which accounts also for the role, a rotational component within the image plane, um, that covers a much wider cases of blur. We think that our algorithm can be quite straightforwardly uh, be extended to account for such cases. Uh, but clearly, if we're uh, thinking about, um, you know, motion blur, um, parallax effects, so that would be a much um, more considerable, especially variant blur, uh, which is less clear how to apply our approach. Um, yeah. But when you when you compare it to the other deep learning methods, uh, correct, you... they were trained on such data sets uh, without taking any measures to actually to really cope with this kind of data. So uh, they, you know, they just thought about their network as a black box and, you know, they just fed it with whatever, you know, data they have without thinking too much about the, uh, I should note uh, though that um, these data sets, although they're considered to be non-uniform, um, many of them are close to uniform blur. So they're dominated by a blur, uh, uniform blur kernel. Um, Okay, but, but in principle, they're trained to solve a diffi more difficult task than what you're trying to solve. So correct, but only in terms of their training data, correct, yeah. Yeah, so it would be interesting to try and train them on uniform blur and see yes, how they... But, right, but uh, some of them were trained on both and we've compared to the mode of the uniform. Okay. Which actually didn't buy much, uh, surprisingly. 
Okay, there is one more question. Do you assume that the kernel is always three by three or how do you determine the kernel size? Correct. So the blur, uh, the blur kernel size, and that's kind of common to most of the methods out there. You're assuming some bound over the maximal size of the blur kernel, uh, definitely larger than the three by three. I think all the limitation used uh, 25 by 25, 50 by 50, and 100 by 100. And uh, as I told you, we have a classifier that looks at the blur image, blur image and decide which network should be used for that particular blur scale, yeah. Okay, and perhaps one last question. Uh, do homogeneous kernel methods outperform the blurring nets mostly on data sets which were generated using synthetic blurring with a homogeneous kernel? Right, so um, the data sets that we used for training our method, uh, so that was a synthetic data set. So it's images convolved with filters and with blur kernels and those blur kernels were produced manually by us. So we had this method that draws these you know, random trajectories. But then we used our method or we evaluated our method on the data sets of uh, uniform blur, but one that was not generated artificially. So it was trained on an, a completely artificial data set, but was not evaluated as such. OK, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. I think we'll continue to the next speaker. Okay, so the next talk is going to be a uh, talk by uh, Shadi Abu Hussein, Tom Tirer, and uh, Raja Jiris. Uh, this talk is going to be about a correction filter for image super resolution. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Shadi. I'm a PhD student at Tel Aviv University under uh, the supervision of uh, Dr. Raja Jiris. Uh, I am presenting our work from the last uh, CVPR uh, on uh, improving the robustness of uh, of the shelf deep super resolution networks. Uh, so su uh, super resolution is a very popular uh, problem where uh, one would like to uh, improve the resolution of uh, an image. Uh, formally, uh, the single image super resolution acquisition model can be defined as applying an uh, anti-aliasing filter K on a, on a high resolution image X followed by a subsampling with the scale factor alpha in order to obtain the low resolution image Y. Now a more elegant but equivalent way to write the, the model is using a linear operators form. Here a S star encapsulates the whole downsampling process. <coughs> Here we see an example uh, well, here we see two examples uh, where uh, the high resolution uh, image X is down sampled in the first one using a uh, bicubic model and in the second one uh, using a Gaussian uh, model. And uh, the problem of uh, single image super resolution can be defined as uh, restoring the high resolution latent image X from uh, uh, the observed low resolution image Y. Now, uh, over the past decade, many deep learning techniques have been uh, proposed uh, for uh, solving uh, uh, single image super resolution. Uh, most of them tend to generate low resolution and uh, high resolution uh, images using a fixed uh, uh, observation model that is usually by cubic. Uh, and then we train a network to map the low resolution uh, image to its high resolution uh, version. Now, uh, this approach has a huge drawback uh, in which uh, when uh, evaluated on an um, observation model different than the one used in training, the, the results are, uh, uh, the result that the performance degrades significantly. Uh, as we can see here, we took a, a state-of-the-art uh, network that was trained on a bicubic uh, kernel and uh, tested it and when evaluated on a low resolution that was obtained by uh, by, by, by cubic model, we see uh, superior uh, results. But when examined on, uh, on a Gaussian model, the, the results are uh, quite poor. Now, uh, there have been uh, uh, different approaches that try to, uh, to overcome this uh, restriction. Uh, one of them is offline training, for example, SRMD where uh, they assume that the uh, downsampling kernels belong to a, a family of uh, Gaussian filters. 
then uh, train a, a network to uh, by randomly sampling uh, kernels from this set. Now uh, this approach has uh, uh, two drawbacks. The first one that it is limited only to kernels within this set, and uh, the second one is that for a specific observation model, the results are, as, are not as, as good as if uh, the network was uh, trained using this specific model uh, alone. <clears throat> the second approach is internal learning, where, uh, uh, for example, Deep Image Prior and uh, ZSSR, that uh, completely avoid the offline training and uh, train a CNN at this time. Now, this approach has uh, two, it has, has three uh, drawbacks. The first one is that uh, runtime tend to be uh, very long, and uh, they are very sen sensitive to, uh, to architecture changes. And the third, that they do not, uh, because they do not rely on external data, uh, the, their performance is, is not as good as the other methods that, that they rely on it. Now note that all uh, the previous methods does not exploit uh, uh, any pre-trained state-of-the-art uh, CNNs that were trained using a bicubic model. Now in this work, we, we uh, utilize uh, uh, such, uh, such networks. Uh, we take a pre-trained uh, uh, super-resolution network that were trained on, on a bicubic model and uh, improve their results on other models. Uh, inspired by the literature of, uh, on, on generalized sampling where uh, one uh, can sample a, a signal using uh, one basis and reconstruct it using uh, other basis. We design a correction filter, it's a correction filter that uh, shifts the basis of the given low resolution image to the basis that the network was uh, trained on uh, without, uh, without any uh, uh, training involved, training of the network involved. So we have the original low resolution image, uh, uh, down sampled by an arbitrary uh, uh, observation model, uh, where we correct it using H. We then plug it to the pre-trained network and uh, improve the results uh, uh, significantly. <laughs> now, because the, the, network, the, the networks that we uh, used were uh, trained on a bicubic model, we want the corrected low resolution image to mimic uh, uh, a low resolution bicubic image. Now, we do that by uh, designing H uh, using the following sampling and uh, reconstruction system taken from, uh, the, the, from uh, the generalized uh, sampling theory, where X is downsampled using K in order to obtain uh, the low resolution image uh, Y that's then corrected such that when, uh, sorry, such that when uh, uh, reconstructed using uh, by cubic upsampling, the, the resulted image is, uh, is a perfect reconstruction of, uh, of the original image X. Which leads us to the following theorem, where uh, assuming that Y is uh, downsampled using an arbitrary uh, uh, operator S star and X hat uh, defined as in uh, uh, the system above, and if we assume that X has the following property that states that um, it can be reconstructed, X can be reconstructed from its uh, low resolution by cubic image using a pseudo inverse of R star. Now, under those assumptions, we, we have a perfect reconstruction for, uh, for the following H that uh, is equivalent to applying the following filter on uh, the low resolution image Y. Now, uh, uh, this filter can be uh, efficiently implemented using fast Fourier transform. <clears throat> now, uh, in, in, in contrast to generalized sampling, we, uh, we replace the naive uh, operator R with uh, super, the pre-trained super resolution network and uh, modify the, the expression of H accordingly. Now, uh, for, intu for intuition, let uh, Y be uh, uh, a subsampled version of X using uh, some sampling uh, uh, operator S star, uh, then we want to find H such that the corrected image YH is equal to the low resolution by cubic image. Now, if we assume the, the, uh, that X has the property we saw earlier, we have the following. 
which by setting h to the correction filter we, uh, we in, in the theorem in the uh, we saw in the previous slide we get that why why uh, the corrected image is equal to the correct corrected uh, is equal to the bicubic image now uh, although this assumption does not uh, hold for uh, most natural images <coughs> here we see the comparison between the low resolution corrected image and the low resolution by cubic image uh, on uh, uh, set 14 data set uh, tested on four different scenarios and we see that uh, although this assumption does not hold we still get a very close result here we see a uh, uh, visual comparison between the different methods we have the original image and the low resolution image obtained by applying a, a Gaussian model with the scale factor of two. Here we see the result of three state-of-the-art super resolution uh, uh, networks when applied directly on the low resolution image. We see that uh, the result is, uh, is very poor. The, the reconstruction is uh, blurry. Um, but when combined with the correction filter, we see that uh, the results are improved significantly. Now, we also compare uh, to two other methods, SRMD and uh, ZSSR. Uh, both take the, uh, the, down, uh, the down, sample, down sampling kernel as an input. Here we see uh, similar uh, results for scale factor of four, where uh, we see the, the significant improvement uh, that the correction filter gives. And uh, we see that we outperform uh, SRMD and the SSR. Now we remember that this uh, this improvement is achieved without uh, any training involved of the of the network. We take the, the network that was trained on uh, on uh, a bicubic model and modify its input uh, alone without without uh, modifying the network uh, at all. <clears throat> Here we see the uh, the results in numbers on average on set 14, where uh, in the rows we have the uh, we have the, the different methods and the, the columns we have the, the test cases, test uh, scenarios. We see that uh, across all the, all the three uh, uh, tested uh, networks, uh, the correction filter improves the results significantly, where in some cases we get uh, almost 7 dB improvement. <coughs> and uh, we see that we have performed ZSSR and uh, SRMD significantly. Here we see similar results on a BSD100 data set. <clears throat> now in many cases K, the, the sampling kernel K is unknown. This problem can, is defined as the blind super resolution where uh, the sampling uh, part is unknown. Uh, and in this case we cannot uh, find uh, uh, the correction filter explicitly since it depends on K. Uh, therefore, in this work, we, we propose an algorithm for uh, estimating the, the correction filter that is performed by uh, uh, minimizing the following objective, where uh, the, given, the, given the low resolution image Y, we correct it using H that is then plugged to the uh, super resolution uh, network uh, pre-trained uh, by a cubic model in order to obtain a high resolution image that is then downsampled using SS star to get an image, a low resolution image Y hat that we want it to be a close to, a, as close as possible to, to Y. Now uh, in this term, H and the SS star both are functions of K, this, uh, this K, and uh, F, the, the super resolution network uh, is not trained, it, 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 it weights are uh, fixed so we want to change uh, S star and H in this uh, term, which leads us to the following iterative scheme, uh, where we, we uh, correct Y uh, using the correction filter uh, 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 um, computed using K at iteration T. Uh, we, then, we, then, then it's plugged to the super resolution network F to obtain a high resolution image uh, X hat that is then down sampled using K at iteration T uh, to obtain Y hat that is then used to compute L1 between it and uh, the low resolution observed image. <clears throat> then 
we update k by back propagating uh, from the loss with the related to uh, k uh, and resulting in, in this uh, iterative scheme. Now, uh, here we see a visual comparison on uh, super resolution uh, on a Gaussian, a Gaussian model. We see that uh, although k is unknown, uh, we still uh, get a good, imp a good improvement uh, using the, the estimated version of recollection filter uh, over uh, applying uh, dbpn directly on the observed image. Now, uh, we compare our uh, method to kernel GAN, um, an adversarial approach for uh, blind super resolution, and we see that uh, we outperform it. <coughs> Similarly, on uh, scale factor of four, <coughs> Here we see uh, the results in uh, numbers on uh, average on set 14. We see that uh, we, we outperform a kernel gun in uh, most cases. Here we see the results on uh, uh, other uh, data sets. Now uh, we, uh, we published our code uh, online. Please check it. Thank you for listening and I'll be glad to answer uh, your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Shadi. Excellent work. And let's turn to the uh, comments on the YouTube uh, channel. Can you hear me, Shadi? Yes. So the first question is from uh, Michal on the comparison you did to the ZSSR. Apparently you you use the standard by cubic uh, kernel, but you could have used the plugged in the kernel that you know of the uh, low res image and how the results would look in that case. First estimate the kernel vector. No, we, we took the code that uh, was published uh, as it is. We, do not, we did not uh, modify it. We only uh, gave it the, uh, the, the kernel that we, we generated the, the low resolution image uh, with. So, uh, yeah, but if you know the kernel that was used to generate the low res image and it's not by cubic, then ZSSR can take it into account. Have you looked into that or you just ran? I mean, yes, ZSSR, the, the ZSSR takes the, the, uh, the kernel as an input. We gave it to it. We, do not, did, not, we did not uh, uh, run it with the assumption that uh, uh, the images were uh, obtained using by cubic uh, kernel. We, we gave it uh, explicitly, not explicitly, we gave the, the, uh, the kernel itself to the, to, to the SSR. It takes it as an input, as an input. I see, okay. Uh, let's follow up uh, on some other questions. Uh, I know you have some theorem for that, but still I do not have a good intuition on why you can transfer an image down sampled by one filter to the other. Um, which question I, again? I'm sorry, the internet. Uh, so no, I, the question yeah. is, why do? You, what's the intuition of you being able to transfer an image downsampled by one filter to the same image downsampled by another filter? And also, mm -hmm. does it have any implications on the noise being amplified? Uh, for low, I will start by um, uh, uh, answering the first part. Uh, one filter from the, the uh, generalized sampling theory is enough to uh, to shift the basis of uh, of, uh, of the sampling uh, uh, part to the reconstruction part. Uh, this is uh, from theory; it's, it's mathematically proven. Uh, and the second part, which relates to uh, the noise, uh, for low noise, uh, this uh, can work, but for higher uh, uh, Level, noise levels, we, uh, we, st we are working on a solution for that, uh, for previous, for, uh, in, in our next work. Okay. And another question I have is uh, relating back to Hanan Fatal's talk. So he has this analysis and synthesis networks, and it seems like he can use, or you can use the analysis component to estimate the, the kernel and then plug it into your system. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, we did not try. Uh, you mean uh, to, to estimate uh, to estimate k using uh, uh, other methods uh, than what we propose here, and uh, use it use it to compute the correction filter. I understood it uh, right. 
Yeah, I mean, Ranan suggested one for the super, for the deblurring, right? Uh, so it has two networks, one for analysis and one for synthesis. Yes. And uh, we did not try uh, such approach. We since we have we had the uh, the uh, our solution for a blind uh, super resolution, but we, we did not uh, check with uh, an estimated kernel using other method. No. I see. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Did you try your method on real images? Asks Alex Ravafa. Uh, we did try it, uh, and we tried it on a, a Diff2K dataset, which uh, which was uh, uh, which is which was uh, given by uh, kernel gun, the kernel gun work. Um, yes, but we did not present any uh, uh, images here. I see. Uh, okay. Well. Oh, thanks again for an excellent presentation of a great work. And I think it's time for us to uh, move to the next one. And the next talk is by uh, Yuval Bahat and uh, Tomer Michaeli on explorable image restoration. Yuval, um, go ahead. Yuval? Just wait, let me unmute you. You're on mute. Great. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Great, sorry for that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction, and uh, I'm Yuval, and I'm a postdoc working with uh, Tom Michaeli at the Technion, and I want to tell you about um, the work we did about explorable image restoration. Um, and in explorable image restoration, we aim to tackle the issue of ambiguity in image restoration tasks. And let me explain what I mean by ambiguity using a couple of example tasks. Let's look, uh, for example, at image super resolution. We're given a low resolution image we are asked to reconstruct a high resolution version corresponding to it. However, in reality, there are infinitely many different high resolution images corresponding to any single uh, low resolution input. Meaning that if we downsample each of these images, we would get back precisely the input image. And these images can be very different from one another. And uh, if we zoom in on them, we can see that these differences can even be uh, semantically meaningful. Another example task is the task of image decompression, where we have an image undergoing some lossy image compression algorithm, for example, JPEG. This gives us the JPEG file, and then we want to uh, decompress it. So when we do that, there are um, many different images to which we can decompress the file. For example, this one with all these notorious uh, JPEG artifacts. We can also decompress it to another uh, version, which is without the artifacts. Alternatively, we can have this image uh, where the kitten is actually looking at a fly and not just staring at the air. <clears throat> and also this image where the kitten is staring at a worm hanging from a thread. All of these images, if we recompress them, would give us the exact same JPEG file. And this is the source of uh, ambiguity in this, in this case. Now, ambiguity is actually inherent to uh, many other image restoration tasks like deblurring, denoising, image completion and more. In fact, it is, it is inherent to almost all image restoration tasks which are ill-posed. However, existing methods tend to ignore this ambiguity and typically produce only a single output. For example, if we feed this low resolution image into ESR GAN, we would get this image, which looks much nicer, but it's, this is only an arbitrary choice of solution out of the abundance of possible ones. And ignoring this inherent ambiguity is problematic in many cases and for many applications. And let me exemplify this using the following forensic use case. Say we have a low resolution image of a suspect's car. A natural thing for us to, uh, to want to know is the number on the license plate of this car. So we can feed it, for example, uh, through ESRGAN, the state of the art uh, super resolution method, and get this much nicer looking result. And then we want to zoom in on the license plate. And for example, we want to know what is the digit here uh, in the center of the license plate, but using existing methods, we cannot answer questions like, could this digit correspond to a zero? Could it be a seven? Existing methods cannot, do not allow 
us to uh, answer such questions. And there are many uh, more examples in other domains and applications showing that not acknowledging uh, the inherent ambiguity is problematic in practice. Uh, so to tackle this issue, we propose uh, a new paradigm, which we call uh, explorable image restoration, where we uh, aim to enable users to explore the infinite possible solutions corresponding to a given input image. And in particular, we want to allow users uh, to understand what could and what could not have been there in the underlying captured scene, uh, to know the abundance of possible valid solutions, and um, also um, use it for many other applications and use cases. We propose a framework to solve this task, <clears throat> where we start uh, with a classic framework of feeding the input into a restoration network, yielding the enhanced output. Then we propose to add some mechanism uh, that would allow user exploration by allowing users to interact with the output image and modify it in order to explore the space of solutions. Now, in order to allow this reliable exploration, we want all our outputs to satisfy two very important properties. First of all, we want them to be perceptually plausible, meaning we want them to look like natural images. And we achieve that by using a GAN training framework, which is known to produce photorealistic results. A second very important property is that we want all outputs to be consistent with the input. This would allow users to explore the abundance of solutions that are guaranteed to correspond to the degraded input image. Now, the notion of consistency varies between restoration tasks. And let me first focus on the case of uh, image super resolution, which was the subject of our work that was recently presented as an oral in the last CVPR. So in super resolution, consistency means that if we downsample the output of our framework, we would get back precisely the input image. Now, this may sound to you like a real request, but in fact, it is not. Uh, actually, there was a recent uh, small Twitter storm where someone took the pulse super resolution method, uh, which, is, uh, which was recently published, and fed it with an image of President Obama. And this is what they got. <clears throat> now, this is obviously not consistent with the input. We can also verify it uh, and see that the downsampled version of the output is very different from the input. Now, for us, in the context of exploration, it is very important the output is consistent with the input in order to allow reliable exploration. So we propose to enforce consistency by taking the inconsistent output of the network and incorporating some consistency enforcing module that would make it consistent with the input. And to this end, we propose to project the inconsistent output of the network onto the set of images that are consistent with the input image Y, which is actually an affine subspace defined by H, where H is the um, downsampling kernel corresponding to the low resolution image. Now, this, um, <clears throat> this goal of ours can be formulated as an optimization problem, where we want to minimize the distance between the consistent output of our module, x hat, and the inconsistent output of the network, such that when we downsample the uh, consistent output, we would get back the input image. And it turns out that this optimization problem actually has a closed form solution that can be written in terms of simple operations like convolutions, upsampling, and downsampling, which means it can be implemented as an architectural module using off-the-shelf deep learning frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow. So that's what we did. We um, implemented this consistency enforcing module, which takes the low resolution input image and the inconsistent output of the image and converts it into a consistent super resolved output. Now, this module does not involve any learning or training. It is constructed using simple computations. And note also that the output of our module is consistent even prior to any training or fine tuning of the super resolution network, which explains uh, some of the artifacts you may see in this uh, specific example. So now that uh, we have this, uh, we incorporated this module, we are guaranteed that all the outputs of our frameworks, uh, our, of our framework, sorry, are guaranteed to be consistent with the input image. And in fact, this uh, consistency enforcing module has some additional practical benefits outside the context of exploration, which are very much related, by the way, to the uh, recent, to the previous talk by uh, Shadi. And you can find details about them uh, in our paper. Another uh, crucial component of our framework that I mentioned is this user input mechanism, um, which we um, introduce using, by introducing another uh, input signal to our network, signal Z. And in practice, what we do is uh, we developed um, a graphical user interface comprising many different 
exploration and editing tools uh, with which the user can uh, interact and modify the image so as to explore this space of solutions. So let me go directly to some uh, examples. Uh, and we start with this low resolution uh, image of this animal. We feed it to our network and this is the result we get before we do any editing. It corresponds to this neutral input signal, you can, you can say. And now let's say you want to ask, can it correspond to other animals except for a horse? Can it, for example, correspond to a zebra? So to answer this question, uh, we use a set of uh, tools in our GUI, which allow for graphical user input. We find some image of a zebra on the, net, on the internet, and we try to embed the appearance of the zebra, the stripes, onto the relevant location in our output. Uh, and this is what we get after we do that. And now note that this is not just regular editing, this is consistent editing, because the image that you see here is both uh, close to the uh, desired appearance of stripes that we wanted, but it is also guaranteed to be consistent with input. And this means that the answer to the question, could it be a zebra, is yes in this case. So using our GUI, we can explore the different high resolution solutions corresponding to this input, two of which are this gray horse on the left and the young zebra on the right, and both of which are guaranteed to be consistent with the input. Let's go back to the uh, forensic use case I showed you before. We have this uh, suspect's car and we want to know the number on its license plate. We zoom in, we feed it to our uh, super resolution um, uh, framework, and this is the pre-edited result. And now we want to ask, could this central digit be a zero? Could it correspond to a seven and so on? And we can answer that now <clears throat> by trying to imprint different digits onto the dislocation of the central digit. For example, we can try to imprint zero and we would get this um, result, one would give us this, and so on and so forth with all possible 10 digits. And now if we examine closely the outputs, we can see that only outputs corresponding to zero, one, and eight look plausible, while the other outputs contain many artifacts, which may suggest that uh, the central digit is most probably either zero, one, or eight. Let me uh, show you a brief example uh, that uses three other exploration tools. I'm using the uh, famous image of Barbara. This is the low resolution input, and this is our pre-edited output. And let's say we want to accommodate some prior user knowledge. Well, in, this case, the, in this case, the user tells us that uh, the garment worn by Barbara should have stripes on it, and that the table map should look less messy. It should be, look more like a table map. So we are using three different tools. The first one allows for um, locally modifying pixel variants. The second one is going to uh, encourage periodic patterns like stripes, for example. And the, th the last one uh, actually allows for propagating desired appearance from one source region to a target region. So uh, I'm not showing you the separate effect of each one of them for lack of time, but I'm showing you the general effect. This is before. And this is after uh, we uh, use these tools to accommodate the user knowledge and let me flicker between them. You can see that we were able to accommodate or to add the stripes to Barbara and to uh, make the table map look less messy and more like a table map. And of course, this is all consistent with the input. So let me quickly switch gears to the second work I'm, I wanna briefly cover in this talk about explorable decoding of compressed images, uh, which is available on archive. So here we have a JPEG file or a compressed code. In this case, we demonstrated for the case of JPEG. And <clears throat> usually JPEG files correspond to these kind of images with many artifacts in case it is severely compressed. And people already try to tackle this issue by proposing artifact removal networks, which would take this bad or unpleasingly looking image and make it look nicer. And here again, we propose to first incorporate a user input mechanism that would allow exploring the um, abundance of possible solutions corresponding to the same um, compressed uh, image. And again, we want all outputs of our framework to satisfy these two requirements. We want it to be perceptually plausible and we want it to be consistent with the input. However, consistency here is very different from the super resolution case. Here, consistency means that if we recompress the output, we would get the same image code, in this case, the same JPEG file. Uh, and since the uh, notion of consistency is different, also the way we enforce it is very different. Here, we propose to um, we propose a novel um, artifact removal network architecture, which is consistency preserving by design. So let me skip directly to demonstrating the importance of the ability to perform explorable image decompression. 
for many applications by using the following medical use case. Say you visit the dermatologist for the first time and she spots some mean looking mole and wants to know how it changed in the past month. So you browse through your photo album and find this photo taken at the beach six months ago. Now, like almost all your images, it was compressed using JPEG. So zooming in on the mole results in these nasty artifacts. Our method then allows exploring the different possible appearances and sizes this small could have had six months ago, all of which are consistent with the JPEG code. Looking closely at the outputs, we can see that only these three here in the middle look plausible, while the other look less realistic, which suggests that the mole size was somewhere between these three options in the middle. Uh, the last use case I want to mention uh, here uh, is where we want to correct for problematic outputs, for unsatisfying outputs, and I'm going to demonstrate it for both super resolution and image decompression. Say we have this low resolution uh, image, we feed it to ESO state of the art method, but like any super resolution method, uh, it does not always succeed. So you can see that here the appearance of the building uh, is unsatisfying and there are other artifacts. So instead you can use our uh, framework and edit or manipulate the output to be uh, until you're satisfied, for example, to regain the appearance of the building. Similarly, in the case of image compression, we can have this severely compressed uh, input. We can feed it to DNCNN, which was trained to, uh, for JPEG artifact removal, but alternatively, we can use our method and then we can uh, manipulate the output in a consistency preserving manner, for example, to regain the appearance of the sand dunes. So let me conclude. Um, I started by talking to you, talking to you about uh, ambiguity and how it is inherent to most image restoration tasks. Um, I talked about how existing methods typically ignore this ambiguity and uh, produce only a single arbitrary output. Uh, and I told you about the uh, novel paradigm we introduced, which is explorable image restoration that aims to allow exploring the abundance of possible solutions and, for example, allow users to understand what could and what could not have been there in the underlying captured scene. I told you about the two frameworks we proposed for realizing this paradigm uh, for the case of super resolution and image decompression. And I specifically try to stress the importance of this, these mechanisms for enforcing consistency, which are different in each case or for each task. And finally, I told you, I showed you some exploration uh, applications and mentioned some uh, exploration tools. Uh, thanks a lot, and I'll be happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you, Yuval. Uh, any questions on the feed? Okay, so while people are starting to ask questions, let me ask you one. Uh, so essentially, this uh, imposed uh, problem means that you have different kernels for each of the, from the high res to the low res image, correct? Um, so let me try to clarify this. For even for a single kernel, this is ill posed because when you when the image is captured, some of the of the content, the high high uh, frequency content, is erased because of the convolution with uh, because of the finite resolution and the convolution with this kernel. So even for a given for a single kernel, it is ill posed, right? When you try to reconstruct the high resolution from this from the low resolution. Yeah. yeah. So so you have the low res image and you now have multiple high-res images that map to the same low-res image, this means that for each high-res image, there is a different low-res, there is a different kernel that leads you from the high-res to the low-res, no? No, there, there, there can be the same kernel. If you, if you apply a single kernel, there can, for example, the zebra and the horse, because you apply a kernel which erases the high-frequency content, so you get the same low-resolution image of an animal, because the, the stripes were simply erased. I and you get the same result if you use the zebra or the horse with the same kernel. I see. And can you provide, a, is there a way to rank the different results in terms of likelihood or probability or they are completely identical and there is no way to distinguish between them? So that's, that's a great question. We tried, so one, um, one thing we tried to do is we try to use again so that all images that we produce are perceptually plausible. Um, I think it's not, it does not work perfectly yet. There's, there is room for improvement there. And uh, moreover, if you ask, is there a way to rank them? So that's, I think that's an interesting direction, for example, to employ another network that tries to rank it or perform something like automatic or semi-automatic exploration oh. that would try to rank these uh, possible solutions. 
Okay, and a question from the feed. Tamar asks, can you extend your explorable compression scheme to other image compression methods? I think so, yeah. So th this was, uh, we demonstrated it for JPEG because it's, uh, this is the most ubiquitous uh, algorithm. But yes, as long as you like, you can find details about that in the paper, but our architecture is uh, tailored for the case of JPEG. It is uh, consistency preserving for JPEG. So you have to uh, tailor your architecture so as to preserve consistency in whatever algorithm you want to use. And if you want to turn it on its head and use these insights to design a compression scheme that does not lead to many different solutions, is there a way to do it or it's mathematically impossible? So if you want to lose, if you want to compress the image, so you want to get rid of some information, you will get rid of some information. You can design methods that perhaps the information they lose will be less of a perceptual, percept, less perceptually important. And there are many works trying to do that. Uh, certainly an interesting direction. We, we try to tackle the, the existing, the problem of existing methods like JPEG and allow explorability. Okay. And another question for Michal Irani, how do you generate the different mole images? How do you different, ah, different mole images? Yes. Uh, in this case, we actually, uh, we have this set of graphical uh, user input that we can, so we use different uh, circles, uh, brown circles, and we try to, to imprint brown circle, circles of different sizes. And then uh, there is a short optimization program that tries to make the output of our network similar to these circles in different sizes. Got it. Uh, okay, doing. well, I think we're out of time. Thanks for the great talk. And we'll move to the next one. Thank you. And the last talk for this session is by uh, Liad Polak Zuckerman, Eyal Naor, George Pisha, Shai Bagon, and Michal Irani, all from Weizmann. And the talk is about across scales and across dimensions, temporal super resolution using deep internal learning. And I guess Liad is going uh, to give the talk. Yeah. Do you hear me now? Now, yes. Okay. But you need um, to switch your, you need to share the right screen. Uh, you're sharing the mail. Okay, now you're good to go. Yeah. We can't hear you now. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So what is the difference between uh, temporal super resolution and temporal interpolation? Uh, in both cases, we want to increase the frame rate of the input video. However, in the temporal super resolution, we also want to recover the dynamic events that occur faster than the frame rate of the camera and therefore are invisible to the input video. This includes undoing uh, motion aliasing and motion blur. That's what we want to do. So let's look at an example of these effects. Here we can see the fan rotating clockwise faster and faster as it goes. But uh, because of the frame rate is too slow, at some point it appears to be rotating counterclockwise. So this effect is called motion aliasing. The other effect, motion blur, uh, comes from uh, when the when the shutter uh, the shutter of the camera opens until it closes. If the fan rotates fast, when it is, it, in, it induces motion blur. So these two effects cannot be removed by any type of temporal interpolation, no matter how sophisticated they are. The reason is that the temporal inter interpolation cannot produce new information that doesn't exist in the input video. 
In contrast, what we want to do is temporal super resolution that aims to resolve both of these effects the, uh, while upsampling the frame rate. So that's what we want to do. Uh, in this work, we perform, perform the temporal super resolution using deep internal learning. That is to say, we train a totally unsupervised CNN uh, on internal examples that we extract from the video input itself. The idea of deep internal learning was first presented by Shoher et al. And they proposed an approach for zero shot spatial super resolution. Well, given a single low resolution image, they downscaled it further into lower resolution. And then uh, they trained the light image specific CNN to recover back the original input image. Once this network is trained, they can apply the same network to the input image. There is no problem with the size because it's a fully convolutional network. So this uh, input image applied to the network uh, generated the higher resolution, super, resolution, super resolved output image. So what we do is that we extend this idea into zero shot temporal super resolution by ex extending the concept of internal learning to space time. The images are replaced with videos. The downscaling is temporal and the convolutions are now 3D space time convolutions. The super resolution is uh, naturally the temporal super resolution. However, the real sophistication of this work lies in the unique and unusual space-time augmentations, which we apply to the input video in order to obtain useful training examples uh, to train our network with. So um, let, we're going to discuss about uh, two important augmentations that we use. We use, of course, more of them, but two of them are really important, and we're going to talk about them. One a useful augmentation is obtained by taking coarser and coarser temporal scales of the input video by uh, blurring and subsampling it in time. So if this is our original video, the fan rotating, uh, when we take coarser temporal scales, the fan will move faster with mo more motion blur. And at some point, we will get uh, motion aliasing as well. In other words, the coarser temporal scales simulate higher speed, more motion blur, and more motion aliasing. We can use that to train a video-specific CNN on these uh, coarser uh, examples to learn how to undo this motion blur and motion aliasing. And uh, once the network is trained, we can use it to apply it on the input video to get our desired high temporal resolution output. So another very useful augmentation is based on our new observation that patches recur also across different dimensions of the video. So what does it mean? If we have, for example, our uh, video volume, which is an X, Y, and T, if we slice it at specific times, this is what we call frames. These are spatial slices of the video volume. So if we take the space-time volume and rotate it, so now one of the spatial axes becomes the temporal axis. And now if we slice it, these form the temporal slices of the space-time volume, where one axis is the temporal dimension that contains the temporal aliasing, which we want to undo. So note that the patches in these temporal slices bear similarity to patches on the original uh, on the original frames, but they contain aliasing in time. So the special slices can thus provide high resolution examples teaching how to undo the aliasing in the temporal slices. So this is what we will use when we uh, want to recover the uh, correct motion. So let's look at the strong visual recurrence across dimensions on the cheetah video. This cheetah video was recorded in a, at extremely high frame rate. The top right shows a temporal slice at yt, and the bottom left shows the temporal xt slice of the video. Note the strong similarity between the patches on the top right, what the yt slices, and the original video. We can actually some, see some sort of a cheetah here. 
but what happens if we use a low frame rate camera? So this example is of the video with uh, one eighth of the previous frame rate. So uh, the video shows uh, plays really fast, but also the temporal slices are squeezed and contain lots of temporal aliasing. Uh, as explained before, the special frames can be used as training examples to teach us how to teach the network how to undo this temporal aliasing across dimensions. But why does it happen? Why do we have this uh, recurrence across dimensions? So to understand this phenomenon, let's look at the 1D illustration of a moving object. Here it is, here's the object at time zero. The object moved to the right and the video camera captures a frame every timestamp. So let's look at the space-time volume generated by this video. And here it is. The left panel shows the construction of the space-time video volume as the object moves to the right. If we take a temporal slice through the space-time volume and look closely at it, here it is, we can see that the temporal slice is identical to the object uh, we had at the beginning, which was found in the special frame. This is why the cheetah in the temporal slice of the real video looks uh, similar to the temp to the special uh, slices. This is the reason for the strong recurrence across dimensions. So th this example was for the full frame rate. However, if we use a lower frame rate camera and uh, capture, for example, only every other frame, uh, then the space-time video volume looks like this. We take again the temporal slice and we can see that it is a subsampled version of the original temporal slice, resulting in motion aliasing. So since the original temporal slice can be found in one of the special frames, the special video frames provide examples how to increase the temporal resolution of the specific video. So note that this information is, can be found internally inside the input video itself and not necessarily in any external data set of videos. Since if we take a, a large data set of videos, there is no specific reason that we, the network will learn that between a blue and yellow dot, there should be a brown one. This information is specifically uh, correct for this video only. And okay, so the all uh, training process is in a course to find scheme. Uh, our algorithm is implemented in the following way. We, to super resolve a low temporal resolution video um, eight times in time, we first decrease the spatial resolution of the video frames by a factor of eight. The S here uh, signs the resolution related to the original input video, the spatial resolution, and the T, the temporal resolution. So uh, at the coarse spatial scales here down below, we, ex we see less motion blur, less aliasing, and the frame-to-frame -frame, uh, motion is smaller. What, a motion that was eight pixels in the original video is now only one pixel. So our network is trained on that specially coarse scale. And we increased the temporal resolution using the network by a factor of two. To train this network, we use the, the internal examples that we talked about before. And after we get this uh, intermediate stage, we use a spatial temporal back projection to increase the spatial resolution of the intermediate uh, video by a factor of two. So we now have this video here, which is one fourth of the original spatial resolution and one fourth of the res uh, of this temporal resolution that we want to have at the end, which is eight times the original. So uh, since we upscaled by a factor of two, both in space and both in time related to the uh, video that the network trained on, we can use the same network and feed forward this video through the network since the, pa the patch statistics is similar. So, um, the new video is then fed again to the already trained network to increase its temporal resolution by another factor of two. 
We repeat this process, upscale specially, and use the back uh, and apply through the network again until we get uh, the final uh, factor eight temporal super resolution video at the original uh, special scale. So um, let's see some results of the temporal super resolution. Uh, top left is the input, bottom left is our results. You can see the fan that is rotating on the right, on the correct uh, clockwise rotation. And we can see that other methods have trouble uh, recovering that motion. And let's look at another video. Here's another example of a rotating disk. Top left is the input, bottom left is our result. It's not perfect, but it resolves most of the motion blur and aliasing, while other methods have uh, trouble doing that. And here is, uh, we're gonna see some more examples. Here is the hula hoop video. Top left is the input, bottom left is our result, and bottom right is ground truth. Of course, it doesn't apply only to uh, repetitive motion. Uh, we can see results on uh, complex dynamic scenes. Uh, here is the billiard example. We can see that the method seamlessly handle both the global motion of the camera as well as the motion of the balls. Again, uh, top left is the input, bottom left is our result, and bottom right is the ground truth. Note the feet of the jumper. So uh, we applied the method to uh, 25 complex videos, and you can see all of these results in our project page. All the videos are there. Uh, we can handle the complex dynamic things like uh, the flicker, flicker in fire, and splash in water, and things like that. And um, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Eliad. Thank you for listening. Uh, oh, let's see, questions. So Shear asks, is it possible to combine the ZSSR and your work to apply spatial and temporal super resolution simultaneously? Um, I think that to apply spatial and temporal resolutions uh, to get simultaneously, you will want to use the information from the temporal uh, dimension as well. I mean, to do that, uh, the best way, I believe you need uh, to have the video volume um, altogether and not to do it separately. No, yeah, I agree, but can you extend it like build one giant network that does both spatial and temporal super resolution in a single step? Um, well, at some point we tried that, but it didn't work so well, but I believe you can do it. Okay. Uh, another question for Mishai. Uh, every video needs to be trained from scratch? Yes, so currently this method trains from scratch for every video. But uh, in the future, to, uh, combining the external, some external pre-trained network and using this method to fine tune on the specific video, I believe would be best. So this method uh, trains from scratch for every video. And okay, and a question from Shmuel Pelel. It's an amazing work. Do you assume that the video is repetitive? Do you assume some frames without motion blur? We don't assume that the video is repetitive. As, uh, as we showed before, you have some uh, videos of uh, fire and uh, splashing water. It doesn't have to be repetitive and it doesn't have to be um, without blur. While we downscale the, the video, especially we get examples with less blur and this what allows us to recover the sharper video. Okay, and question from Daniel. How can we re reconstruct rotation that is above the Nyquist frequency? So the, 
the idea behind this is to use the information that relies across dimensions. As we saw in the 1D illustration, although I will go back to it, uh, although the information that the frame rate is uh, below the Nyquist limit, you can see that uh, um, the object here, um, this is the alias object, but you can see that it appears in other dimensions of the video. So we use that information to recover the object. Okay, and I have a, a question. So in the original ZSSR uh, work, um, it appeared that for super resolution, there are different kernels. And I wonder if you looked at the different temporal kernels that you, you find in, in your solution and how different they are from one another, or do you, can you train it on an external database and get that there is a, only just a single temporal kernel and why bother with deep internal learning? So um, here, the, uh, the reason that we use the internal learning is not necessarily the special kernel that we use. We actually use a kernel that assumes uh, a full exposure time of the camera, which is not necessarily correct for uh, real videos. We applied our, our network on real videos that this assumption does not apply on them and we'll still get the good results. And the reason is the repetition across dimensions. Uh, so we use the internal learning to recover uh, the cross dimension information, not because of the uh, special kernel. We actually use the same kernel for all videos and it doesn't have to be uh, precise for uh, the method to work. Okay, so does it work on rolling shutter uh, type images or video? We, we didn't try on rolling shutter images. Okay, uh, let's see. Other questions, Yael asks, did you try this method to recover missing or distorted frames from a video? Um, well, what do you mean by distorted? Well, we tried on, on videos with really large uh, blurs and uh, aliasing, but we did not recover missing fr Well, okay. if you super resolve the, the video, you can say it's type of uh, recovering missing frames, but yeah. I'm not sure that's the meaning. Okay, and maybe the last question, is there assumption that the acceleration is zero? I'm not sure what acceleration here means. Um, I, I think uh, it means on the motion of the objects. And there is no such assumptions since the patches that the network learn on are really small, like five on five on three, such as this. So uh, um, at a specific uh, time, you can assume that this motion is uh, linear, but it doesn't have to be acceleration zero, just locally the speed is constant in a small patch. I see. Well, I guess we're out of time. Thanks for a great talk and a great work. And we're taking a break now and we'll reconvene at uh, 3.20. Hope to see you all then again.
שירים בימי ש... אז... Hello everyone, we are back to our uh, last session of the Vision Day. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Yedid Choshen, that we talk about the feature-centric view of anomaly detection. So, uh, thank you. Um, so I should um, say that this work is work by uh, Tal Reis, Niv Cohen, Deron Bergman, um, and, and a little, little bit of my hope. Um, so we're going to discuss anomaly detection. Anomaly detection is the task of detecting if a new image is different from those seen previously. And more concretely, um, in our setting, it first consists of a training stage in which we observe normal images and train a model on them. And then we have an inference stage in which we observe a new image and we decide if it is similar to those previously seen, then we denote it as normal. And if it's a new pattern, we say it's an anomaly. So if we take a look at the image, um, we can see that if in the training stage, we observe many white swans, then if we see another white swan, then we say it's normal. But if we see a black swan, we say it's an anomaly. Or as a further illustration, if in the training set, we observe many images of cars, then at the inference stage, if we observed a new image containing a car, we would say it's normal. But if it contains a dog or a boat, then this would be denoted as an anomaly. Right, so this is actually quite important. I'll just give you a few examples of why this is important in practice. So one example is in manufacturing, we may want to detect on, um, uh, we may want to detect on an assembly line if a new um, manufactured product contains a fault or not, or if our industrial equipment is going to break. Also in security and surveillance, we may want to detect unusual behavior. And generally, one could say that science is a lot about detecting unusual phenomena, for example, a supernova eruption, which would teach us something interesting. So, Obviously, because this is a very important task, a lot of work has been done on it. And classically, one of the most popular approaches is to estimate the distribution of normal data. Then at test time, if a new image has a low probability, then we say it's an anomaly because it's unlikely under the normal distribution. And if it has a high probability, then we say that it's a normal image. Obviously, density estimators are not so easy to come by. And one really simple but hard to beat method is k-nearest neighbors. It's a non-parametric density estimator. And the idea is that if we have a small k-nearest distance between the test image and the training set images, then this is considered to be a high density region. And we say the test image is normal. Whereas if there's a large K nearest neighbor distance, then this is a low density region and we say it's an anomalous, right? So this is a really simple baseline, but very few previous methods have consistently been able to beat it. And now comes along deep learning. And the question is, how can we use deep learning to improve anomaly detection? So many approaches have been proposed using the reconstruction loss of a deep autoencoder, using the discriminator of a GAN, and the most successful approach is um, using self-supervised classifiers, which I'll describe in the next slide. So in this um, talk, we would try to argue that self-supervised methods are really just feature, self-supervised feature learning methods. And that, that's the main property that makes them good at anomaly detection. And there've been a lot of different approaches um, proposed. One class classification based, like deep SVD, Rotnate based, based approaches, first um, introduced by Golan and Elian Neve and improved by Hendrix. And we also introduced an improved loss uh, function for um, extending the Rotnate based approach. So this is work by Liron Bergman, um, which was, um, which was uh, presented in iClear uh, this year. And the um, most interesting thing about our method is that it extends those rotnet style methods um, to non-image data. So as we said, um, we consider these self-supervised methods as, um, uh, as basically um, functions that train um, deep feature extractors 
um, just based on the normal training data. And so if we combine those feature extractors with k nearest neighbors, then um, we can introduce um, an anomaly detection technique, um, which extends the classical k nearest neighbor methods. And, um, and so here we um, present a comparison between the different uh, feature extractors learned by those um, various self-supervised approaches. And you can see that the rodnet based approach um, performs the best out of all of them. In, in this talk, lower is always better. Okay, so now the question is, um, can those state-of-the-art methods beat a really trivial baseline, right? And what's a really trivial baseline? We um, extract features from all the training and test images using a, a ResNet pre-trained on the ImageNet dataset, right? So the standard thing that you would use. And then we compare the k-nearest neighbor distance between the features of the test image and those of the normal um, training images, right? And we use the distance as the anomaly detection criteria. So um, you can see a, a comparison on the bottom, and you can see that um, the um, really simple pre-trained feature baseline outperforms significantly um, all those state-of-the-art approaches, right? So you know this is I don't know if it's surprising, but maybe it's a little bit disappointing. And so one could ask, sure, but uh, surely the self-supervised methods would generalize better. What happens if your images are very different from the ImageNet data set? So we evaluated it on a wide range of data sets, including medical images and aerial photographs. And the simple pre-trained features plus k-nearest neighbors do better than all those um, state-of-the-art methods. OK, um, so this, you know, this is really quite interesting. But the question that we might want to ask is, can we do better than this, right? I mean, it, it can't be that this is the end game, that we, those pre-trained features are the best thing that we could have for anomaly detection. And so we introduce PANDA, which, is, um, which stands for Pre-trained Anomaly Detection Adaptation. And this is work by Tal Reis, Niv Cohen, Liron Bergman. And the main idea is to fine tune those pre-trained features on the normal training data, right? So fine tuning is usually something that you do with pre-trained features, but the main challenge here is that there are no examples of anomalies. So this is a one class classification problem, which is significantly more challenging than standard fine tuning. And so we basically fine tune um, those pre-trained features using the compactness criterion. The idea behind the compactness criterion is that we would want um, all the features of the normal images to be as close to each other as possible. Or if we take a look at um, the image on the bottom right, we can see after, hopefully, after the end of fine tuning, um, the features of the normal images are bounded in a more compact region and they're closer together. Now this has an important failure mode, which is that potentially we can just learn a trivial function that maps all images to a singular point. And although this satisfies the compactness criterion, this is completely useless because it maps normal and anomalous images to exactly the same point, right? So this catastrophic collapse scenario is not something that we want. And so previous solutions have tried to mitigate this. Deep SVDD used a reduced architecture with no biases and a non-zero center. And this actually has some significant limitations. This is a really weak architecture and it can't use standard pre-trained ResNet. Um, so this is pretty limiting. There's also been another approach, um, joint optimization, which jointly trains the compactness loss with ImageNet classification. And this also has limitations. You need to keep image, the ImageNet data set in memory. And also it doesn't optimize the thing that we actually care about. And in practice, both methods do not actually outperform simple linear whitening of the features. So our solution is not to fear forgetting. And instead we just embrace, um, we, we embrace forgetting and we try to mitigate this. So how do we do that? We basically fine tune the um, pre-trained features on the compactness loss directly with no other modifications, right? So what happens? So forgetting does happen 
eventually. And if you take a look at this um, graph, you can see how anomaly detection accuracy initially improves and then it degrades. So our solution is to seize the moment. And the challenge is to be able to select the correct time to stop training, right? So we want to do some early stopping. So it turns out that the um, simple solution of early stopping after a constant number of iterations is actually quite a, um, is, is actually quite a good approach, um, but it's not particularly principled. And in some cases we do see um, that it stops too late after some forgetting has happened. And so in the paper, and I, unfortunately I don't have to go, um, I can't go into it, um, we propose two approaches, one based on lifelong learning, another one based on model selection given just a single test sample um, in which we mitigate um, this catastrophic forgetting in a principled way. So um, just to evaluate our progress, so if we go back to the same evaluation, I, I should mention this is on the fashion analyst data set, but you'd see very similar things on all the other data sets that we evaluated on. Um, you can see that the pre-trained baseline, um, which, you know, as we said, is reasonably trivial, was better than those previous state-of-the-art approaches, but our approach, Panda, is able to significantly outperform the pre-trained baseline, right? So you can definitely do better than that um, using, using Panda. Now, on small data sets, um, k-nearest neighbors on the pre-trained features was very hard to beat, and Panda was not able to improve over the simple baseline. Um, which was also better than all the previous methods. So, so far we've just dealt with anomaly detection, which is um, the task of detecting whether an image is normal or anomalous. Now there's another task, which is called anomaly segmentation, which um, its objective is to be able to um, segment the pixels of the image that contain anomalies. Right, so you can see, for example, in the wire, where sort of the bent bits of the wire are, are designated as anomalies. And so um, the same story kind of follows here. Um, there have been many deep learning methods introduced, some of them using pre-trained features, and some of them were reasonably complicated. And we presented um, an approach, SPADE. I should mention this is the work of uh, Niv Cohen. And we extracted the deep feature pyramid, which basically extracts a feature for, extracts deep features for every pixel. And now we perform anomaly segmentation by doing K nearest neighbors on the features of each pixel. Now you may ask, isn't this slow, right? We have to do it for every pixel. So we should say that this can be sped up to run at a faster than real time. So it's actually quite fast. Now, maybe the surprising thing that we found in this work is that um, visual transformer features, visual transformer is a very recent attention-based architecture and visual transformer features um, significantly improve the performance of spade. Now, the reason is that instead of the convolution, the standard convolution on your network, transformers attend over a much wider context. They actually attend over the entire image, but they select the relevant image bits to attend over. And so in this case, you can see how um, the transformer was able to attend over the object and did not actually care about the background, right? So this is very useful um, for detecting anomalous pixels. So just to see a comparison between Spade and the state of the art, you can see, again, lower is better. You can see how um, Spade was able to significantly outperform existing methods. And transformers seem particularly helpful for anomaly segmentation. I should say that we did not find them to be more helpful for anomaly detection. So this is a special property for trans transformers for anomaly segmentation. So to conclude, K nearest neighbors remains a very hard to beat baseline now in combination with deep features, right? Because K nearest neighbors and raw pixels is not particularly good for images. Now, over all the um, tested data sets, we found that pre-trained features were significantly stronger than the state of the art that did not um, use pre-training. So this seems to be very helpful. Now, fine tuning seems to um, give significant gains but uh, one needs to take care exactly as to, um, uh, as to the method used because catastrophic forgetting is an issue and needs to be mitigated. 
Now, K nearest neighbors on the features also are superior for anomaly segmentation. And we also find um, that visual transformers are a very promising um, direction uh, for future research. We've already found um, quite interesting results. So again, I should mention that um, this is the work of Tal Reis, Niv Cohen, and Niron Bergman. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. Thank you very much. So we'll check if there, so now it's time to give questions. So I have one question about the segmentation. Can you use your technique to improve segmentation? instead of finding anomalies? Um, so in the past, CRF was used to improve segmentation, so maybe you can use your technique instead of CRF. So potentially, I mean, I, I assume that transformers can definitely be used for improving segmentation. Um, I've, if I remember correctly, they've actually been used in the past for improving segmentation. But I, I think the main um, difference here is that we work on the one class classification scenario. So maybe the correct comparison point is against the um, unsupervised segmentation or weakly supervised segmentation settings. And we've, we actually have some pretty interesting results for sort of um, self or weakly supervised segmentation where we find that um, just using the attention weights we can already see um, that the transformer is able to segment the relevant um, pixels that um, relate to the object. So um, basically unsupervised segmentation is or, or weakly supervised segmentation is already taking place inside the visual transformer. And I assume that with a more fine tuning, it can actually be, be improved. So thank you very much. Uh, another question is, is it possible uh, to use attention? So is it possible attention for anomaly detection is not useful because you use all the wrong context? You need attention between all images and not pixels? This is a question by um, Shabagon. Sure, so um, I, I, I think it's, I mean, it, it's possible, but it would, um, I guess, require I don't know exactly how would one go around training it. Um, it it's definitely an interesting thing to think about whether sort of using um, deep sets or some attentional sets would be an effective way of um, of doing it. Um, but I the, the I think the thing that did not improve performance is um, is is because um, visual transformers of the size that we used are not actually better for image classification than ResNets of the same size. They only get better than um, ResNets when they're being trained on very large data sets. Um, for example, the um, JFT uh, data set, which has three, um, 300 million images, which I, I guess is proprietary to Google. Um, specifically, the thing that we used is um, a network that was trained on the uh, ImageNet 21,000 um, data set. And on, on I, this is not a small data set, right? It's a very large data set, but even on this data set, um, attention sort of transformers do not beat CNNs. This only happens um, for really large data sets and we did not actually have access to such a transformer. So it is possible that um, then that sort of when being trained on really, really large data sets, then also for anomaly detection transformers would do better. But we personally did not actually have access to, um, to such a network. Okay, so there are a few more questions. Uh, one of them is, is uh, one, one is a comment mentioning that transformers were used recently for improving optical flow. And then there are three questions. So I'll ask you just to answer briefly because of time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, by pre-trained features, you mean using ImageNet-based pre-trained networks or any training on supervised data set in general? We've also tried uh, features which were trained on the places data set. Um, 
it still performed quite well, but was not quite as good as the features which were pre-trained on the ImageNet dataset. ImageNet is probably a better dataset than places for transfer learning. Presumably, um, if it was trained on the JFT dataset, which is better than the ImageNet dataset, then performance would be better. So the answer is any pre-trained features would be probably decent, but the better the dataset, the better the features. There's no surprises here. Okay, another question is, did you try it on things that are not images? Um, we've, yes, um, but these were very preliminary experiments. Um, it, it depends. We have reason to believe um, that it would work on text. Um, we, I, I'm reasonably confident that we haven't tried it, that it would work on audio. Um, on time series, we had some um, mixed results, but the pre-training features were not particularly good. Um, I think the most interesting place is um, for data sets that currently don't have pre-trained features like tabular data sets. Um, but this is um, not something that we've already solved. This is work in progress. And last question is, uh, why not use uh, variational autoencoders to create metrics for anomaly detection? Variational autoencoders are being used quite massively for anomaly detection, um, but we did not find that they outperform um, the kind of methods that we um, that we, we we presented here. So they're def definitely being used quite a lot, um, but we see that they're, they're not quite as successful as uh, the methods that we presented. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the very interesting talk. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Amir Markovic. Uh, that will present his work on graph embedded post clustering for anomaly detection. Uh, this is a work with uh, Gilad Sharir, Itamar Friedman, Lihit Selnik Manor uh, from Alibaba Research and uh, with uh, Shaya Vidan from Tel Aviv University. You are on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Hi, so. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'll be presenting graph embedded post clustering for anomaly detection. This work was done uh, during my time at HIV Dance Lab. Uh, and it's a, it was a good setup. It did, it did talk, did a good setup for the problem we're about to present. So we, we address the problem of video anomaly detection. This is the problem of detecting unusual events in a clip. And the setting is very similar to the one that they uh, did just presented. We have uh, a training set that is comprised of normal samples only, a one class data set that is uh, annotated with no labels, but is assumed to be entirely or mostly uh, comprised of normal actions. And we have to provide a normality scoring function, a function that uh, tells us for a new unseen sample, how likely is it to be normal given what we've seen before. For video, there are many settings and many data sets, but usually they are unsupervised following this setting. The videos come from static cameras. Normal actions mean walking, as we can see in the blue frame above. And anomalies are people running, jumping, vehicles crossing the frames, like the cyclist here, and et cetera. When we started this line of work, we've uh, noticed two things we consider to be gaps. First is with current methods which often evaluate the entire scene at once and they are suspect to background distractions, they are suspect to trees moving in the wind, to lighting changes, to weather changes. And they yield suboptimal results as they are slow and heavy and hard to train because they are often modeled using reconstruction losses or GANs and it's a, a really difficult task to reconstruct each and every uh, frame in a video clip or generate it using a GAN. The second gap we've noticed is with current data sets. First of all, many are small and of low diversity and most benchmarks are already saturated. But more importantly, in my opinion, is that for most of them, only walking is considered to be normal. But in fact, normal is diverse and contextual or at the very least highly subjective. I mean, what's considered to be normal in, a, in an apartment isn't necessarily normal on the street, on the gym, on the beach or in a classroom. And each scene has its own uh, semantics and its own definition of what uh, should be considered normal. So our contributions in this work, are first, a new method that uses temporal pose graphs, which I will next present. Second is a new setting for exploring broader aspects of the problem and determining and setting uh, different actions to be normal. And finally, state-of-the-art results for the Shanghai Tech Campus benchmark, which is the accepted benchmark for video anomaly detection. 
So I'll start with a brief overview of our method at inference time, and then I'll dive deep to each part separately. So first we begin with pose estimation. We take a video clip and an off-the-shelf pose estimation model, and we extract the key points for every person in every frame and get this skeleton we see here. We take the skeleton and we concatenate it in time to get a temporal skeleton graph or a temporal pose graph, as we call it, and we encode it using a graph-specific autoencoder. We then get a latent vector, which represents our temporal pose graph, and we cluster it using a deep clustering model. Using this uh, deep clustering model, we get a soft assignment vector, which breaks the sample into the different clusters we've learned during training. We don't just take the peak softmax cluster value. We don't just assign a sample to a single cluster. We take a soft assignment vector and say this sample breaks this and that probability over the entire group of clusters we have. Finally, we evaluate the soft assignment vector using our normality scoring function that gives a score for each sample and tells us how likely is it to be normal or not. And a sample is determined to be a normal, abnormal or normal according to a threshold that is set over this normality function. So why did we choose pose estimation? I think that for uh, action recognition, it's easy to see, even by just observing this type of skeleton in a video, it's easy to tell relatively well what the person is doing, or whether he's sitting or standing or running or swimming and so forth. And technically speaking, this is a strong low dimensional representation. It removes background and scene details and it's invariant to many uh, nuisance parameters, specifically lighting and texture, which makes it compact and useful. Another benefit is that it's a really active field of research. There are many works and every conference show some improvement and there are many off the shelf great models one can use. And another thing is important to note that this is our, our method is agnostic to the pose format by itself. We show results for 2D and 3D uh, pose sequences, but it could be just as well be used for uh, hands, facial landmarks and many other presentations. So, once we have the a key point for every person in every frame, we need to find a way to represent them. So the key points we get from a TD pose estimation model show a strong spatial dependence, but they don't reside on a regular grid. We can't just convolve over them with the CNN as they're unordered. However, this kind of structure is really useful when using a graph. We can use a graph to represent our list of nodes, our list of body parts, a list of key points. These are all words that are used interchangeably. And define an adjacency matrix that tells us which two body parts are connected or should be considered together. Another advantage of using such a solution is that the temporal extension is straightforward and requires uh, no additional changes to the model. So how do we do that? Our basic building block is an extension over the spatial temporal GCN, which by itself is an extension to the, for the hugely popular graph convolutional operator by Kip von Welling. And what is done here by uh, Jan et al, also a popular work by itself, is that spatial and temporal adjacencies are connected in a separable manner. Here we can see in blue the spatial relations. For example, an elbow is connected to the wrist and is also connected to the shoulder. This is in the spatial domain. In the temporal domain, this elbow is connected to the other elbows in time. The elbow from frame T is adjacent to the elbows in frame T plus one, two, three, etc. And so we get this separable setting in which we first process the spatial dependency and then we process the temporal relations in a data set and then we follow it with some standard uh, deep learning operations. We found this uh, representation to be useful and it's efficient uh, parameter wise and allows us to apply our model uh, with very low uh, computational requirements. So I've talked about types of relations and this is in this work uh, we use three different types. First are the static or the physical relations, which is anybody's first guess and simply represents which body parts are anatomically connected. This is a strong prior and gets us a long part of the way by itself. The second part we use is globally learnable or dataset wide relations. This is a single adjacency matrix that is learned throughout the training process and represents a set of uh, relations that are learned from all samples. This is pretty intuitive. I mean, there are 
many uh, body parts while that are not anatomically connected are very much related to one another. Think of the two elbows or the two knees. If the two elbows are moving in the same direction or if they're moving in opposite directions, they can tell us a great deal about what's going on. And this case, the kind of relations that rise from the adjacency uh, metric that is learned throughout the training process. The third type we use is an attention-based uh, adjacency matrix, which is inferred per sample. We actually learn an attention matrix or an attention function that is uh, learned during training and applied during inference. And while this kind of relations uh, pro provide a significant improvement for the results and does so consistently, we're unable to find any intuitive uh, relations that arise from it. But we use it as, it, as I said, it's consistently improving results and we found it to be useful. Next, after we've extracted the post sequences and we have embedded them into our latent space, we cluster them using a deep clustering model. The idea here is simple. We want to enforce some, sh some shape over the latent space. And the basic idea is to tie together feature extraction and some clustering criteria. There are other formulations for this problem, but this is the one we chose. Once we've tied together the feature extraction and the clustering criteria, we can jointly optimize. In other words, we want to push features to be more separable. Let's take this TSNE illustration of the M of an MNIST strain autoencoder, and this is just an illustration, and I think that generally TSNE illustrations should be taken with a grain of salt, but let's observe this one. So every color here represents a different class of MNIST, a different label. This blue is zero, and orange is one, yellow is two, just for example, and so forth. And we can see this is very much mixed, and we cannot tell apart the different regions that represent different classes. However, when training the same autoencoder with the deep clustering objective, we can see that the learned latent space is far more separable and that different centroids in different regions represent different classes. This is again just an illustration, but it gives the general gist of what we were aiming for when using such a deep clustering model. There's ample research in this field and we rely on a work by Sheetal that's called deep embedded clustering and we found it to be very useful. Now we get to the final part of the model we propose, which is the normality scoring stage, which is one of the more important parts in my opinion. So during training, we take all the training samples and represent them by the soft assignment vectors. And over the corpus of soft assignment vectors that are predicted by the model, we fit a parametric distribution. In our case, it's a Dirichlet-based model, and we fit it to represent the distribution of normal samples. During inference, we take an unseen sample, we forward pass it to our network, and we get a soft cluster assignment. We then evaluate the soft cluster assignment vector and say how likely uh, this vector is given our fitted uh, distribution. And samples that get low likelihood are considered to be abnormal. Let's just give an illustration of this part. So we are set to answer the following question. Given all normal assignment vectors, how likely is this one? It's important to know that we evaluate the entire assignment vector and not just the peaks of max value. It's all a matter of proportions. So let's assume that we've fitted our distribution and it gets its maximal value, its mode, over this set of proportions, 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. It's not enough to observe the highest uh, probability cluster, the first cluster, okay? but we observe the entire assignment vector and we can see by this illustration that no matter in which direction we choose to move, towards the second cluster, fully towards the first cluster, or move the entire mass to a different cluster, this set of proportions gives us uh, the maximal probability. Same goes for you when using a larger number of clusters. We're not only looking at which cluster got the most mass, but we're also observing the distribution of the lower probability clusters, and it tells us a lot about the distribution. So just a, a, recap, a recap before the results, pause estimation, embedding, soft clustering, and finally, a normality scoring function. So our model improves over several recent methods by a considerable margin. In the paper, we also propose a slightly different input modality based on the deep features from a patch around each key point, which further improves results, and you can read more about it in the paper. Now we get to the second part of this talk, which presents our newly proposed setting, which we call coarse grain anomalies. As I said before, we've 
uh, thought, starting this work, we thought that the definition of normal to be strictly walking is somewhat incorrect and should be uh, addressed and broadened. What we did is we took action classification data sets, such as the kinetics data set, which con is comprised of hundreds of action, and we create splits. We create groups of action classes, four to six classes, are grouped together and the labels are dropped. We consider split classes to be normal while the rest are abnormal. We train the model using just those five classes and they are considered to be normal. And during evaluation, we uh, try and see if the model can tell apart the classes he was trained with from the classes he wasn't trained with. And all of this is done with no labels. We also evaluate the exact opposite uh, setting, which we call many versus few, in which we train using hundreds of classes and try to locate the missing five. Just an example of those splits. So some splits are taken at random. This is random split number six, which is comprised of completely uh, random classes, again, with no labels, arm wrestling, crawling, couch surfing, and presenting weather. And other kinds of splits we've evaluated are splits that share a semantic meaning, like the musician, musician's classes, people playing the cello, accordion, drums, and clarinet. And we saw that for splits that share some semantic meaning, the results are uh, stronger and are more uh, distinct. So this is the, just a, a view of those, our, result, our model's results for this uh, setting. But I think that the important part about this setting is the setting itself rather than the results that could be uh, obtained over it. So this is a short uh, ablation experiment, which I will only present if we don't have any questions. So I'll keep it for later. And to conclude, we've presented a new method for video anomaly detection, relying on pose graphs. We've presented a new setting, exploring broader aspects of the problem and specifically settings in which not only walking is considered to be normal. And we show state-of-the-art results for both the common benchmark and our newly proposed one. Our paper is on archive and was presented earlier this year in CBPR, and our code is publicly available. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amir. So uh, now we'll move to the uh, question. So Shiri Gordon asks, what is the smallest person size, height, width in pixels that can be analyzed by this method? So it is very much dependent on the pose estimation model and the resolution in which it is operating on. Uh, it's just, it only, it's only there. I mean, once we have a proper, uh, properly extracted pose sequence, we can analyze any scale, but it's, uh, its limitation is in the pose estimation model and not in our part of the model. Um, crowded scenes, we have created scenes with, we've evaluated scenes with over 100 people. So the limitation is not in our model, but probably in the pose estimation model. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question is, what, what do you think uh, is the most uh, sensitive part in your, uh, in your chain? So where you think if there will be, so, so, so basically, as you say, the pose estimation rely on existing one, uh, the attention rely on, on some. So uh, right now or from the past year, things advance, where, which component you think if you will change it with something better, you will get the greatest advantage? So, so that, that's a great question. And we have an ablation study that analyzes the effect of each uh, part in the chain. I think that the pose estimation model is probably the one that can lead to the most catastrophic failure because when the pose estimation model fails, we pretty much have nothing. Uh, other than that, we can quantify each and every part in our chain. And we can see that if we just skip the scoring function and just threshold the softmax values, we show a decreased uh, performance, but it's still usable. It's still better than random. So uh, all of the parts are important, but I think that a, a good and consistent pose estimation model will probably bring the largest improvement. OK, so it seems that there are no more questions. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the very interesting talk. And now we'll move to our next uh, speaker. Uh, from Weizmann, uh, that 
I'm known Geifman from uh, Weizmann that will talk about the similarity between uh, the Laplace and neural tangent kernels. And this is talk with Abhay uh, Yadav, Yoni Kasten, Mirav Galun, David Jacobs, and Ronan Basri. Okay, so thanks and uh, hi everyone. My name is Amnon. <clears throat> Today I'll talk about our work on the similarity between the Laplace and the neural tangent kernel. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Yoni Kasten, Mirav Galund, and Ronan Batsi from Weizmann, and uh, Abbe Yadav and J David Jacobs from University of Maryland. Uh, this work was uh, presented last week at New Year's. So the purpose of our work is to better understand what happened inside a black box called neural networks. Uh, specifically, we investigate the functional and smoothness properties of neural networks. Uh, we study these properties uh, on the neural tangent kernel, which is a kernel we, uh, that is fully equivalent to a very wide neural network. We show that NTK, which is a new kernel, is very similar to classical kernel called the Laplace kernel. So we can leverage a uh, knowledge gained on the Laplace kernel to better understand neural networks. We conclude by demonstrating experimentally our results. So let's dive into the details. So <clears throat> as we all know, deep neural networks achieve state-of-the-art results on many tasks. A uh, few examples are uh, image classification, object detection, uh, image generation, image segmentation, and uh, many other tasks can be given as well. Uh, so it seems that something in the estimation power of neural networks work very well and can fit many tasks. But in contrast to the empirical success of uh, deep learning, we don't fully understand why they work. One example of such misunderstanding is that some, somehow, contrary to classical machine learning intuition, a neural network with uh, significantly more parameters than training examples are able to generalize well. For example, the uh, ResNet uh, one, 152 has 60 bit. 60 million parameters, while ImageNet contains only 1.1 million examples. Uh, this generalization capability is usually attributed to the inductive bias of neural nets, uh, meaning that although a function can, uh, although a network can fit any arbitrary function, in some magical way, it chooses the solution that perform well on unseen data. So a significant step toward explaining such inductive bias was done by a recent theoretical work of uh, Jacot et al. Uh, he showed that uh, neural networks are equivalent to a linear predictor in a high dimensional feature space. Uh, specifically, they showed that the uh, fully connected network G, uh, they uh, used the fully connected network G and denoted by uh, W and X, the learnable parameters and the input of the network respectively. In their model, the number of hidden units is very large or uh, formally it goes to infinity. In this case, they show that uh, such networks are equivalent to their first order Taylor approximation, which is a linear function in the gradient of G. This is exactly what written here. When I say equivalent, I mean that uh, both the trajectory under gradient descent and the final predictor are the same. So the model above is also known as kernel regression estimator. And the mapping that takes X and map it into higher dimension through the gradient of G is called the feature space. The work of Rakot et al. is very useful because uh, it actually states that neural network are linear models in a high dimensional feature space. These are great news because uh, linear models are usually easier to understand and uh, easier to analyze. And uh, specifically, kernel regression estimator are better understood than uh, neural networks. So kernel regression is a framework that uh, provide uh, <coughs> practical and analytical tools to perform linear regression in a high dimensional feature space. The nicest thing in kernel regression is that uh, we can use the kernel trick uh, which means that uh, instead of computing the linear regression in the high dimensional space, uh, we need only to compute the kernel values between every two examples. In our case, the kernel correspond to our network G, uh, have the form of the average of uh, the gradient's inner product of two different input examples. 
exactly as written here. So <clears throat> this expectation has a closed form a, a formula that enables an efficient calculation of this kernel. This kernel is known as the neural tangent kernel or in short NTK. So to better understand the NTK, we will use the framework of the kernel regression. So the formulation of kernel regression is a given n training point, xi and yi. Uh, we would like to minimize the sum of square of differences between our prediction and the corresponding label. We also add the regularization term uh, in the form of the norm of the predictor. The minimization is done over age, which is called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, or in short, RKHS, and it is the space of function that is defined by the given kernel. This age is uh, going to be our main interest uh, in this lecture. <coughs> Since age is a Hilbert space, uh, the term with the norm with subscript age is the corresponding RKHS norm. A useful fact is that uh, every kernel uniquely defined in RKHS and vice versa. So the RKHS is uh, highly important in understanding kernel regression. Specifically, the RKHS determines, determines which function a given kernel can reproduce and which it cannot. <coughs> So uh, this first, uh, first of all means that uh, by characterizing the RKHS, we exactly specify the expressiveness of the kernel. But the RKHS determines many other quantities of interest. Uh, for example, the RKHS determines the smoothness of the final predictor. Each RKHS contains a function with a specific degree of smoothness, and therefore the final predictor will inherit its smoothness properties from the RKHS. In the following figure that show the different kernels as a function of the angle between the input vectors, uh, the smoothness can be thought of as the sharpness of the edge at zero. Highly speaking, if the edge is spikier, then the RKHS contains less smooth functions and vice versa. The RKHS also determine the generalization and interpolation properties of the kernel. And uh, specifically, uh, as can be seen here, the RKHS affect how the predictor interpolates to unseen data. Uh, in the four figures below, we use the three different kernel to approximate a specific function. Uh, in each figure, uh, we use the different number of training points. As can be seen, when there are a lot of data, most kernel behave the same way. Uh, but when uh, the data is not dense in the input space, as in the leftmost figure, different RKHSs generate different interpolations. This actually shows how the properties of the specific kernel generate different inductive biases. So now we are ready to move to our, uh, to our main theoretical result. So uh, we compare the RKHSs of the following kernels. So first, a Gaussian kernel, which is the exponent of the minus of the differences between two examples square. Uh, this is a widely used uh, kernel, which was studied uh, for decades. Second is the Laplace kernel, which is the same as Gaussian, but without the square. And lastly is the NTK of a layers neural networks, which is the inner product of the gradients of two different examples, where in the following uh, formula, G is a layer neural network. We also separate between uh, L equal to and L larger than two. So our main, our main theoretical results suggest that uh, when the data is uniformly distributed on the sphere, the RKHS of the Gaussian kernel is a subset of the RKHS of the Laplace kernel, which is equal as a set of functions to the RKHS of NTK of two layers. Moreover, we show that uh, the RKHS of NTK of uh, two layers is contained in the RKHS of L layers NTK for L larger than two. Our experimental results and two subsequent work have already shown that this, the two sets are equal, meaning that the RKHS of Laplace kernel is equal to the RKHS of NTK of any number of layers. So for the mathematical intuition of the result, I'll mention that we use uh, the eigen system of the kernel to prove the main theorem. Specifically, we use the characterization of the RKHS in terms of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the kernel. 
then we show that the spherical harmonics are the eigenfunctions of the NTK and the Laplace kernel. And uh, below is a figure of the spherical harmonics function on the two-dimensional sphere. Uh, highly speaking, there are generalization of the Fourier basis to higher dimensions. Finally, we show that the eigenvalues of the NTK and the Laplace decay at the same rate, and therefore the RKHSs are equal. Below is an illustration of the eigenvalues decay of the kernels on the one and two dimensional spheres. It can be seen that uh, the decay is indeed the same in each dimension. So there are several consequences to our theoretical findings. First, NTK and the plus kernel interpolate similar function and their predictor have the same degree of smoothness. Second, NTK and Laplace also generalize similar, similarly to unseen data. And finally, uh, compared to Gaussian kernel, NTK and Laplace reproduce less smooth function. So since the data is uh, not always located on the sphere, uh, we wanted to extend our theoretical results outside the sphere. We noted that uh, we noted from the NTK formula that it is homogeneous kernel, which is a kernel that has the form as written here. We then proved the exact form of the eigenfunction of such homogeneous kernel outside the sphere. These eigenfunctions are different from the spherical harmonics. They have the unique structure that can be seen here. They depend on the angle, and on each ray from the origin, they are constant. This result enables us to define homogeneous version of the Laplace kernel, of the Laplace kernel uh, which allows us to extend the similarity between the two kernels outside the sphere. So now we'll move to our experimental study. Uh, we, compared, uh, we compared the Laplace, Gaussian, NTK, and neural networks in a real world data set. And uh, we also evaluate their homogeneous version as we described in the previous slide. Uh, the goal of our experiment was to uh, examine whether the RKHSs relation that we proved uh, accurately predict the behavior of the final predictor of each kernel. So the first set of experiment was on evaluating classification results on various small scale data sets. Specifically, we used the UCI data set, which is a classification task data set. As can be seen in the table, uh, the result of the homogeneous uh, Laplace kernel and NTK are similar. Specifically, their average accuracy in P90 and P95, which are the fraction of data sets on which a classifier achieves more than 90 or 95 percent, is almost identical. It can be seen that gamma exponential is slightly superior over NTK and neural networks. In the paper, we also compare the same kernels on larger scale data sets. We also compare the convolutional version of each kernel. Specifically, uh, similarly to how we define uh, NTK for fully connected network, uh, it is possible to define NTK for convolutional network. This kernel is usually called the CNTK. In the same spirit, uh, we also build a convolutional version to each of the classical kernels. Our experiments show here that uh, CNTK is slightly better than Laplace, but the results are quite similar also in this case. Here again, the gamma exponential is slightly better. So to conclude, uh, we show that the overparameterized neural networks, which are equivalent to the neural tangent kernel, are highly related to the classical Laplace kernel. And we did it by showing that uh, NTK and Laplace reproduce the same set of functions. We showed experimentally that NTK performs similarly to the Laplace kernel on real world data sets. And uh, our analysis provide tools for studying wide neural networks and locate them between other estimation techniques, which was studied and used for decades. Uh, in future work, we think it will be interesting to understand uh, first if uh, classical kernel methods can achieve somehow uh, similar results uh, on visual data to those of neural networks. And second, if uh, NTK accurately explained the success of the current finite state of the art neural network. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amnon. Uh, do we have questions? So uh, let me start by asking one. 
I guess I'm biased by uh, support vector, vector machine literature. Um, you can either look at the linear combination uh, on a linear classifier in a Hilbert space, or you can use it what's known as the support vectors. Do you have a similar concept here that you can take advantage of? A Actually, if I understand it correctly, I don't think we can um, use the, do you mean to use the feature space or? So essentially, if I understand correctly, the NTK maps the input points to some high dimensional feature space, and then you have a, a, a weighted sum. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. so instead of doing it this way, in support vector machine, you have only a subset of features which are the support vectors. And this okay. greatly reduces the problem, the complexity. And the question is, is there a similar trick that you can apply here? Yeah, so uh, actually here, uh, what happened in, uh, what I told about neural network, uh, the equivalence uh, between NTK and neural networks uh, happens when the neural network are very wide or uh, infinite width. Uh, so actually it's, it is not feasible to uh, compute the linear regression in the feature space and uh, therefore you need to compute, you, you need to use the kernel trick that allows you to compute the, the results only by uh, computing the, uh, the kernel values between uh, every two examples. Uh, so this reduces the problem for, uh, from an infinite dimensional problem to, to a problem which is uh, in the dimension of the number of examples uh, on the number of, number of examples squared. Yeah, so the, you want to reduce the number of and the number of examples to a sublinear number, which is the number of support vectors. But uh -huh. Let me let me just uh, uh, follow on a question asked by uh, Raja: uh, Is there a neural tangent version that is equivalent to the Gaussian kernel? Um, actually, uh, we we conjecture. We didn't prove it in our paper, but uh, we conjecture that uh, that the uh, RKHS depend on the activation function on the of the neural network. Uh, so I guess that if you will use uh, different activation functions, for example, if you use the exponential activation function. Um, so the, the RKHS of uh, the corresponding NTK will be equivalent to this of the Gaussian kernel. Okay, and, and have you tried using deeper, deep features? I guess you can take an image and instead of using the image itself, you can pass it through a network. Uh, yeah, actually this is a, this is a, a trick that people uh, are trying to use, but uh, we did not uh, use it, but uh, yeah, you can you can take a network and uh, and feed the example. You can compute uh, the empirical kernel, like to take the gradient of the network and uh, compute uh, the inner product of the gradient between uh, two examples, and this will be the empirical kernel. Uh, and people are using it in order to to estimate uh, the kernel, uh, but we didn't try. Okay, well, I, thank you very much then, and we should move to the next speaker. Thank you. Um, and the next talk is uh, by uh, Yuval Atzmon, Felix Kreuk, Uri Shaliet, and Gal Chechik from Bar Ilan University and NVIDIA. And the talk is about a causal view of compositional zero shot recognition. Yuval? Okay, you hear me now, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Yuval Atmon from NVIDIA Research, presenting a work on a causal view of compositional zero shot recognition in collaboration with Felix Krug, Uri Shalit, and Gal Chechik. This work was published at, as a spotlight in Europe's. So compositional reasoning is a hallmark of intelligence and it resembles, us, it resembles human learning as it allows forming complex concepts and arguments from simple terms and recombine simple skills to solve new tasks. 
Um, this work is about recognizing new combinations of familiar components. Images like a monkey riding a boar, a purple cauliflower, or a black tomato. And in all these cases, familiar components are combined in new ways. Now, recognizing new combination is an easy task for people, but it is frustratingly hard for machine learning models. And this basically happens because compositionality breaks the basic assumption in machine learning that test data comes from the same distribution of the training data. For example, if training did not include any black tomato, but did include black eggplants, models tend to learn that black is predictive for an eggplant and make an incorrect prediction predicting the tomato as an eggplant. More formally in this work, we specifically focus on recognizing new combinations of attributes and objects. So for an input image, it should infer the label of both the attribute and the object. So in our training time, we see examples of white cauliflowers and red tomatoes, but at test time, we may see a purple cauliflower that we have never seen before. And of course, we still want to recognize familiar combinations. Most deep models are discriminating and they struggle to learn new compositions as they struggle with other out of distribution samples because they model the probability of labels given an image and become sensitive to correlations between features of an object and its labels, even if they are not essential. And therefore, we, in this work, we model this problem from a causal analysis perspective to avoid relying on these non-stable spurious correlations. Okay, so what is the causal mechanism that generates images in the world? You can think that this image is actually a recording of something that happened in real life. There is some physical whiteness and cauliflowerness in the world that caused this image. So we can also look at the distribution of the image X conditioned on these factors. And this direction of the arrows captures the underlying physical mechanism, which is much more stable from training to test time because it captures some real dependency in the world rather than depending on the, on the statistics of the data set. And the causal graph that generates images looks like that. There is a variable for the attribute, which is just the identity of the attribute, a categorical variable, let's say white, which maps to some stable representation of how white looks like. Similarly, there is an object variable, let's say cauliflower, and it maps to some stable representation of how a cauliflower looks like. These mapping are stable from training to test time, and together they generate an image of a white cauliflower. But the causal graph has another factor, which is this dashed edge. In, common, in causal analysis, this factor is called a confounder. A confounder is what, is what makes us only see white cauliflowers in the training data. It expresses the mechanism that generates the correlation between the attributes and objects that exist in the training data, and it can change at test time. And in that case, if attributes and objects are correlated, how are images of new compositions created, like an image of a purple cauliflower? Where do they come from? And we argue that images of new compositions are created by a causal analysis concept that is called an intervention, where something interferes with the causal graph that generates the training data. It overrides the edge that entangles the attributes and objects, and it forces the physical mechanisms to generate an image of a new composition. In this example, the intervention enforces the attribute to be purple and the object to be cauliflower, and together they generate an image of a purple cauliflower. The distribution of such samples is called the two-interventional distribution which, which we see on the right. Now, because we treat images from new combinations as intervention, interventions, we postulate that the question we should ask to infer the labels is, 
which intervention on attributes and objects caused the observed image. So for inference, we can select the most likely interventional distribution. And under some simplifying assumptions, this interventional distribution becomes equivalent to the simple conditional distribution, which leads to selecting the most likely conditional distribution. This last expression means that we have a model that takes three inputs, an image feature vector X, a one hot attribute label, and a one hot object label. It returns a score which expresses the likelihood of the image given the intervention on the attribute and object labels. To infer the attribute and object, we enumerate on all combinations of attributes and objects and select the combination with the highest score. So how do we model the likelihood term? To compute this condition and distribution exactly, we need to marginalize over the latent representations, these phi of A and phi of O, and to solve this nasty looking integral. And for that, we took a simple approximation. We take a point estimate inside this integral and model, model the attribute as having a deterministic mapping to the mean in this space with some Gaussian stochasticity around it. And we look at the likelihood given that specific mean. Now, because this is a latent variable, we don't see it and we estimate it back from the image. So under this assumption of Gaussianness, the log likelihood becomes very nicely behaving and results with three embedding-like terms. How good is the representation of the attribute? How good is the representation of the object and of the image? This expression for log likelihood provides an embedding point of view for the approach, learning three embedding spaces. First is a representation space for the attributes. We learn an attribute prototype and an inferred embedding which represents the attribute perceived in the image. Say, how white is the classified item? And naturally, we want that perceived attribute would be embedded close to its attribute prototype. Similarly, we learn a representation space for objects with an object prototype and an inferred object embedding, say, how cauliflowered is it? Finally, we also represent the image in a general space of image features. In all, we, we learned five mappings, which are implemented with uh, multi-layered perceptrons. Our loss has three components. One is how well the model matches the data. Second is how well it preserves the conditional independence relations of the causal graph. And third is just technical, making sure to avoid null solutions. The first term, the data loss, is the negative log likelihood that was shown in the previous slide. The second loss term is more interesting. It is related to the Markov properties of the causal graph. Basically, the causal model is a probabilistic graphical model. And as any probabilistic graphical model, it maintains a set of conditional independence relations. Therefore, the second loss term encourages the learned latent representations of the attribute and the object to obey the conditional independence relations that are dictated by that model. And we have four such independence relations. And for that, we use the Hilbert Schmidt independence criterion which is a differentiable measure of dependence between vectors and minimize it as a conditional independence loss term. We also show that this loss term encourages learning a representation of objects that it is robust to attributes interventions and vice versa. We experimented with two data sets, one synthetic and well controlled, and the other is more natural. First, we created a new data set of synthetic images based on the Clever framework with easy attribute object categories, 
but it is simpler. There is only a single object in every image and we had three types of objects and eight types of colors. This gives us 24 combinations and we randomly split them to 12 seen and 12 unseen. We examine the results in a diagram that shows the trade-off between the accuracy for images on the seen pairs on the x-axis with the accuracy for new unseen pairs on the y-axis. We see that different approaches may select different operating points to trade off the unseen accuracy for the seen accuracy. Some models tend to favor accuracy of unseen pairs over accuracy of seen pairs, while other models tend to favor the seen pairs. The results reveal that the approach improves the cognition accuracy for new combinations without hurting much recognitions of familiar combinations. Importantly, this comparison reveals that encouraging the conditional independence relations largely improves the unseen accuracy. Specifically, we observe large, large improvement when comparing a baseline without conditional independence to our full causal approach. And also when comparing a baseline called VSproj Visprod, which is a simple discriminative baseline to a similar variant, but that it is regularized by the conditional independence relations. Okay, so these results are for a 50-50 seen unseen split, but we also tested with other ratios up to seven to three and observed stable behavior. And as you can see, our approach is usually better on the unseen pairs without hurting much recognition of seen pairs. The second data set is the Zappos data set of fine grained types of shoes with 12 object types and 16 attributes like canvas or leather. And again, we see that overall, the causal approach improves the cognition accuracy for new combinations. Now, these results also show typical behavior where learning causal models, where some correlations fail to hold once the test data involves interventions and learning a causal model discourages these correlations, which improves performance for samples of, un of unseen pairs. However, ignoring these correlations can hurt recognition when the test and trend distributions are identical as we see with the seen pairs. To gain further intuition, we compare the errors that our causal model makes to those of the strongest no prior baseline. Um, for AO Clever with the causal model, 19% of the unseen pairs are confused for incorrect seen pairs, and 20% of unseen pairs are confused for incorrect unseen pairs. This results with a balanced confusion rate. However, errors are largely unbalanced when comparing with the strongest baseline, showing a three times ratio of 41 to 13. And we also observed a similar trend with Zappos. So to sum it up, Compositional generalization is hard because of the confounding relation between the factors. A causal model formalizes this confounding relation and suggests that we should ask which intervention on attributes and objects caused the observed image. We presented a model that is stable across environments and achieves better recognition of unseen compositions. Now, this work focused on the case where attributes and nouns are independent, but often they do exhibit useful dependencies, and we expect that the causal approach can be used as a useful prior for those cases. And finally, we handled here the specific case of attributes and nouns, but compositionality is encountered widely, and we expect that similar approaches can be applied to more richer combinations of actions, attributes, and nouns in images and videos. Okay, so that's all, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Yuval. Uh, let's see if we have some questions. Yes, yeah, so we have a question from Asaf. Oh, no, sorry, it's for the previous talk. Uh, so I have a, a question in terms of um, 
let's say you have a bunch of uh, objects. Do you need the uh, birds and uh, dogs? I don't know. Do you need the attributes to be uh, distributed evenly across all objects? Or you can have just like black dogs and red birds and you'll be able to predict a red dog. So, uh, so it, it depends how hard is the how hard is the split. Um, if you only see um, red birds and you uh, cannot disentangle what is bird about it and what is red about it, then you won't be able even to disentangle with our method. But if you see a few types of bird and a few types of red, then then it will be. Uh, much more easier to disentangle it. And, and what prevents it? I think you've tried to explain it, but I failed to, to understand it. What prevents it from uh, shouting uh, black swan every time it sees, uh, making up essentially new explanations um, instead of sticking to a, a more mundane one by exploiting the correlation between attributes and objects? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat? So, it? yeah. It, Every time you see a bird, you can say, well, it might be a black swan, whereas yeah. a much more mundane explanation would be that it's actually a black raven. But if you're trying to decouple the correlation, to break the correlation between attribute and object, then you're losing this information, aren't you? Um, that's a good question. Um, I so one of our lost term tries to maximize uh, the likelihood of the data. So I believe that um, we still um, can capture, you know, the the um, scene data, and, and and indeed we see that uh, we we do capture it quite well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean that that's a good question. Like sometimes there are very unreasonable reasonable uh, combinations and. And our our approach actually tries to to avoid um, ignoring them. So sorry for the <laughs> double negations, but okay. Okay. okay, we try to encourage that. So um, we we it's kind of related to a previous work we had um, about combining. Uh, it, it's related to the question um, if like like this. Scene pairs, the, the training data. Sometimes its uh, its correlations are are quite strong, and you want to use them. And and um, how do you how do you uh, play with this trade-off between uh, going for a zero-shot model and uh, observational uh, model? And and we have a work about it. So if anyone is interested, I can. And just to get a sense, how many different attributes do you have in your experiments? Um, in this one, it's a, a, we have in the synthetic data we have eight. In the um, shoes data, we have sixteen. Okay. Uh, I see there is a question uh, from Yuri. Uh, sorry, I missed this. What is the regularization term? Um, so our regularization term. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, he tries to uh, capture the conditional independence relations that the causal graph uh, dictates. So there are some a bunch of conditional independences that the causal model uh, uh, induces them, and we and we encourage them. I see. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. We should move along. And the next talk is uh, going to be given by uh, Yotam Mitzan. It's a joint work uh, with Amit Bermano, Yang Yen Li, and Danny Koenor from Tel Aviv University. And it's about face identity disentanglement using, so, sorry, via latent space mapping. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, now I can see it, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, so uh, my name is Yotam. Thanks for the introduction, Shai. And I'm a PhD student here at uh, Tel Aviv University. And I'm excited to present our paper, Face Identity Disentanglement via Latin Space Mapping, 
Uh, it is indeed a joint work with uh, Amit Bermano, Yang Yan Li, Daniel Koenor, and myself. And uh, it is currently running in the virtual version of the Sigraphasia in uh, uh, these days as we speak. Um, okay, so let's start. Uh, let's all take a look at this image. So if I ask you to describe it, you'd probably first describe the man's appearance, his identity, and then something about his facial expression and maybe his head pose and maybe even the, the lighting in the scene. So this is the representation that humans would give this image and also we would hope that uh, computers would use uh, similar representations. And if we look at another image, we, you describe it the same way, using the same structure. The values themselves would be different, but you'd use the same structure. And if we get creative and now take the identity of the woman, but all other attributes from the man and combine them, we now get a new uh, image representation of the face. And let's see what this image might look like. So uh, no surprises here. It is the same identity as the woman. They have the same skin tone, the same eyes, the same hair, you name it, it's the same person. But it has the attributes of the man. So she's almost frontal facing and she has a gentle smile on her face. And this is actually the task for our paper is to enable the, this very powerful yet very intuitive ability that we would like to disentangle the identity from all other uh, facial attributes. And then we can now take two images, uh, take just the identity from one and just the attributes from another and generate novel images as we've just seen. And the cool thing is that because the representations are disentangled, I am now able to swap a single image, for example, the attributes image, and uh, keep generating novel images that uh, maintain the same identity, but only vary in attributes. And as you can see, this is the same blonde woman in various attributes. And this is our goal, this is our task, and obviously we're not the first one, uh, the first ones to um, suggest a disentanglement method. So let's dive in to see the typical supervision used by other methods. So the most obvious one is the fully supervised setting, right? In which the data set takes the form of triplets of input, transformation, and results. And in this case, I'd have the ground truth for any uh, transformation in a single factor I'd want. And as usual in fully supervised settings, it is the easiest case and it performs well, but it is usually unfeasible to collect a lot of data sets that is so well stru structured. And on the other end of the spectrum is the fully unsupervised approach in which the data set is simply a collection of unlabeled images. And it goes without saying that this setting is extremely difficult and therefore it had very limited success in recent years. And since uh, this approach is extremely difficult and the fully supervised is unfeasible, uh, many other forms of supervision have been suggested. And a popular example is the class supervised approach in which a single feature is being labeled throughout the data set. Uh, for example, the identity. So if I label the identity in a data set, it practically partitioning it into classes. And in each class, the identity would be fixed but the attributes are varying. And this is obviously a much more feasible approach than the fully supervised one, but it still requires a labeling of data and it has a, a requirement that there will be multiple images of the same identity in the data set. And avoiding both of these requirements would enable us to practically use any data set we scrape off the internet. And this is actually one of our goals. So we suggest a different supervision setting in which the data set is indeed uh, without labels or any, any restrictions. Uh, most significantly, there are no two images of the same person. However, and I can't stress this enough, it is supervised, it is not unsupervised. And as supervision, we use pre-trained off-the-shelf networks that solve related but different tasks, such as face recognition, for example. And we do claim this supervision is weaker because 
mainly because we don't have two images of the same person, which is very, very strong uh, kind of supervision for disentanglement. Uh, but if you put that aside, practically speaking, this would enable to use virtually the endless amount of data online and uh, the supervision will be used only by off the shelf networks. So this is about supervision, I hope that's clear. And before we go on, uh, I'd like to say that disentanglement could be applied to any data domain practically, uh, but we choose to specifically deal with faces and specifically with identity. And we do that for a couple of reasons. First, uh, faces are interesting and highly applicable. And I don't think I need to elaborate on this any further. But the second point is that faces are much more challenging. And the reason is that we have all evolved to excel in recognizing faces. So we are very sensitive to even slightest imperfection in face images. And maybe if I, if this work was on chairs and I disentangle features of chair, I could get away with the low resolution image with artifacts. But if I'll show you these uh, images of faces, I couldn't get away with it. They don't, they simply don't look good. So the simple task of generating images of faces is difficult regardless of the disentanglement. But further, the identity itself is an implicit and high dimensional feature. And this means that it is harder to disentangle it than other well-defined well features such as maybe skin tone. So, um, given that I just claimed that both disentanglement and realistic face generation are difficult tasks, solving both simultaneously end to end is simply very challenging. And uh, this is actually what most other works try to do. And uh, from here, our key idea naturally arises. So we simply suggest to decouple the two tasks of synthesis and disentanglement. For synthesis, we use a pre-trained off-the-shelf network such as Stalgan. And Stalgan is incredibly successful at generating a high variety of high quality faces and we can use it as is. Those of you who try to train generative models recently would know the struggle it takes to actually generate an image with high quality and very, very realistic. And by using a pre-trained state-of-the-art pre-trained generator, we can simply avoid this issue completely. And for the disentanglement part, we use two encoders, one to extract identity, for which we use a pre-trained face recognition network and take its feature vector to be the identity representation. And for the attribute encoder, uh, we train it. And uh, please note that the checkable pattern in both the identity and the pre-trained generator marks that it is pre-trained and it also we also keep it frozen during our training, as we will soon see. And also another side note is that uh, the identity encoder, we intentionally chose one that was trained on loose crops uh, containing hair. And this is important because hair plays a major role in, in identity perception for humans. And uh, as uh, Yuval Nirkin actually me uh, uh, earlier mentioned that also the context of face and background is also important for uh, classifiers, uh, deep learning classifiers, right? So uh, training on loose crops enables us to use the hair as part of the identity representation, as we'll soon see. And now we just need to combine the two tasks. And the trick is to map from the disentangled representations into the Latin space of the generator. And this mapping network is in the core of our method. Uh, since the generator and therefore the Latin space are fixed and predetermined, the mapping network M has a very difficult task of mapping directly into a specific latent vector that will generate the desirable face without ever seeing it. I don't know how it would look like. So this is the overall architecture as we've just seen. And let's talk about the losses we actually use. So the first thing is that we use the same face recognition network on the output image and enforce a consistency loss which forces the output image to have the same identity as the input image. And similarly, we use a pre-trained encoder and force the consistency loss on the location of facial landmarks. Additionally, when if the identity image and the attribute image were the same image, I would expect a perfect reconstruction of that image. 
And so in some mini batches, we do sample the same image to serve as both inputs, and we use the reconstruction loss in those mini batches. Last, as I try to uh, convince you, mapping into W is not trivial, because also because Styrian naturally uses just a subspace of the full W space to actually generate high quality faces. So we have actually no assurance that our mapping network M will generate into these W values. So to solve that, we use a latent discriminator DW that is trained adversarially to discriminate between real samples from Stalin W space and our predicted W space. Uh, here you can see a few results. And for each image in this table, the identity is taken from the image on the top and the attributes are taken from the image on the leftmost uh, column in, the, in this row. And as you can see, the images are uh, realistic of high quality and preserve both identity and attributes as they should. So uh, here's a closer look up. And um, I want you to note that this disentanglement capability cannot be achieved by the style mixing approach proposed in the original Stangan paper because styles entangle multiple features such as identity and expressions. And uh, an interesting uh, point that I will keep on saying is that uh, we inherit Stargan performance. So as we can see, this, uh, this quality is simply inherited from Stargan's quality. But uh, Stargan is, be, beside the image quality, is also well known for its well-behaved latent space, uh, which has given rise to many methods exploring it, specifically using linear interpolations to uh, edit images, to perform semantic Im image editing. And while the results are great, they're usually restricted to simple and one-dimensional properties, such as age or the extent of a smile. And in contrast, our disentangled representations allows us to perform more complicated interpolations. So for example, uh, we interpolate between the identities on the far ends and keep the attributes constant. And as you can see, the identity is interpolated very smoothly and the attributes are remaining constant. And uh, the image quality, the high visual quality is maintained during interpolation. And this is only possible because of our disentangled representations. And to the best of our knowledge, we were the first ones to show uh, disentanglement of uh, interpolation of identity in the uh, in the W Latin space while preserving the attributes. So up until this point, we have greatly enjoyed inheriting Stargan's quality. However, we also inherit its limitation. So we must ask ourselves, what can Stargan generate? And Stargan can generate everything. And it is most evident when considering head pose, where because the data set was vertically aligned, Stargan also can generate, can generate face with roll angles. Similarly, not all identities could be generated. And uh, all results I, I've shown until now were uh, given Stargan input images, new unseen images, but Stargan images as inputs. And this made sure that Stargan had the ability to regenerate this identity. But what happens when real images are given as inputs? So here you can see uh, just this case. And uh, as you can see, our method generates a sort of nearest neighbor, which is possible by Stalgan. And as you can see, again, the image quality is not harmed and the disentanglement is not harmed. Only the, the only gap in performance is between the identity input image and the identity of the output image, which is a bit further than before. Um, we compare our method against Lord, which is the state of the art in class supervised generic disentanglement. They work actually in additional domains beside faces. And in this table, it is very similar to before, just there are two output rows and the top one is ours and the bottom one is Lord's. And as we can see, we have much higher visual quality, again, thanks to uh, inheriting it from Stargan. And we also find that we have a better uh, disentanglement capability because we are better able to preserve expressions as we can see in this table. And uh, one of the most intriguing components of our method is the latent discriminator. And to validate its effect, we visualize two versions of, uh, uh, we visualize the PCA over three versions of PCA spa of, of W space. Uh, the green one is Tagan original space and the blue one is ours. And the red one 
is a baseline model framed without the discriminator. And as we can see, the W space generated by the baseline model is completely different. And uh, also a cool thing is that this effect doesn't, it, it's not only a cool thing we can see in PCA, but we can see it in image space as well. So because the baseline model maps into an unknown territory of the W space, the generated images are of inferior quality as we can see here on the bottom row. And uh, regarding applications, um, our method can be used for semantic image editing, as I explained before, using interpolation. But in a broader perspective, identity disentanglement is highly applicable and could be used for many other tasks, such as de-identification, where one aims to hide an identity, and reenactment, where one puppeteers an identity. So take a look at this video. Here you can see a video I captured off myself that appears on top. And uh, you can see four, uh, I sampled four Stargun images and used them as the identity input. And I used my video as the attribute input, frame by frame. And as you can see, now we have four uh, identities then act using my attributes acting as I did, but they look nothing like me. So this is the indication for our disentanglement uh, success. Uh, just to sum up, uh, we propose a novel disentanglement uh, approach, and at its core is the concept to decouple the task of disentanglement and synthesis. For synthesis, we employ a state-of-the-art unconditional generator, and thanks to this decoupling, we require no data-implied supervision. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for joining our talk. Uh, we invite you to read our paper for more details and check out our code on GitHub. It will be available soon. Uh, no, that's it. Thank you, Yotam. Uh, let's see some questions. So, Michal Irani, uh, I disagree that objects are easier than faces. Faces are easier in the sense that they all have the same shape and all are aligned. Did you try it for non-aligned faces? Uh, no, I haven't tried it for non-aligned faces uh, for a couple of reasons. First, because uh, Stargan is originally trained with aligned faces and there's nothing I could do about it. Um, but also, also I agree that uh, face generation has uh, some quality that because of the alignment, it might be easier, but we are much more uh, sensitive to it. So if you actually look at the same stagger models for horses or, or anything else, uh, you could get away with images that look uh, with artifacts or lower resolution or makes less sense. So in that sense, spaces are uh, harder. So if I want to extend it to an uh, entire human pose, so instead of just uh, uh, copying uh, identity or maintaining identity while transferring pose of a human body, is there a way for me to do it today? Are there any data sets or networks that I can use? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I guess you could do it because uh, if you train the relevant stalgan that you need right for the entire human body, you, all, you only need the uh, maybe a, a pose extraction network. Like we use face recognition, you could take a, a, a pose uh, re regression network and you can use that to disentangle it from other features, I suppose. Okay, uh, another question. It seems like there are attributes which are coupled to identity, such as glasses or hair. What about non-fixed attributes, such as sunglasses, hats, etc.? Right. So actually, in this uh, work, we consider identity as the entire appearance of the person. So uh, it would it would definitely also copy a, a hat, glasses, and as I mentioned before, hair and the entire appearance is considered as identity. Okay, uh, let's see if there are any other questions. If not, thank you very much, Yotam, and we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you. The next talk is by Gabriel Habib, Nahum Kiryati, Miri, Sackler, Levi, Anat, Shalmon, and Arnaldo Meyer from Tel Aviv University and Shiba Tel Shomer. And it's about automatic breast lesion classification by joint neural analysis of mammography and ultrasound. Gabriel is going to present the work. Hi, 
Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 No, we can't see the PowerPoint. We see your uh, Just a second. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Gabriel Khabib, and I will present our research. Automatic breast lesion classification by joint neural analysis of mammography and ultrasound. It is a joint research between Tel Aviv University and CILAM in Shiva Medical Center, supervised by Professor Nahum Kiryati and Dr. Arnaldo Mayer. Breast cancer is the most common type of cancer in women across the world with 25% out of new cases diagnosed in 2018. In the States, for example, one in eight women will develop breast cancer during her lifetime. But it is also well known that early detection enables a better treatment and may save lives. Anomalies in the breast may be detected with medical imaging. In some cases, the radiologist finds a lesion, but doesn't know whether the lesion is malignant and should be removed immediately. In these cases, the patient is referred for a biopsy, which is a very stressful and time-consuming process. And given that most of the biopsies turns out to be eventually benign, there is a clear need for automatic tool that will help reduce uh, benign biopsies. So I'm going to present an overview of breast imaging modalities, related work, and our proposed method for classifying lesions, including the experiments we've done and some results. So uh, mammography is the most widely used approach for uh, breast cancer diagnosis. And it is based on low energy x-rays. It has proven to be a valuable diagnostic tool for breast cancer diagnosis, especially in older women. But still, it suffers from poor lesion visibility in dense breasts. For example, you can see in the right image that uh, there is a lesion out there, but no one can actually see it. Breast ultrasound is based on sound waves. It is a safe procedure, non-invasive, and does not use ionizing radiation. But it is less sensitive in older women, and its quality highly depends on the technician, because during the scan, it has uh, many degrees of freedom unlike uh, mammography or MRI, for example. Well, uh, breast cancer is not a new disease and thousands of medical studies were taken during the news. We got an inspiration from two studies that tested the uh, breast level, breast lesion classification of breast audiologists. The studies uh, showed an improvement in classification when both mammography and ultrasound screenings of the patient were used. Uh, that is in comparison to uh, a single modality only. For example, you can see uh, in the table and in the graph below that uh, in both cases, when the radiologist used both mammography and ultrasound screenings, they achieved a better classification performance. But still, existing automatic methods are mainly based on a single modality each. For example, uh, Wu et al. created a huge dataset of 1 million mammography images, 
and they trained a force to find model to predict malignant lesions. First, they trained a breast level model that creates heat maps of suspected area in the breast. And then they locally predicted whether each suspected area is a malignant lesion. Hijab et al. used the DGG16 model that was previously trained over ImageNet and they fine-tuned it with ultrasound images to classify the, the lesions. But we are not the first one to combine mammography and ultrasound images for a classification task. Cond et al. Uh, have, done this, have done this before us in uh, 2017. They separately trained three classifiers, SVM, KNN, and Naive Maze, for each modality, mammography and ultrasound. And only then they integrated some of the classifiers by a selective ensemble method. And they obtained the final malignancy score of the lesion by a majority vote out of the uh, chosen classifiers. So there are different ways to combine data from two different modalities. The most straightforward one is the by classifier level, as we just saw in the previous slide. This way, uh, potential relations between the images may be lost because the training is done separately to each modality and the combination of data is done uh, only in the last step of the model. Another option is to combine the modalities in the image space using image registration. It is very common for CT and MRI, for example, but it is uh, almost impossible for mammography and ultrasound because they are very different imaging modalities. So in our method, we combine the modalities by fusing high level features that were extracted from the same lesion. So it's kind of a compromise between the uh, two, me two methods. Our model consists, uh, it gets two images uh, of the same lesion, one mammography and one ultrasound as an input. And uh, the outputs are three malignancy scores. Two of them are based on each modality alone. And the third is based on the uh, on both modalities, on the combined information. We tested two different uh, training methods. The first one is an end-to-end -end training in which all three branches of the model are trained simultaneously and actually influence each other during the training. And the second is based on two training steps in which we first train each single modality uh, network separately. And only then we concatenate the uh, features and train a multimodality network to provide the final malignancy score that is based on both modalities. Our system consists of a single modality and multimodality networks, as you saw in the previous slide. We tested two uh, architectures of single modality networks. First, a basic CNN that was trained from scratch. You can see it uh, in the left image. And second, a Google Net architecture that was previously trained over ImageNet and fine-tuned with our data. In both cases, the input is a lesion patch and the output is a final malignancy score based on a single modality each time. The last layer before the output layer is a vector that represents the input lesion. You can see it uh, in blue color in the left image. The multimodality network is a fully connected network, very simple, that gets a uh, concatenated vector as an input. It actually gets the combined information between uh, the two modalities. And it outputs the final malignancy score uh, based on both modalities. 
So for our purpose, we created our own retrospective data set of 153 biosecure validations, 73 malignant and 89 cases. All the lesions were delineated by expert breast radiologists in both modalities in Shiba Medical Center. We used 120 lesions for training and 33 lesions as a validation set. All the experiments were done using the live one out methodology. It means that we, we trained 120 models. For each one, we used all the samples except one for training and a single lesion for testing. Each test lesion gets three malignancy scores, one for each modality and one combined. And the evaluation was done by AUC, Area Under the Work Curve, calculated from all the test scores. And the maximum AUC value that can be achieved is one. In the table below, you can see the results of uh, multiple experiments covering different configurations we've tested. Each experiment has uh, three AUCs, one for each modality, mammography in the left, ultrasound in the middle, and one combined in the right. And in general, uh, you can see that fusing mammography and ultrasound high-level features improves significant, uh, improves the results of uh, uh, lesion classification in almost all the experiments. In addition, uh, two steps of training uh, achieve better results than an end-to-end -end training, and transfer learning outperforms the training from scratch, and this is probably because of the small data set size, even though we, we did use image augmentations. The best AUC is a 0.94 with Google Net architecture and two training steps. Unfortunately, uh, previous studies that combined mammography with ultrasound haven't discussed their exact model design, so we couldn't compare our model to them. Instead of that, we report uh, two state-of-the-art baselines that were described uh, earlier each one of them using a single modality only. We train them over our own dataset and compare them to our single modality networks. And you can see in the graphs below that in both cases, our models outperform the state-of-the-art models by means of uh, AUC. To compare our model with human radiologists, we perform a simplified reader study with four experienced breast radiologists in Shiva Medical Center. Each one of them was given the same 120 pairs of mammography and ultrasound annotated images, and they had to predict a malignancy score to each lesion from zero to 10. And it's important to say that uh, the radiologist got additional information because they saw the whole breast image, unlike our model that gets only the lesion patch as an input. And we did it because this is the way uh, the radiologists are used to classify lesions. Uh, results. So uh, our model outperforms two out of four uh, breast radiologists. And it actually performs similarly to an average breast radiologist. So we believe it may become a valuable decision support tool, especially for younger radiologists. To visualize our model and understand it a bit more, we applied the GradCam algorithm. It produces a heat map that highlights the regions that most influenced the output prediction. You can see some examples in the uh, image below, this, these are uh, malignant lesions. And it turns out that similarly to radiologists, the uh, model relies on the lesion boundaries, especially when they are less strict, when they are more sharp. You can see it uh, in the red color. 
And it's nice to see because uh, this is a very common attribute of malignant lesions, and it means that the model uh, formally understands uh, what is a malignant lesion. So in conclusion, we show that fusing mammography and ultrasound uh, high-level features improves breast lesion classification. The model performs similarly to an average breast oncologist and may become a valuable decision support tool. For future research, a further validation on a larger data set should be performed. Additionally, our method can be generalized by adding extra modalities as inputs, for example, a breast MRI. And it can also be extended to any other pathology that is diagnosed by a multimodalities, for example, a brain lesion classification using a CT and MRI. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Questions from the audience? Okay. Let me start with one. So when you capture these uh, different modalities, how accurate uh, the registration between them should be, or you don't care about it at all? Uh, well, uh, okay. so in our case, we, we don't do uh, an image registration because the modalities, uh, mammography and ultrasound, are captured in a very different way. So uh, we couldn't uh, do an image registration like uh, people, do, uh, people are doing with uh, CT and MRI, for example, which they are... Uh, very similar uh, modalities. Uh, so we combine the modalities by uh, high level features. So I think that the features uh, are capturing a uh, high level information regarding the, the lesions. And uh, the combined information helps the, the uh, network to achieve better classification performance. So if you rotate the, one of the images by 30 degrees, uh, the results should stay the same or do you use augmentation to capture that variability in capturing? Yes, we, we did use the uh, image augmentations, uh, flipping, rotation, translation. Uh, actually, um, we need it uh, to enlarge the data set because medical data sets uh, are usually small. Um, and it, uh, it helped uh, improve the results. Yes. Okay, and the question from Niv Cohen, did you try using larger architectures than Google Net? How large is Google Net, by the way? Yes, I, I, um, US, I tried to use uh, ResNet 15, uh, 50 and ResNet 22. Um, Google Net is a slightly small network and I think that it worked uh, better than ResNet because, uh, because again, of the small data set size, Google Net has uh, less parameters than uh, ResNet uh, 50, for example. Uh, so probably this is the reason it worked better. Okay, thanks very much, Gabriel. Thank and you. Uh, we should move on to the next speaker. The next talk is uh, by Leo Gelberg in collaboration with David Mendelovich and Dan Raviv from Tel Aviv University. It's about typing style learning for personal identification. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Leo. Ge My name is Leo, and I am a PhD candidate from uh, Tel Aviv University. And uh, today, I'm going to present my work uh, named "Skeleton-Based Typing Style Learning for Person Identif Identification," done under the supervision of David Mendelovich and Dan Raviv. So this work actually deals with the person identification by his unique motion patterns. And in our case, that is typing. Yes. 
Yeah, so let's start with some motivation. Today in a digital world, well, pretty much all is done using computers and uh, remote communication. The need for a solid identification method is arising. On top of that, the COVID-19 pandemic speed up the need for the remote services. So what we see here is that Bob, the banker, is reaching Alice and Alice is interested in transferring money to her daughter's account. And uh, to do so, Bob requires the good old fashioned password. Now, the problem is that while Bob is transferring the money, he don't really knows if this is actually Alice on the other side. And it might have been somebody else that got to her bank account details. And on the other hand, Alice don't know if the person on the other side is actually Bob or some other person claims to be Bob and now has uh, all details of her bank account. So the missing ingredient here for a safe and trusted transaction is uh, identification and even continuous identification. A personal identification contains three methods. Something the user knows, knows, like a password, something the user has, like a token, and something the user is that can be a behavior, fingerprint, its, its appearance. And uh, this work deals with the something the user is approach. So we can identify it. We can identify a user by his characteristics in uh, three different ways. The first is the visual, like uh, an image which is uh, static based or a video which contains motion information. The second is geometry, which means measurement of different body parts and last behavior, which means the analysis of the manner a person does something. And therefore this approach is motion based only. So, by now, you're probably asking yourself, why, why not simply use the, the visual-based identification as they perform extremely well nowadays? So the thing is, these algorithms, they perform really well in the lab conditions, under lab conditions. And once you try using these visual-based algorithms in the real world, their performance is degrading severely due to the unconstrained scene properties. For example, in the case of uh, face detection, the performance of state-of-the-art algorithms can decline due to bright scene, dark scene, random noise, and uh, most recently, masks covering half of the face. So as the name of the work suggested, we focus on typing behavior and to realize what the motion-based identification approach can offer here is a little quiz. Are we looking at, the, at an image of the same person? So this question is quite hard as both hands, they, they look alike. And once we add the motion information, we can, we can start notice actually that the difference between the two different people. However, our model doesn't see the hand as an, as an image, but as a set of the hands joints coordinated to time. Now you can see the typing patterns of the same sentence are totally different. So overall, our task is as follows. Given a set of N videos contains different type sentences of a, of a person and a total of M different persons, we would like to distinguish between the different identities by their typing style, mainly on sentences we never saw during training. And we can think of this as an identification in the wild in some manner. This form of identification can easily apply for access control or for continuous identification. Uh, that way we can protect our private information far, far beyond the simple password. So we consider video action recognition as a close task to ours, and we inspire most of our ideas from this field. This, text, this task requires classifying videos activities using color and motion information. And in our work, we focus on one class, on, on one class typing. Then we look into the class distribution 
in the manner of how the different persons perform this action and try to classify the person accordingly. One of the approaches to handle the action recognition task is skeleton based, where instead of using the entire RGB information, we extract a skeleton representation in time to predict the action in the video. The leading method for the skeleton based action recognition is graph based. So the convolution operation on graph is not trivial as in images. And while the convolution operation on images is ordered and contain a fixed size of neighbors, the convolution operation on graph is unordered and don't necessarily ha has a fixed neighbor size. This making this uh, operation how to implement efficiently. Previous work suggested the following linear approximation for graph convolutions. That means that A is the graph adjacency matrix and lambda is the normalization matrix yielding a normalized adjacency matrix. X is the input to the layer and W are learned weights. For a spatial temporal graph, we simply add a 1D convolution operates on the temporal axis. And overall, this is the construction of a spatial temporal GCM. So let's cover our method building blocks uh, in a summary. First, we define an, an adjacency matrix of the hand where all 21 joints are the vertices and their connections are links. We use a division strategy contains three subsets. First is the self connection. The second is the inward connection that indicates the, link, the links which are farther from the center of gravity compared to the vertex in hand. And last, the outward, which is opposite to the inward. Besides the fixed normalized adjacency matrix, it can be beneficial to add another learnable adjacency matrix that is completely data-driven and can be different between the layers of the spatial temporal GCN. That way, we are more flexible and can better utilize the training data. Overall, the adaptive graph, the adaptive graph layer consists of A, a fixed normalized adjacency matrix, B, a learned adjacency matrix, and C, an attention-based samples unique adjacency matrix. When all the three matrices are added together, B and C can offer more degrees of freedom and produce a data-driven adjacency matrix, which is more suitable for the task in hand. We wish to better emphasize the long range dependencies of the hand as the hand is quite small and the concept of long and short range is not applicable here. The non-local block refines feature representation by weighted similarity between each feature and all others. And therefore, it can enhance the long range dependencies which tend to be weaker due to the limited ROI and non-locality. We will see up ahead that these dependencies are beneficial in our task. So A, the matrix A emphasizes the short range dependencies. B is completely learned and C is somewhat guiding uh, uh, B in its learning process. The input data is entering the self-attention module that produce the sample's unique matrix. And then the softmax operation normalizes the matrix resulting the long range dependencies which already tend to be weak to decrease uh, dramatically. And therefore the model never able to learn these dependencies since it never permute this type of dependencies forward and in return, no gradients are pushing the model in this direction. Therefore, we apply a non-local block to utilize the information from all adjacency matrices altogether and enhance the non-trivial long range dependencies. We further apply a non-local block on the temporal axis to get the refined dependencies in time and the broader aspect on slow motion like the hand posture and typing fingers. The full network architecture is as follows. We use an annual GCN module on the mid-level features to enhance the spatial long range dependencies and an annual TCN module in the last unit to produce better temporal dependencies within the deep features. 
We further use a downsampling unit shared among all channels, which learns to sum the channel with a minimal loss of information. A second stream of our model is fed with bones data, which consists vectors of the bones through time. Uh, this input actually helps the network to better process the high, the high frequencies as bones are derivatives of the joints. So since there is no benchmark and no data set for this task, we created two data sets. The first data set named 80 typing two contains 80 persons type two sentences for 10 times. Therefore, it's relevant for the re-ID for the re-ID task as it consists low variety of different motion patterns and a large variation within these patterns. Second data set named 60 typing 10 contains 60 persons type 10 sentences for three times and it's relevant for the classification on the new unseen sentences. In the first experiment, we split the sentences of 60 typing 10 by sentence type, where for example, according to the left table, four sentences were given to train, two for validation and four for testing. Since the model need to infer on sentences it never saw during, during the training, it need to learn the style characteristic and generalize to other sentences, which means motion patterns it never, it never encountered before. We see that our model indeed succeed in learning the style characteristics as it achieved remarkable results on the test set with increasing margin compared to other methods when the amount of training sentences is decreased. Next, we experimented on 80 typing 10 and we can see in the left table results for classification on unseen sentences in an extreme case where only one type of sentence is available for training. On the, other, on, on the right, uh, we can see a different use case where the model need to infer on sentences it never saw during training, but different videos of them. That is the re-ID task. And uh, clearly this task is easier than the previous one. We tested our model in a scenario of noisy data. We trained the model as usual, and only during the test time, we randomly zeroed zero to three joints in uh, random frames. We can see that our model is far more robust to noise, and we can attribute it to our non-local approach as now the model rely less on a certain joint and taking into consideration more possible dependencies. We mentioned before that working under uncontrolled environment is an extremely important property for an identification method. While the state of the art heavy in parameters, 3D convolution based models achieve good results in the controlled environment, the accuracy drops when tested under uncontrolled environment. Our method is far more robust under this scenario since we operate on a lower dimension uh, which lower dimensional space, which in different to environmental conditions. Here, all network trained with several data augmentations and only during test time, they were fed with different data augmentations than the one used for training. For training. We further tested our model in a scenario where the 3D coordinates of the joint is given. And we see that even here, our model is superior. Next, we tested the trade-off between the 3D, the 3D and the 2D input data. Well, and it's quite interesting to realize that uh, we don't lose much when we using only the 2D data, which is much simpler to, to, to get. So to summarize, we developed a, a new architecture for typing style learning. We achieved the best results under controlled and uncontrolled environment, and even in a scenario of noisy input. Unless we introduced a new method for person identification based on its unique typing style. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leo. Questions from the audience? So while people are coming up with questions, let me ask one. Have you considered the time domain so for example, how long does it take uh, for a user to type one letter after the next? 
In fact, you could have used just a 1D signal, which is the time difference between the keystrokes. Yeah, you mean the keystroke dynamic. This yeah. is like, a, this is a known approach. Uh, basically, the keystroke dynamic is, is working very well, but it, it don't uh, necessarily use only the, 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 the keys you type, but also your mouse movements and the other things you do with computer with the computer, like they, they learn the, your profile. We only use the like uh, one sentence you type. Uh, and even we don't, uh, we, we don't see the information. We only see the hand that the typing. So we get uh, much less information uh, comparing to the keystroke dy dynamic. So how long is the keystroke dynamic versus your input in terms of time, let's say, or whatever units you want to measure it? Uh, so I don't really know because I, I, uh, I didn't uh, compare to keystroke dynamic because it's, uh, it, the, the task is pretty uh, similar, but, but the, the methods are very different. We use uh, visual based information and they use like uh, input. Uh, the, the keyboard. So I didn't uh, compare it. Okay. Question, how sensitive is the method to the camera position? So uh, basically when we, when we uh, recorded the data sets, we had uh, to move between uh, locations uh, to get more people. And uh, and the camera position never was exactly the same. And there is a small variety within the data, the data set. And uh, actually it's even, it, it, it don't necessarily matter because uh, I, I use the same uh, um, pose estimator in the, on the same, uh, on the two data sets that, uh, that recorded like uh, a year, uh, one year, one form another. Uh, so it, it's not, uh, it's not I, I guess it's not that relevant, uh, that camera position. Okay, any other questions? No questions. Okay, well, thanks very much, Lior. And we'll move to the next uh, talk of the vision day. The last talk is by Roy Shaul, Itamar David, Ohad Chitrit, and Tamir Ikim Raviv from Ben Gurion University. It's on subsampled brain MRI reconstruction by generative adversarial neural networks. And I guess Roy is going to give the talk. Hi, my name is Itamar, Roy Shaul, and I will present our work, subsampled brain MRI reconstruction by Generative Adversarial Neural Network. The work is done in collaboration with Rachi Trit under the supervision of Dr. Tami Rikin Raviv from Ben Gurion University. The main reason to subsample MRI scan is to accelerate the MRI scan time. We would like to do so for many reasons. First of all, time is money. If the scan time is shortened, we could scan more patients. Those patients will have less time in the machine and will be more comfortable. MRI time, <clears throat> MRI time acceleration will obviously reduce the motion artifact when scanning static organ like the brain and moving organ like the heart for cardiac MRI. Sometimes multiple fast scan over time are needed to see the dynamic of the organ. In addition, it's important to scan fast when scanning babies or, or pregnant women and so on. Magnetic resonance imaging or MRI is non-invasive imaging technology that produce three-dimensional detailed anatomical images. The component of the MRI system include a primary magnet, gradient magnet, radio frequency coil, and the computer system. The scan relies on the magnetic properties of the hydrogen nuclei. First, the moment of the hydrogen nuclei are randomly oriented. When a B0, a strong static magnetic field, is introduced to the system, the nuclei align with that field. Most of the nuclei will spin up and some of them will spin down. The difference between, the difference will cause an energy gap. The orientation uh, of the nuclei spin is affected again when an RF pulse is provided to the system. The pulse eventually causes resonance which translated into special frequency intensity. When a patient enter an MRI machine, 
it virtually divides his brain into virtual slices. Then each slice sampled into the complex Fourier domain called K space. When all the samples are collected, we can do Fourier transform and transfer the K space image into a meaningful image. It takes a long time to acquire all the K space samples for each slice. Those of you who've done the scan know it takes a minute to scan full 3D volume. In Cartesian sampling, uh, the scan time has linear relation to the amount of acquired data. If we decide to subsample the case space, the pole sequences will be shorter and the scan time will be faster. We can notice that the low spatial domain frequencies, which are, which are in the center of the case space image, contain more information than the high frequencies. So I would like to keep as many of those samples as possible. In addition, as we know from the Nyquist theorem, if the sampling pattern is uniform, for example, sample every second row, it will cause an aliasing artifact. So inspired by the compressed sensing theory, we can subsample in an ununiform pattern while keeping most of the center samples. If we zero fill the missing samples, the result would be better, but still poor. Later on, we will compare our result to this method named zero fill. The goal of our work is to speed up the MRI scan time by reducing the amount of acquired data. We use deep learning approach to do it without degrading the image diagnostic value. There are two kinds of existing approaches that have the same goal. Hardware solution, which uses parallel imaging to accelerate the scan time, and software solution, like compressed sensing and other learning-based method. Our method is software-based method, which aim to run on available MRI machines. Let's formulate the problem. K0 is a fully sampled case space, and I0 is its Fourier transform, which is a meaningful image. By sampling K0 using the chosen pattern M, we can generate partial sample case space, which will be the model input. Our goal is to find the correct model and parameters, which minimize the distance between the model output and the optimal fully sample image, I0. We use generative adversarial network architecture, generator and discriminator to optimize the result. The generator is composed of two components. The first component goal is to fill in the unsampled case space. The input is the sample case space slice we would like to recover. We use adjacent sample slices to take advantage of the special relation across the z-axis. Case space is a complex image, so we separate each of the three slices to real and imaginary channel. We replace the missing sample with random noise and input it to a unit network whose role is to estimate the missing samples. As we have full information on the sampled frequencies in the input, we keep the data consistency by enforcing the known samples to the unit output K out. The first loss we used to optimize the model is minimization of L2 distance between the reconstruction K space, KR, and the original K space, K0. Let's talk about the second component of the generator. We used Fourier transform, which is a differentiable operation to reconstruct IR from KR. IR is the input to, the second, to a second unit network whose role is to refine the image and remove additional artifacts. The network learned to estimate delta IR, the refinement that needed to the image. The addition between IR and delta IR is the generator output IR hat. The second model loss is minimization of L1 and L2 distance between the generator reconstructed output, IR hat, and the fully sampled image, I0. To avoid blurry result and to ensure realistic output, we train a discriminator to distinguish between the model generated output, IR hat, and I0, a fully sampled case space reconstruction. The model is trained end to end. The full, loss is, the full loss is composed of the case space loss, which is the distance between the first generator component output and the original case space. The image space loss, which is the distance between the second generator component, generator component output and the original image, and the adversarial loss. Hi. 
So to validate our algorithm reconstruction quality on diverse brain MRI data sets, uh, we <clears throat> our main data set we use is the IX title set. It consists of over 500 volumes of healthy adult brain scans and is used to train our base model. While healthy brains usually resemble each other, we are concerned about reconstructions of scans in, in presence of pathologies. In such cases, it is vital to ensure that the pathologies are properly re reconstructed and such is vital that the model will not hallucinate any pathologies. To test it, we use a data set of MS, MS patients, Tareshet Nefoza, with brain lesions. In this data set, each patient is scanned multiple times, each in a different modality. The different modalities show different properties of the scanned organs and encode biological tissue types to different intensity levels. Modalities can be thought of as the, as the different channels of an RGB image, capturing different qualities of the organ. Some of these modalities, T1, T2, and FLIR, can be seen in the slide. The data is manually annotated by a professional radiologist for lesions. As seen, the lesions are small and hard to detect and localize, which makes it a challenging task. We further test our method in presence of pathologies using dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, DCE MRI, of stroke and brain tumor patients. In DCE MRI, a contrast agent is injected to the patient as he starts the scan, and volumes are captured rapidly over time to capture the dynamics of the brain bloodstream. This data can be thought of as a 4D video capturing 3D data over time. In pathologies, the contrast agent will wash out very slowly, so it can be detected by processing the stream. To sum up, we use three different datasets. The IXI dataset has one modality and no pathologies. The MS lesion dataset has multiple modalities and annotated pathologies. And the DCE MRI dataset has a temporal dimension and has significant pathologies. To quantify our method reconstruction results, we use common perceptual quality metrics. Peak signal to noise ratio, PSNR, quantifies the reconstruction MSC loss in a logarithmic scale. The structural simula similarity loss, SSIM, quantifies the perceived change in structural information by measuring the pixels' interdependencies. However, as we are reconstructing medical images, perceptual quality is not a main metric we are interested in. At the end of the day, a radiologist examining a scan does not care about its aesthetics, but only about the diagnostic information results. This means that common natural image quality measures are not sufficient to evaluate the reconstruction quality. We suggest to measure the quality by assessing the diagnostical values. To do so, we use segmentation accuracy metrics. <coughs> uh, one of the metrics used is the dice coefficient, measuring sensitivity and specificity of the segmentation by measuring the intersection of the blobs. House of distance is used to measure the similarity between two shapes. And for the DCMRI dataset, we <clears throat> measure the quality of the flow parameters estimation to validate that both spatial and temporal information are preserved. We compare our methods to several other reconstruction methods, zero field reconstruction, which is used as a lower bound benchmark, compressed sensing MRI, using compressed sensing techniques as first suggested by Dono and Lustig for recovery of missing case space samples, and ADMM CSNet, a deep learning method which exploits compressed sensing techniques for case space reconstructions. We also do an ablation study and check the components in our architecture. ImSpace GAN stands for the reconstruction of the image solely in the image domain by fitting in the zero field reconstruction as an input, while case space GAN we reconstruct the image only in the case space domain, skipping the image domain refinement step. In this figure, we can see the results on reconstruction of a LT adult brain scan. We emulate a five fold scan speed up by sampling 20% of the case space frequencies. The zero field reconstruction is highly aliased and cannot be used for diagnosis. Both compared methods highly improve the quality but blurred tissue boundaries, while the case space and in space gun further improve the visual clarity. Our proposed method generates, generates reconstruction with high perceptual quality that captures the properties of the original image. The perceptual metrics results can be seen in the following figures. In both PSNR and SSIM, our proposed method outperforms com the compared methods. <clears throat> we test the diagnostic quality of the images by activating common algorithms on the volumes. The first algorithm we use is brain extraction. It is used to remove the skull from the image. 
Our proposed method is most cons consistent with the original fully sampled scan. Next, we run another off-the-shelf algorithm for brain segmentation. The algorithm segments the brain into three tissue types, white matter, gray matter, and CSF. Again, our reconstructions are comparable to the original data. We quantify these algorithm performances by using the modified alto di distance and dice scores. We calculate the alto distance between the brain extraction of the original image to each of the reconstruction. Our proposed method has the lowest distance and thus resemble the original the most. We evaluate the same for tissue segmentation using the dice coefficient. Again, our, our method outperforms all others. Next, we test our algorithm in presence of pathologies on the MS lesion dataset. As this dataset has much fewer volumes, we use transfer learning from base T1 model to tune our model to the different modalities. We use the algorithm for reconstruction of the different modalities, among which are T2 and FLIR. We can see that our proposed method generalizes well to the new data and is robust to brain pathologies. The following table shows the perceptual metrics of the reconstruction methods. While our method C outperforms the others, the CSMRI is a close second, as the other methods besides CSMRI are data-driven and the lack of training data impact the reconstruction quality. This dataset, as being a part of the MS Solution Segmentation Challenge, also contains lesion annotations. The challenge is to segment the lesions given the different modalities. We use the reconstructed scan as an input to a segmentation CNN, which was used by our fellow lab student, O. Schwartzman, to compete in this task. In this example, we see segmentation's results. The leftmost column <coughs> shows the CNN estimated segmentation on the original data. Excuse me, the leftmost column shows the original slice along with the manually annotated lesions, while the next column shows the CNN estimated segmentation on the original data. The next column shows the reconstruction with their respective estimated segmentations. While, our, while CSMRI show comparable results in perceptual qualities, the segmentation result is not as similar to the original as, as our proposed method. We quantify the segmentation score using the dice coefficient. When compared to the ground truth annotation, our method is almost as good as using the fully sampled slices while using only 20% of the data. When compared to the CNN prediction on the original data, we achieved dice scores of over 90%, indicating high similarity. In the last test, we compared the methods in dynamic sequences. We reconstruct volumes of brain tumors captured over time. Our method, again, generates high quality reconstruction. Our methods also results in better parametric estimation of the dynamic properties, which are used to assess the severity of the brain damage. To conclude our presentation, we present reconstructions of data in different domains, both image and case space. We achieve speed up of up, up to five folds in scanning time with minor artifacts and loss in quality. We tailor together multiple models and loss functions to best suit the problem. And our architecture generalizes very well for different scanners, modalities, and acquisition methods. Finally, we suggest medical imaging quality assessment metrics to verify that the important information is preserved. Thank you all for listening. Uh, you're welcome to read our paper. It was recently published in the Medical Image Analysis Journal. And if you're interested, our code is freely available on GitHub. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, questions from the audience? Whoa, let's see. What is the acceleration factor of the CSMRI you compare your method to? We always compare our methods to the same acceleration factors. So the results you see over the presentation is five uh, fold speed up and using 20% of data. In our paper, we also show other uh, speed up factors. Okay. And Question by Shai Bagon, how can you ensure small but significant data is not lost by the process? The model learns to generate based on the distribution it sees that might not include the important lesions. So uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. So we actually validate it empirically. Uh, the test we show, excuse me, um, 
uh, this is the segmentation test we did. Uh, we and actually we trained our, ma our model on the taste test data set of the lesion uh, segmentation uh, lesion data set. And then we test our method on the training data set for which we have the available segmentations. And by evaluation, we can see that our method uh, aligns very, very well with a fully sampled uh, uh, slices. And when we look at it on, uh, using dice score, it's about 5% uh, uh, lower dice scores than the original uh, slices. So most of the information is preserved. Of course, not all of the information can be preserved. So a follow-up question to that. I, I, I missed your loss uh, function expression. Do you uh, minimize the segmentation loss, for instance? Or are you just trying to reconstruct the original image in case space or original input space? So uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, it actually can be a follow-up to a future research. Uh, we don't use the segmentation as a loss to the network. Uh, the reason is, is that it's hard to get uh, a large data set uh, annotated with segmentations. For the NS lesion, we have annotations. While for the uh, other data sets, we use the IXI. We don't have ground truth annotations. We use the other uh, segmentation techniques and algorithms to evaluate our model. And we don't believe this uh, data is of high enough quality to use for training. OK. And a question from Ilya. Is there a chance to get details or objects that are not present in the full case space version in reconstructed versions of the different modalities? Did you try other consistency loss, like except for L1 or L2? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, can you please repeat it? Or maybe I'll read it on YouTube. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that would be easier. Um, yeah. Details on object. I guess it relates to what Chai Bagon asked, how sensitive you are or how good is the reconstruction given that you're not uh, sampling all the, the scan lines? Um, I'm still not sure I'm understanding the question, but... Uh, so uh, let me ask you an alternative question. Instead of uh, sampling 20% of the scan lines, you could potentially scan faster or not scan faster, but using a lower res uh, signal per scan line, like five times low res uh, scan line. So that would be equivalent in terms of uh, time. Yeah. Would you get better, worse performance? What are the pros and cons? So, Actually, we haven't tested it. Um, by lowering the special resolution of the, of the scan, uh, I guess that's what you mean, scanning less, uh, less frequencies, but at lower resolution, not subsampling a high resolution uh, case space. Um, there are works that do that. It, they do super resolution in the image domain. Um, we haven't compared ourselves to these kind of uh, works. Um, I'm not sure that there is a linear speed up time when doing a subsampling in the spatial domain as much as there is doing a subsampling in the case space domain where you just skip uh, the, the frequencies, but I need to, to check it out. Okay, well, I think... Uh... We got the gist of it. Thanks very much. Let's, I don't know how to virtually thank all the speakers and thank the audience that stick up, stayed there until this late hour. And hopefully we'll see everyone in person next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And that concludes the vision day for 2020. <laughs>